It takes a couple of attempts, but you manage to spark up a lighter and hold it up steadily in front of your face to light up a joint. A familiar woody smell fills the room and drifts out of your window on the afternoon breeze. You blink, steady yourself, inhale deeply, and fill your lungs up with warmth. But what happens next? Chemically speaking, biologically speaking, what is it about this little green plant that gets millions of people around the world to flock to it? How long has humanity been consuming it? And what exactly is it doing inside your body, inside your mind? To start, let's have a look at the chemical composition of the cannabis plant itself rolled up in a joint in your hand. Native to Central and South Asia, the cannabis plant today is so popular, it's now grown to be a global economy of its own. From small-scale rural farming operations all the way through to drug super labs, including any number of illegal weed farms somewhere in the middle. Experts believe that there are well over 700 different strains of cannabis currently on the market, and this number seems only set to increase. Being able to identify which strain of weed you have in your hand can be very easy when buying from a legal dispensary, but if you live in a country or a state where marijuana is still criminalized, being able to verify exactly what it is you're smoking becomes more difficult. Looking down at the green mossy balls in your hand, do you know where in the world it's come from and what's inside it? Let's break it down a bit, or rather, grind it down. You've likely heard of the two most well-known active ingredients in cannabis. These are cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol, or as you probably know them, CBD and THC. Over the last 10 years, in the West in particular, CBD has been championed as a potential medical breakthrough. It's also been shown to have a calming effect on those with anxious disorders and is currently being tested as a treatment for psychosis, sleep disorders, muscle spasticity, and more. You might have seen ads for CBD oil products popping up in your feed claiming that it can solve any number of ailments. Research is ongoing, however. Results vary. In the case of curing cancer, for example, so far there's no evidence to support that CBD has any kind of effect on the disease, despite what people on the internet might be saying. So, you smoke CBD to get high, right? No, CBD is usually extracted as an oil, and on its own it will not get you high. But it's still psychoactive, meaning it alters your mental state, typically leaving you feeling more calm and mellow. The feeling of being high comes from the main active component in marijuana, THC. Typically found in much greater quantities than CBD, THC can have a powerful psychoactive effect. To see what that means in practice, let's follow it as it enters the human body. You take in a deep breath of that joint and let the smoke fill your lungs. In this example, you're going to be our test subject, and you will be smoking weed. Smoking is one of the most direct and quickest ways to get high. This is because the smoke from your burning marijuana contains high levels of THC. The smoke is then inhaled, filling your lungs. At this point, you might experience some irritation, manifesting in the iconic smoker's cough, from introducing an alien substance into your lungs. This, however, is not unique to smoking weed as you're likely to see the same from people smoking or vaping conventional tobacco. The lungs are designed to quickly and efficiently transfer oxygen into the bloodstream when we breathe. Therefore, they have the capacity to take in large quantities of gas in one breath and get any number of elements or compounds from that gas into our bloodstream and fast. The lungs aren't just empty chambers, they're full of tiny little air pockets called alveoli. The average human adult has roughly 480 million alveoli in their lungs constituting about 1,500 miles of airways. That's the equivalent of driving from Miami to New Hampshire for our American viewers or Madrid to Copenhagen for our European viewers. For everyone else, it's roughly 13,636,363.6 bananas lying end to end. Anyway, back to your lungs. In each alveolus, the THC from the smoke is transferred directly into your bloodstream, which then carries it all over your body, including to the critical area, your brain. As a result, it often only takes a matter of seconds for the user to start feeling the psychoactive effects of what they're smoking. So, let's crack your head open and see what's going on inside. Sorry, this might hurt a little. The THC and CBD bind themselves to receptors throughout your brain. The amygdala, for example, is responsible for anxiety, emotional responses, and fear. CBD dulls the activity in this part of the brain, but the THC component can stimulate it. While many users feel calmer after having smoked weed, Others can feel a heightened sense of paranoia and worry, particularly on the come down as the calming effects of the CBD wear off. Looking at other parts of the brain impacted by the CBD, we have the basal ganglia, which is involved with motor control and planning, the neocortex, which processes sensory information, and the cerebellum, which is the center of motor control. All three of these areas are impacted by smoking weed, resulting in you feeling slower in general. Reflexes are delayed, information takes more time to process, and motor functions and speech slow down. 
Driving under the influence of marijuana can be very dangerous as a result. One study in the UK found that fatal accidents are 1.65 times more likely to occur when the subject is under the influence of marijuana, while another study in Canada found that accidents could be to four times as likely. Most countries have strict laws for driving under the influence of weed with zero tolerance policies, made stricter by the fact that it can take over 48 hours for weed to stop showing up on a blood test. If they're testing your saliva, it can be up to 72 hours. Urine can be anywhere from 3 to 30 days, and it can even be tested in your hair follicles for up to 90 days. Fortunately, you won't find many traffic cops that are plucking out your arm hair for a routine traffic stop. However, it would be reductive to think that all weed does is dull your brain. THC is a very active component that stimulates a lot of neural activity. Colors look brighter, sounds are louder, music sounds more rich and layered. Food often tastes better under the influence of THC, giving the subject the illusion that they're really hungry. That's right, this is why so many people using cannabis experience the famous munchies, which is why having a stoner visit your home is potentially extremely dangerous to the state of your snack pantry and chip supply. Many people report having heightened imagination, being able to think outside the box or come up with fresh and exciting ideas. Artists all throughout history have partaken in recreational drugs in an attempt to broaden their horizons, dulling a lot of the negative sensations, such as feeling pain and anxiety, coupled with the stimulation from THC, results in feelings of euphoria. In short, you, our human test subject, have gotten high. But what does this high actually look like? Here's where it gets really interesting. Let's bandage your head up and take a look. So far, we've only focused on the THC and CBD, but there are hundreds of active components within cannabis, which vary in quantity and intensity depending on which of the hundreds of strains the user is consuming. On top of that, there's the method of consumption. While smoking or vaping gets the chemicals into the bloodstream quickly, the high only lasts around three hours or so. Many users instead take gummies or bake brownies and cookies. When weed is absorbed through the digestive system, it takes a significantly longer time to kick in, but when it does, the user can experience highs that go on for hours, even up to a day, as the digestive system slowly releases the chemicals into the bloodstream. All of this makes studying the effects of marijuana very difficult. As with almost any study, there are the caveats of which strain is being used, how the test subject is ingesting it, and who the test subject is. The human brain is an incredibly complex thing indeed. If you took a sample of the human brain that was the size of just one grain of sand, that sample would contain 100,000 neurons and 1 billion synapses. Now multiply that by 860,000 and you've got a human brain, just like the one that's sitting in your head, watching this video and feeling very smug about itself. Being able to quantify and measure exactly what's happening in an organ far more advanced and complicated than the computers we're studying it on has been a challenge in medical science for decades and will likely continue to be one for a very long time. While one individual might take one puff and spend the rest of the day feeling anxious, their elderly grandma might smoke a whole bowl and feel nothing but zen. So for Nana's sake, is it dangerous? Well, on the whole, consuming marijuana is relatively harmless as long as you aren't driving, controlling heavy machinery, or performing open-heart surgery, the risks of smoking the occasional joint with the right amount of weed in it are low. So, why hasn't it been legalized worldwide already? And why are there skeptics out there, including in the scientific community? As is often the case with controversial topics, a lot of the conflict comes from political and cultural differences. To tell that whole story, we need to wind all the way back to China in 2800 BC, where we find the first recorded use of marijuana in history. Even that long ago, the cannabis plant was being used for medicinal purposes. Emperor Shen Nong, considered by many to be the grandfather of medicine, recorded the plant in his writings as being particularly useful. From that point, records of cannabis spread throughout India, Syria, Greece, and Rome. Various healing properties have been ascribed to it over the years, including cures for inflammation, depression, arthritis, and even asthma. Of course, most early medicine is notoriously rather unreliable. We're looking at you leeches and milk transfusions. But there's always been something about this little green plant that's captured the attention of doctors and pharmacologists throughout the centuries. Often there's a grain of truth to the mythology that has sprung up around the drug. In Hinduism, for example, the god Shiva is given the title of Lord of Bong because cannabis is his favorite food. For centuries, many Hindus believed that if you were suffering from a fever, it was the god's hot breath of anger upon you. Rituals were conducted where you would be given a quantity of cannabis to consume so you would find favor with Shiva again and your fever would pass. With modern medical science, we know that THC acts in the hypothalamus of the brain, reducing the body's temperature and therefore counteracting fevers. So, where did it all go wrong for Weed's PR team? 
Why is it that many people in the West now include cannabis in the same conversation as crack, cocaine, and heroin, as opposed to paracetamol and penicillin? Well, medical marijuana was first introduced in the West in 1841 by William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, an Irish physician who spent years studying all kinds of different medicines in India. But the real origins of the USA's problem with marijuana began 200 years before that, in the Jamestown colony in 1605. Dissatisfied with the return on investment they were seeing, the English, and King James I in particular, demanded the colony change up the crop they produced to hemp, a plant within the cannabis family. The crop was a massive success and became the key to the early expansion of the American colonial settlements. George Washington himself famously grew hemp as one of his three primary crops on Mount Vernon. The plant was used to manufacture ropes and fabrics, but following William Brooke O'Shaughnessy's findings from India, Americans began to experiment with the plant's medicinal properties. The USA was still in relative infancy, with many laws and prohibitions being established. Drug laws at the time involved labeling products as being poisons, which restricted them to being legal only if prescribed by a pharmacist. Even then, the debate about cannabis varied from state to state, with some issuing it with the poison status and others believing it was exempt from these rules. At the time, opium dens were rife across America, and alongside them a number of hashish parlors popped up in which people would smoke various forms of hemp and cannabis. By 1880, these establishments were seen as quite fashionable, with many of the upper classes frequenting them. It's estimated that there were roughly 500 such parlors in New York City alone. The laws needed to be strengthened further still. Fraud and corruption were rife in the drug industry, with many falsely labeling their products for the sake of profit. The tighter that these restrictions got, the more people looked for loopholes. The government and the newly established Food and Drug Administration were pulling in different directions than a lot of the American public, who were looking to skirt prescriptions and drug laws in order to continue to get their highs. In the move to close the loopholes, cannabis was often grouped in with many of the much more addictive, much more harmful drugs that were plaguing the American population. The solution the American government came to was a zero-tolerance policy on recreational drug use, including the prohibition of alcohol and the criminalization of marijuana, which at the time they were spelling with an H. In 1971, President Nixon coined the term War on Drugs, where he declared drug abuse to be public enemy number one of the American people. The approach was incarceration with an iron fist. Possession, distribution, and consumption of banned substances would result in jail time. It's estimated that throughout this war on drugs, the USA spends roughly $51 billion annually on its endeavor to clean up the streets. To illustrate with that money, the USA could give each Canadian citizen $1,416.67 per year just as a little thank you for being such lovely neighbors. Alternatively, they could give one lucky Canadian a dollar a minute for 97,032 years. A large amount of this campaign against drugs has involved a level of fear-mongering. There's a lot of false information swirling around the world about the negative effects these drugs have. It rots the brain and causes psychosis. It's a gateway drug to stronger and more dangerous highs, and it is highly addictive. But is there any truth to any of these claims? Let's examine them one by one. Firstly, no, marijuana does not rot the brain. Rotting is the decay of dead organic material as bacteria and fungi consume it. That simply doesn't happen. However, the link to psychosis is a much more contested field with evidence for both sides of the argument. Firstly, what is psychosis? It's a term that is thrown around a lot, especially in the world of drug use, but very rarely defined, meaning a lot of people attach their own fears, worries, and prejudices to the word. Psychosis is when someone loses contact with reality. The image of the world around them that the brain is painting doesn't match up with the objective reality surrounding them. The two main symptoms of psychosis are hallucinations and delusions, and it's important to know the difference between the two. A hallucination is when a person experiences something that isn't actually happening. Most commonly, this takes the form of hearing voices that aren't really there or sometimes seeing things that aren't really there. In some cases, people have reported smelling, feeling, and tasting their hallucinations too, such as tasting blood in their mouth despite there being none. A delusion, on the other hand, is more abstract. It could be the feeling that you're being followed or that there's a conspiracy in your workplace to harm you. Delusional people are often highly susceptible to conspiracy theories, as often the paranoid messaging chimes with their fearful delusions that their minds have already been generating. So, does marijuana cause psychosis? It's complicated. Let's go back to the chemicals active in your brain. We're gonna need to crack that skull open again, sorry. THC is highly psychoactive. This is where the feeling of euphoria from being high comes from. 
While CBD can decrease the levels of panic and paranoia in the brain, it's often present in much smaller quantities than THC, mainly as many cannabis farms compete with one another to grow stronger and stronger strains. Couple that with the fact that there are hundreds of active compounds within the cannabis plant, and it goes back to our earlier point about this being a challenging area of study. Therefore, many scientists rely on quite broad studies, taking large sample sizes of drug users and non-drug users and comparing the development of their brains over time, looking most notably at teenagers and young people. What they found is there is often a link between heavy pot smoking and psychosis. There are cases of people living with schizophrenia and bipolar disorders where the heavy use of marijuana is linked to the onset of those symptoms. What has not been proven, however, is that weed was the cause. Most scientists believe that weed can, in some cases, accelerate the development of underlying psychotic disorders. The brain is a very complex and delicate thing. If somebody has an underlying psychotic condition, then the consumption of drugs that alters their state of mind and heightens activities within certain sections of the brain can naturally lead to an exacerbation of those symptoms. Schizophrenia is believed to affect 1 in 300 people, while bipolar disorder affects 1 in 100. While these are quite small percentages, they are not insignificant. THC does carry the risk of triggering a psychotic episode if you're genetically predisposed to having a psychotic condition. The chances are very low and won't affect the majority of the population, but they are still there. Next, is it a gateway drug? The experience of a chemical buzz in the brain is a sensation that many of us try to chase in our lives. You get up and sing in a concert at your high school and you get a rush from it. You do it a second time and the high is worn off a bit. So you need a bigger crowd and a bigger crowd and suddenly you're in a rock band on an arena tour. Chasing this type of bigger, better high is an experience we're sure many of you are familiar with. Studies have shown that in a minority of cases, the same can happen with marijuana. Usage of the drug can prime the brain, ready for more intense highs, which it then craves. This sounds bad until you realize the same thing happens with cigarettes and alcohol. Both of these demonstrate a similar connection to being a gateway drug to harder substances as marijuana. So, why are those not held up to the same level of scrutiny? One thing studies have shown is that there is a much more powerful gateway drug out there, trauma. A difficult childhood, experiencing abuse, and going through acute pain and suffering are all far more likely to result in a person developing a dependence on hard substances. Weed is often a part of that journey, but in these cases it seems to be a symptom more than the cause of the problem. But is it addictive? Let's take a similar look at this question. You wake up one morning feeling tired, so you make yourself a cup of coffee. It clears away the fog, helps you focus on your job, and gives you a little endorphin rush from a good day's work. So the next day, you do the same, and the next, and the next, until one day you run out of coffee. You look in the jar and it's empty. A storm cloud gathers over your head. You go to work with a scowl, snap at your coworkers, have a headache by lunchtime, and come home feeling miserable. What's happened here? Well, the human brain is incredibly flexible. Your brain has gotten so used to the influx of caffeine each day that it's now rebalanced the chemicals inside itself to receive that caffeine boost. It's ready and it's waiting, so when the boost doesn't come, there's now a chemical imbalance. The same thing happens with weed. If you burn one down at 420, smoke weed every day, your brain's going to be sitting there at 419 rubbing its metaphorical hands together in anticipation. Coming off weed now feels hard. You have cravings for it, you feel irritated when you don't have it, you struggle to fall asleep, you lose your appetite, and you generally have a bad time. For about two weeks. Then you're likely back to normal. And that's because what we've described here isn't an addiction, it's dependence. It's very common and can be broken fairly quickly. Up to 30% of weed smokers experience some level of dependence, and it can be overcome by just taking an extended break and giving your brain some rest. That said, there's a small risk of long-term addiction. People under the age of 18 have brains that are still developing. They're still growing and changing and adjusting to the world around them. Smoking weed regularly at this stage in your life could lead your brain to building itself around the expectation that it'll be receiving those chemical hits every day, which may start as a dependence and could grow to be much more deeply rooted and could result in a lifelong addiction. If there's one thing you learned from this video, it's that marijuana, much like life, is complicated. There may not always be a straight answer to every question. Anyone who tells you that something is totally amazing and has no downsides will always be lying. Even ice cream has downsides. What's important is looking at the big picture. Is weed the devil's leaf that spells the end of society as we know it? No, of course not. But neither is it a miracle cure-all drug that everyone should take on a daily basis. On September 11, 2001, terrorists struck the United States and launched the world into a new era. 
the global war on terror. After decades of Cold War preparations, the US and its allies found themselves unprepared for this new asymmetric war, but they were very quick learners. First though, the US had to deal with the literal wreckage from the attack. Both the Pentagon and the World Trade Center had suffered catastrophic damage, but the Pentagon was only partially destroyed. The World Trade Center would be a near total loss. Immediately upon realizing the homeland was under attack, the United States took the unprecedented steps of ordering all civilian aircraft in US airspace to land at the nearest available airport. Hundreds of aircraft from various nations were all forced to land or face the wrath of the US Air Force, which was not in the mood for discussion that day. Tens of thousands of travelers had their travel plans hopelessly disrupted as aircraft landed on the nearest available airfield all across the US. French tourists on their way to Hawaii were suddenly stuck in Montana, and the shutdown of air traffic affected incoming aircraft as well. US Air Force F-15s and F-16s loaded for air-to-air -air combat immediately took up air defense patrols over the American West and East Coast, as well as the airspace west of Alaska and north of North America. The United States implemented DEFCON 3, or Defense Condition 3, across all its military facilities around the world. This meant that US forces, especially the Air Force, had to be ready to mobilize at a moment's notice, with all the Air Force combat planes ready to take off to the skies within 15 minutes of alert. The US wasn't just worried about further terrorist attacks using civilian airliners, it was sending a clear and strong signal to any would-be adversary that while the US had just taken a nasty sucker punch to the face, it was still on its feet and ready to fight. Any attempt to capitalize on US confusion and weakness in the immediate aftermath of the attacks would be met with immediate and overwhelming force, including nuclear if need be. Civilian aircraft incoming to the United States were immediately ordered to divert and barred from entering American airspace. Anyone wishing to complain could take it up with the Air Force F-15s. Nobody did. Planes were diverted to Canada and Mexico causing a global aviation logjam and chaos that would last for days. The first priority were search and rescue efforts at both the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. The Pentagon had been a priority target, though each hijacker had been instructed that if they couldn't reach their intended targets, they had the freedom to use their own initiative and choose secondary targets. Anyone who couldn't do either or experienced any difficulties was to immediately crash their planes. Also, the very visual symbol of American global power, the Pentagon, had been high on the list of targets, but the attack did only relatively minor damage to the huge structure. 125 Pentagon workers were killed in the attack, 70 civilians and 55 military personnel, mostly US Army or US Navy employees. The highest ranking casualty was Lieutenant General Timothy Maud, an Army Deputy Chief of Staff. Thanks to reinforced construction techniques though, the Pentagon was a particularly tough target to take on, and the damage was limited considering the incredible amount of energy released upon impact. At the World Trade Center site though, things were far more grim. Firefighters from the New York City Fire Department rushed to the scene of the attack and braved the smoke, dust, and raging firestorm above their heads. Falling debris made the task even more difficult after the towers collapsed in on themselves. Engine 10 and Ladder 10 were the first to arrive on scene since their firehouse was directly across the street and at 8.50 a.m. an incident command post was established in the lobby of the North Tower. However, due to safety concerns, the command post was moved across West Street. This would end up saving the lives of many senior officials, though many more died as the North Tower lobby was still being used to coordinate rescue operations when the tower collapsed. Tragically, a repeater system meant to help with radio communications during an emergency had failed due to the attack, and the fire chiefs were unable to contact many of their men when the order to evacuate had been given. As a result, many firefighters and first responders, some who had no radios and had simply shown up in their off-duty hours to assist, were lost in the collapse. 343 firefighters would die from both tower collapses. The command post on West Street was taken out by falling debris, which also killed New York Fire Department Chief Peter Ganchi. A new command post was set up in a firehouse in Greenwich Village from where a response from half of all New York Fire Department units as well as volunteers from Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester County and others could be managed. Other volunteers who did not make it to the site instead went to firehouses now short on personnel in order to cover their duties for the duration of the search and rescue efforts. Just hours after the collapse though, firefighters erected a flag taken from a nearby yacht on the scene of the attack, evocative of the famous Iwo Jima flag raising photograph. The medical response began immediately after the first impact with the casualty staging area moved to the corner of Vesey and West Streets. Five triage areas would be set up around the entire site, 
as volunteers flooded in to assist with the massive number of casualties being brought off the site. Triage centers would be moved to Chelsea Piers and Staten Island Ferry Terminal in the wake of the collapse, while neighboring hospitals sped the flow of critical supplies. Sadly, emergency medical services would end up treating very few individuals, mostly smoke inhalation patients. Truth is, very few people would end up surviving the collapse of the towers. Both medical triage areas were shut down the next day. On the water, the U.S. Coast Guard mobilized as many assets as it could to aid in evacuating people stranded on Manhattan Island. Counterterrorism patrols by watercraft were also conducted in an attempt to thwart any possible follow-up attacks on either civilians or the emergency responders themselves. Short on resources, the Coast Guard sent out a call for ships to assist with the evacuation of Manhattan Island, while other ships, such as John J. Harvey, were critical in firefighting efforts. With many water mains severed by the collapse, the John J. Harvey, a fireboat that had operated since 1930, would speed to the proximity of the site. Alongside two other FDNY fireboats, she pumped water to the site so that firefighters could fight the blaze amongst the wreckage for 80 hours until the water mains were repaired. In eight hours following the attack, anywhere from half a million to a million people were evacuated from Manhattan. In effect, America's own Dunkirk and considered to be the largest maritime evacuation in history. To assist with communications, amateur radio operators set up emergency networks or joined the hundreds of volunteers forming bucket brigades. With official emergency networks completely overwhelmed, their work was invaluable to New York authorities, and on December 12, 2002, the New Jersey legislature honored their work. Rescue efforts at the site, however, were not progressing well. Few had survived the collapse of the towers, and to get to them, the workers first had to dig through two feet of ash and soot. The heavy equipment had to be used to lift up massive blocks of concrete and random wreckage. Incredibly, the day after the attack, though, 11 people would be rescued, including six firefighters and three police officers. Two police officers had survived for a full 24 hours, buried in 30 feet of rubble. But the discovery of survivors would not last long. Only 20 people would be pulled alive from the wreckage, with the last survivor being rescued 27 hours after the collapse of the North Tower. Some of the trapped were able to make cell calls to those above, but debris made it impossible to get to all of them in time. Hundreds of volunteers and officials poured over the scene, with approximately 400 rescue dogs, the largest deployment of dogs in U.S. history, but pretty soon only cadavers were being recovered. With the psychological impact of the rescue dogs so severe that rescue workers had to bury themselves and pretend to be rescued just to lift the animal's flagging spirits. Around New York City, thousands of volunteers began to show up over the next few days to assist in whatever capacity they could. The city would register these individuals and shuttle them into Lower Manhattan, which had been closed off to everyone but rescue and recovery workers. All over New York, construction projects came to a dead stop as workers walked off the job and headed to the site of the attack. By the end of week one, over a thousand iron workers alone arrived at the site, with thousands of other specialists from the US, Canada, Mexico, and other nations. Days after the attack, the focus was on investigation and clearing debris. Bucket brigades were organized from thousands of volunteers, with each person passing along a five-gallon bucket full of debris. At the end of each line, investigators sifted through the debris for evidence and human remains, with the rest being deposited into a site known as the pile. As workers wanted to avoid using the term ground zero due to connotations of a nuclear attack, by September 24th, 100,000 tons of 1.8 million tons had been removed from the site, searched for clues or remains, and sent to the Fresh Kills landfill on Staten Island. Much of the steel would end up being recycled for use in other construction projects. 24 tons of steel would be used in constructing the USS New York, an amphibious transport dock ship meant to assist in amphibious assaults. Incredibly, through the recovery efforts, someone had attempted to conduct what would have been the heist of the decade. Just days after the collapse, rescue workers discovered scorch marks on a basement doorway underneath 4WTC. Upon exploring the building's basement, a vault containing large amounts of gold and silver coin and bars was discovered, all stored by the Bank of Nova Scotia. The would-be thieves were never discovered, their attempt at a heist likely foiled by the hundreds of rescue workers on the site and the thousands of volunteers just past it. The U.S. military also mounted immediate efforts to assist civilian personnel on the ground. The Civil Air Patrol was one of the few institutions allowed to launch aircraft, and it used the opportunity to conduct an aerial reconnaissance mission over Ground Zero in order to provide analysis of the wreckage. CAP aircraft also assisted in airlifting personnel and medical equipment and supplies. The first military personnel at Ground Zero, however, were elements of the New York Army National Guard's 1-101st Cavalry, 
258th Field Artillery, 442nd Military Police Company, and 69th Infantry Regiment. National Guard troops supplemented NYPD and FDNY with 2,250 National Guardsmen, assisting rescue efforts by the next morning. The armory of the 69th Infantry would become a family information center to assist family members of victims in locating their loved ones or recovering their remains. National Guardsmen also provided security to other possible target locations across New York, as well as assisted in traffic control. Soon after, the New Jersey National Guard sent its own personnel to assist. The U.S. Navy redirected its hospital ship, USNS Comfort, to Pier 92 in Manhattan. From there, crew members helped feed and house 10,000 relief workers. Its galley provided 30,000 meals while its medical facilities assisted injured rescue workers immediately after the attack and during the recovery process. With Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda claiming responsibility for the attacks, President Bush immediately declared a war on terrorism with the goal of destroying and dismantling global terror networks. Al-Qaeda would be enemy number one, however. A NATO committee agreed that the attack on the U.S. constituted an Article 5 response, and overnight Osama bin Laden had brought down the heat of the entire NATO alliance on his head. Across the nation, federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies coordinated to arrest 762 suspects with known or suspected ties to terror networks. However, none of those detained would be charged with terrorism, and the response is largely seen as a knee-jerk response to the September 11th attacks. To head off growing Islamophobia by parts of the U.S. population, President Bush visited the Islamic Center of Washington and reminded the nation that Arabs and Muslims living in the U.S. were still patriots. Sadly, a 1,600% surge in hate crimes or harassment of Muslims, Arabs, Middle Easterners, and South Asians would occur in the days immediately following the attacks. Immediately after the attacks, President Bush took legislative action to shut down the financial assets of known terrorists and their financial networks. This froze billions of dollars of assets and would be the first shot of the global war on terror. On September 18th, a joint resolution from Congress gives President Bush the authority to use all necessary and appropriate force against the planners and instigators of the September 11th attacks. Two days later, the president announces the start of the global war on terror. Osama bin Laden has horrendously misjudged America's response to the September 11th attacks. He believed that the U.S. would respond in one of two ways, a general pullout of the Middle East or a round of cruise missile strikes against training facilities. Having weathered a storm of missiles before that did little to nothing, bin Laden believed al-Qaeda had won the day. Immediately after the 9-11 attacks, President George Bush signs into law a joint resolution by the American Congress, authorizing the president to use all reasonable force required to bring to justice or eliminate the individuals responsible for carrying out the September 11th attacks. This makes Osama bin Laden public enemy number one, not just by the US, but by America's vast network of global allies. Al-Qaeda itself is targeted for destruction, and the Afghanistan Taliban regime sheltering Al-Qaeda is given an ultimatum, hand over AQ operatives or else. Meanwhile, American intelligence operatives are infiltrating northern Afghanistan, with security provided by American special forces. In a series of clandestine meetings, the U.S. develops a plan to work together with the anti-Taliban, so-called Northern Alliance. This alliance is a coalition of anti-Taliban opposition, mostly made up of Tajik factions as well as Uzbek, Hazara Shiite, and some Pashtun Islamist factions. Before the September 11th attacks, the U.S. policy was to pressure the Taliban with sanctions and political action. But America had so far refrained from providing direct military assistance to the Northern Alliance. However, leading up to the 9-11 attacks, internal pressure within the White House is already shifting and edging the president closer toward providing weapons to the alliance. Just two days before the terror attacks in the U.S., the Taliban had assassinated Ahmad Shah Massoud, the leader of the alliance, with the aid of al-Qaeda operatives posing as journalists. Wounded in the suicide bombing, Massoud would die on his way to the hospital. The attack would later be seen as an indication that the Taliban feared the U.S. would strike back by directly financing the alliance, and thus sought to fracture it and throw it into chaos just two days before the 9-11 attacks. However, Mohammed Fahim, Massoud's lieutenant, quickly consolidated power and ensured the alliance remained intact. Shortly after the terror attacks against the U.S., President Bush issued his ultimatum, and when refused, initiated a plan to militarily overthrow the Taliban, equating those who harbor terrorists to terrorists themselves. President Bush made the decision that neither the Taliban nor al-Qaeda saw coming. U.S. troops would lead the war against the Taliban themselves. The Bush administration sought UN approval of military action, resulting in UN Security Council Resolution 1368. 
However, while widely interpreted as an authorization for military action, it technically did not authorize America's invasion of Afghanistan. China, who sits on the Security Council, wished for the U.S. to seek full authorization from the U.N., knowing that they could then control U.S. military action by threatening a veto vote. They hoped to leverage their veto power in the Security Council in exchange for manipulating the U.S. to stop supplying weapons and equipment to Taiwan, which the Chinese Communist Party continues to wish to forcefully annex to the mainland to this day. On October 4th, the Taliban began to read the writing on the wall and offered to turn bin Laden over to Pakistan to be put on trial in an international tribunal that operated in accordance to Islamic Sharia law. The proposal was rejected. Knowing that seeking full authorization for invasion from the UN would jeopardize Taiwan's independence, the US invoked the right to self-defense and UN Resolution 1368 as justification. On October 7, 2001, less than a month after the attacks on the homeland, American combat aircraft launched a blistering assault on Taliban positions. The air attacks were coordinated with an offensive by the Northern Alliance, which was itself working alongside approximately 1,000 American Special Operations Forces and Central Intelligence Agency field operatives. That same day, even as bombs were raining down on their forces, the Taliban contacted the U.S. and offered to try bin Laden in Afghanistan itself, under an Islamic court. Knowing that justice would never be served in what would amount to a sham trial, the U.S. rejected the proposal. Meanwhile, American and British aircraft continued a blistering offensive against Taliban strongholds. Cruise missiles launched from warships in the Arabian Sea flew over Pakistan to strike at military targets inside Afghanistan. On the ground, Northern Alliance forces fighting alongside Green Berets from the 5th Special Forces Group, aircrew from the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, and numerous Air Force combat controllers pushed south from their strongholds in the mountains. The American bombing campaign was so fierce that just like in Desert Storm, Taliban forces surrendered or defected en masse. The first major victory of the ground war would come on the 9th of November, when the Taliban stronghold of Mazar-e-Sharif was captured. This allowed U.S.-backed forces to rapidly conquer most of northern Afghanistan. Four days after the capture of Mazar-e-Sharif, Kabul was captured after a surprise Taliban withdrawal from the city. As the pressure mounted, the Taliban in the north of the country were forced into a last-ditch defense in Kunduz. However, under withering air attack, Northern Alliance forces destroyed Taliban defenses and took the city on the 26th of November. A new problem arose as a significant number of Taliban fighters fled across the border and into Pakistan. In the Pakistani tribal areas, the government has very little power and the U.S. hesitated from pursuing and destroying retreating Taliban fighters out of fear of inflaming greater tensions amongst the northern tribes of Pakistan. Wishing to secure Pakistani support for the war, the U.S. also refrained from taking actions that would violate its attempt at cooperation with the government. Unbeknownst for a few more years to the U.S., though, Pakistan was secretly aiding and even equipping the Taliban and other insurgents as they would cross the border into Afghanistan. Their support was spearheaded by Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, which ran a massive effort to arm, feed, and even provide medical care for wounded Taliban and other insurgent fighters. While never verified, it is strongly suspected that Pakistan was also fully aware of the fact that Osama bin Laden was hiding in their territory and likely even assisted efforts to keep him hidden from U.S. sources. Given that bin Laden was discovered hiding in Abbottabad, a major city known for its military institutions and often compared to America's West Point, it's incredulous to think that Pakistan was not actively protecting bin Laden from American arrest or assassination. The reason why is simple. The Taliban represented a strong barrier between Pakistan and Iran, as well as helping to limit Western influence in the region. Pakistan had every incentive to keep the Taliban in power and under their influence, and U.S. plans to uproot al-Qaeda directly clashed with what they saw as a national security priority. In the south of the country, Taliban forces retreated to Kandahar. Before the assault on the city began, the Taliban agreed to surrender to the U.S., a deal which was rejected by Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld as a precondition to surrender was that Taliban leader Mullah Mohammed Omar be granted amnesty. This was unacceptable to the United States, who knew that leaving Omar in power would only encourage the Taliban to persist in a future conflict. Thus, the First Battle of Kandahar was on. On the 19th of October, 200 Rangers from the 3rd Ranger Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, landed on a desert landing strip south of the city. There, they linked up with 750 American paratroopers from the 101st Airborne Division. The task force immediately set about creating the U.S.'s first base inside Afghanistan, known as Camp Rhino. 
This would serve as a logistics base to support the Northern Alliance and provide direct combat aid to their forces in the battle to come. Kandahar was heavily defended, and given its dense urban nature would be a difficult city to capture. Defended by fanatical Taliban fighters who knew this was their last stand, the U.S. moved to prepare Northern Alliance forces for the tough fight ahead. On the 18th of November, militia commander Gul Agha Shahzai was contacted by American Special Forces. Under his command, Shahzai had about 800 fighters, but they were severely under-equipped for the task at hand. With Uncle Sam bringing lots of spare toys, Shahzai's militia was soon reinforced with weapons, ammunition, and vehicles. On the 22nd of November, a force of 100 vehicles advanced on Kandahar through the desert. Shahzai attempted to bypass Taliban strongholds ringing the city, but was forced to stop at the Taliban-held town of Taktipur. There he attempted to negotiate a surrender of the outnumbered and outgunned Taliban fighters, but instead was ambushed. American air power held in reserve to directly support Shahzai was immediately called, devastating the Taliban ambush. Their forces were put into a full retreat, vacating the city. Meanwhile, the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit arrived at Fab Rhino on November 25th, relieving the 101st Airborne. The 101st was immediately tasked to strike at Taliban positions outside of the city, and two days later, the 15th MEU joined the fight, supported by a unit of Australian Special Air Service operators. Hamid Karzai, leading the Eastern Alliance, had spent several weeks recruiting after the Battle of Tarankwat on November 14th. With about 800 men, Karzai led an attack on Kandahar from the north. On the 30th of November, Karzai's forces took the town of Pita without a fight, but when they attempted to take the bridge at Said Am Kaleh, met with stiff resistance. The United States aided Karzai's forces with two days of heavy airstrikes using precision munitions that left the bridge intact. On the 4th of December, overwhelmed by American air power, Karzai's forces managed to secure the bridge by setting up a beachhead on the other side. Unfortunately, the next day, a stray American bomb would land on a U.S. position killing three Special Forces soldiers and wounding Karzai. However, Karzai's forces remained cohesive even with their leader wounded, and began negotiations with the Taliban for surrender of Kandahar. Meanwhile, Shahzai's forces initiated an assault on Kandahar's airport, but they were surprised to discover little resistance from the Taliban. Unbeknownst to Shahzai, the Taliban had surrendered the city to Karzai, but it was Shahzai at the head of his militia who entered the city and was declared governor of the city. Karzai, meanwhile, did not object as he'd already been declared chairman of the Afghan interim administration, which would work to establish a new democratic government after the fall of the Taliban. By the 9th of December, Kandahar had been fully secured. A group of Al-Qaeda troops under the command of Saif al adel managed to escape into Pakistan. al adel remains on the FBI's top 10 most wanted terrorists to this day and is believed to be hiding out in Iran. As Kandahar was being secured, the United States and its allies launched a massive attack against Al-Qaeda forces in the cave complex of Tora Bora. On December 3rd, 20 CIA National Clandestine Services Special Activities Division operatives, alongside members from the 5th Special Forces Group, were inserted via helicopter into Jalalabad. Codenamed Jawbreaker, the tank force coordinated with the Northern Alliance fighters as they began an assault on the planes leading up to the cave complexes. For 72 hours, Jawbreaker called in a series of non-stop airstrikes on enemy positions, forcing them to retreat into more entrenched positions further up the mountains. One week later, 70 special operators from the U.S. Army's Delta Force A Squadron and Air Force Special Tactics Squadron joined Jawbreaker via vehicle. They would lead the ground operation against the Al-Qaeda positions. For their part, Al-Qaeda fighters would light fires at night for warmth and to cook, which allowed U.S. aircraft to launch precision strikes against them. With the aid of U.S., German, and British Special Forces, Northern Alliance fighters made progress into the cave complexes. Al-Qaeda forces contacted a local Afghan commander and negotiated a truce. However, the time requested to surrender their weapons was believed to actually be used to buy time to allow senior Al-Qaeda officials to escape. On the 12th of December, fighting resumed as a rear guard attempted to buy time for Al-Qaeda's main forces to escape into Pakistan. Alliance forces, along with U.S. Special Forces and heavy air support, assaulted heavily fortified Al-Qaeda positions in caves and bunkers, leading the attack against the complex of Tora Bora itself were 13 British Special Forces operators alongside German and American operators. These forces helped secure the flanks of the Alliance assault against Al-Qaeda ambush and were critical in success of the operation. Intent on the complete destruction of Al-Qaeda forces, the U.S. continued a heavy bombing campaign against the cave complexes. A force of 2,000 local militias organized and paid for by U.S. Special Forces and CIA operatives massed for an attack against the complex. 
By December 17th, Al-Qaeda's last stronghold was destroyed, and U.S. Special Forces immediately launched a search for Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden, however, had managed to successfully escape into Pakistan. Later, it was revealed that the CIA officer leading the CIA team on the ground had requested more U.S. forces to directly attack the caves that he believed bin Laden had been trapped inside of. His request was denied by the Bush administration, who believed that even if bin Laden evaded capture, he would be arrested as soon as he entered Pakistan. We know now that bin Laden was likely captured by the Pakistani government, who promptly whisked him into hiding in order to use him as a future bargaining chip. Had the request for additional forces been approved, the war on terror could have ended a decade earlier than it did. After the taking of Kandahar and the destruction of Al-Qaeda's stronghold in Tora Bora, surviving Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces either went to ground or escaped in Pakistan. From the safety of Pakistan's federally administered tribal areas, an insurgency blossomed, which allowed the Taliban to launch repeated assaults against the democratic government, taking root in Afghanistan. Without permission from Pakistan to send troops to root out the cancer growing in its tribal areas, the U.S. was forced to rely on drones to surveil the target enemy leadership. These drone strikes drew global condemnation, thanks in no part to the fact that Pakistan's ISI itself fanned the flames of outrage in order to limit U.S. influence. The truth is that casualties from the U.S. drone strikes were self-reported by forces operating in the tribal areas, which did not allow Pakistani government investigators to enter. Thus, casualty figures were never truly verified by anyone other than the very insurgents and terrorists that the U.S. was targeting. And the fact that these individuals don't wear military uniforms allowed them to claim that all the victims, or at least most, were innocent civilians. Al-Qaeda, however, would be destroyed as a global terror organization while the Taliban would bide its time until 2021 when they exploited a U.S. pullout of the nation to topple the weak democratic government. It's the deadliest fighter aircraft ever built, but what if it went back in time to World War I? The F-22 needs little introduction. Developed at the end of the Cold War, it's a fighter aircraft with no mission. Designed to go up against the best the Soviet Union could throw up against it and win every time. The F-22 was uniquely suited for fighting conflicts in Eastern Europe. Its advanced stealth still makes it the stealthiest fighter aircraft in the world, and it would have been perfect for securing air dominance over and past the front lines. But what if this modern marvel ended up in the hands of the U.S. as troops hit the battlefields of World War I Europe? With a thunderous roar, the F-22 would make its presence known above the trenches of war-torn Europe. Super cruising without the need of afterburners, the F-22's supersonic crack would stun the thousands of troops assembled below, who have quite literally never seen anything of the like. With silvery skin, a gold cockpit, and a delta wing body, the F-22 is generations ahead of anything flying at the time. Many would immediately assume this technological marvel to be an alien visitor, because no nation could possibly be advanced enough to field such a capable machine. And in truth, the F-22s might still be a UFO to the allies of World War I. Impressive to think that the Raptor was designed just 60 years after the end of the war to end all wars, and yet upon showing up over the trenches of eastern France, it's so advanced that no living engineer could possibly begin to comprehend its construction. The F-22 is up against some of the best aircraft at the time. Germany and its partners were generally ahead of the Allies in fighter plane construction, and the Fokker D-7 was one of the most feared aircraft to prowl the skies. It only saw combat for six months, and that's a good thing too, because if the war had dragged on much longer than that, the Allies might have been very hard-pressed to keep any of their aircraft flying. The Fokker D-7 was a predator, lightweight enough to give it incredible agility and maneuvering. Germany would score 565 aerial victories in the Fokker D-7's short lifespan, and its most famous pilot, the Red Baron, would go down in history as a true Fokker legend. But compared to the Raptor, the Fokker D-7 or anything else in the German arsenal was basically just a pile of flying scrap. Despite that, the F-22 would have practically zero effect on the war. How is that possible? First, since we're not the modern Russian army, let's talk logistics. The F-22 is a true Wunderwaffen, an absolute wonder weapon of the 21st century despite being designed in the 20th. However, like many of America's cutting-edge technological marvels, it's an absolute prima donna. The plane has great difficulty in maintaining the stealth coatings, which make it so formidable, and daily maintenance is required to make sure it remains effective. Its computer systems are powerful, but incompatible with the rest of the Air Force, so no other plane can talk to the F-22. This is a big reason it's being retired early. The Raptor is formidable, but just flying it will cost you an annual salary. 
For just one hour of flight time, the Raptor costs over $85,000 in fuel and maintenance. A 12-hour flight will basically set you back an entire mansion, unless you live in LA and New York, in which case it only sets you back a one-bedroom shack in the worst part of town. Granted, some of this cost comes from scale issues. The US Air Force had planned to buy hundreds of the fighter, but cut back to just under 200 when the Soviet Union cried uncle and tapped out of the Cold War. With no near-peer potential adversary, the mighty Raptor was a plane without a mission, a high-tech marvel of engineering that was less useful than a moderately sized rock. Without buying the F-22 in large numbers, production costs never came down, leaving the Raptor as an absolute bank breaker that's better served having it sit in a hangar than prowling the skies. And this is where we immediately run into problems with teleporting the Raptor back to World War I. As we mentioned earlier, the F-22 might as well be a UFO to the early 20th century allies, and this comparison is extremely apt. It's widely considered that if UFOs were real and one ever crash-landed in our backyard, we'd basically be completely helpless in trying to reverse engineer or even understand how to turn the windshield wipers on. A craft capable of traveling across interstellar distances or interdimensional if that's your jam would require manufacturing processes so advanced we'd likely need thousands of years of advancement to understand. The very composition of the materials would require chemistry and metallurgical skills we're likely nowhere near to developing. Sure, maybe we'd eventually figure out how the windshield wipers worked by just pressing random buttons, but good luck replacing them when they break. The F-22 would be as immediately confounding to even the brightest minds of the time. Back then, the internal combustion engine had only been small enough to mount on an airplane for about a decade, and still decades behind the pinnacle of the design for piston engine aircraft that would come in the 1940s. The first thing to confound World War I engineers trying to do maintenance on the Raptor would be the engine. Jet engines weren't unknown at the time. In fact, the first jet engine, a simple steam-powered device that used two nozzles on a sphere to make it spin rapidly on its axis, had been described as far back as first-century Egypt. What we would understand as the modern jet engine would have been known to some of the brightest minds of World War I, who had already identified the concept of compressing air, heating it, and releasing it out the back, simply lacking the means of creating one. Thus, as the engineers of the early 20th century peeled back the hood and looked at the Raptors Pratt & Whitney F-119s, they would at least know what they were looking at after a brief investigation. They could probably even figure out how to start them up, at least once separated from the aircraft itself, as figuring out the digital controls would likely be impossible. But the advanced alloys that go into the construction of the mighty Pratt & Whitney F-119 would simply be beyond the ability of chemists and metallurgists at the time to understand. For starters, they have no way of analyzing the composition of alloys, but they also lack the aid of computers and other advanced equipment to create said alloys even if they did. The sensitive stealth coating wouldn't matter, nobody's using radar at the time. It wouldn't be until 1935 that Britain invented the first practical radar unit. However, the flight surfaces of the F-22 require careful maintenance, but nothing comes close to the labor-intensive repair of all the parts of the plane that are near or help with the constant controlled explosion of hot gases that makes the plane go vroom. At best, the plane could be flown until basically it fell out of the sky from disrepair, basically the Russian Air Force's standard operating procedure, and the Allies would be lucky to get three or four missions out of it. But there is another problem. Fuel. The F-22 takes a carefully calibrated mix of jet fuel, itself a result of decades of research by the US Air Force into the best explosion juice that doesn't go exploding when you don't want it to go exploding. Try filling a Raptor's gas tank with premium gasoline and the engine won't even turn over. The F-119s that power the Raptor need a carefully, very high-energy calibrated fuel that's much more energy-dense than regular petroleum or gasoline. So the Raptor's flying with whatever it's got in the tanks after coming through a time portal to World War I. And that's not much as a combat radius of 470 miles means you're only getting a few hours of flight time. But let's say that the plane made it with full tanks and a pilot in the seat who immediately knows his mission is to aid the Allies. What could it actually do? In all honesty, not much. The Raptor is the deadliest aircraft in the world unless you're flying a 1910s biplane. The first and most immediate problem is the Raptor probably couldn't even keep up with the German Fokkers. The Fokker 7 had a top speed of 116 miles per hour, leaving many Allied pilots to exclaim in surprise, that fast Fokker outturned me. It's a big airplane, but that fat Fokker can really fly. And they were right. Imperialist German Fokkers would end up losing the war, but the aircraft was formidable. A Raptor would absolutely smoke a Fokker, 
but ask it to shoot one down, it's a different story altogether. The slow speed of World War I planes would put the Raptor at a threat of stall if it performed any sort of dogfighting maneuver. The plane would be forced to try to pounce from above in short strafing runs of a very agile target, a dicey proposition made even worse because the F-22 only has a few seconds worth of ammunition. Armed with 480 tungsten steel rounds that would punch through even the fattest Fokker the Germans put in the sky, the Raptor's cannon shoots so fast that it has only a few seconds of ammo. It's a fantastic quality when taking on a fast-moving supersonic-capable fighter, but terrible when trying to make any sort of dent on the numbers of the central power aircraft in the overall war. And when the cannon's out of ammo, the Raptor's basically done fighting in this war, because without advanced gunpowder used by the ammo in modern aircraft cannons, the Raptor's cannon couldn't operate properly. But the Raptor carries two AIM-9 and AIM-6-120 radar-guided air-to-air missiles, which are basically going to have zero impact on the air war. Even more importantly though, they might not even be able to lock onto the flying Fokkers zooming around the sky. That's because those cheap Fokkers were made, like most aircraft at the time, from wood and canvas, things that radar aren't very good at locking onto. The AIM-9 short-range missiles are capable of locking onto the heat of the enemy engines, but the early piston engines of World War I would probably give off so little heat that even the AIMs might not be able to hit a single lucky Fokker. Unable to accurately target enemy planes with only a few hours of flight time available and construction so advanced, there's no chance World War I engineers could try to replicate or even repair it, the F-22 would ultimately have zero impact on the war. Unless, of course, it was armed with a laser-guided bomb and knew the precise location of the German Chancellor at the time. But despite being useless to World War I air forces, there is one thing about the F-22 that the Allied engineers might be able to make use of – the engine. After the end of the war, the US would have its hands on engine technology nearly a full century ahead of their time. This would leapfrog American aircraft design as slowly the secrets of the jet engine and the fuel needed to power it are unlocked. It's unlikely, but if Anthony Fokker hadn't moved his company back to the Netherlands after the war, there is a chance that primitive versions of the Raptor could have been swatting evil Nazi Fokkers right out of the sky and winning an easy victory for the Allies. If you live in one of these countries, prepare to get wrecked, because these places are going to get absolutely leveled in World War III. When people think World War III, they think of a full-blown nuclear exchange, but the truth is that in all likelihood a third world war will remain conventional since no world leader has a full-blown death wish for the entire human race. That doesn't mean a conventional war won't be absolutely devastating. All one needs to do is look at the war in Ukraine, which has devastated large swaths of the landscape, turning it into a Mad Max post-apocalyptic film set. This type of destruction is something modern observers are unfamiliar with, largely thanks to the precision weapons employed by Western militaries significantly reducing collateral damage. If the Ukraine war has shown anything, it's that the West expends a great deal of resources to limit collateral damage, though that's not pure altruism, precision weapons simply work better. But unsophisticated militaries like Ukraine and Russia's rely on mass fires to achieve their objectives. Recently, Ukraine's been receiving greater and greater amounts of precision weapons, but the bulk of its long-range fires and ground attack capabilities is still dumb. Russia initially had a larger stockpile of precision weapons, but these were always in low numbers to begin with and only growing in scarcity. To make matters worse, Russia purposefully uses its precision weapons against civilian targets, because for Russia, war crimes are just a part of war. And this isn't us simply slandering Russia, it's quite literally how the nation has fought and tried to win conflicts in the past. During both wars in Chechnya, Russia absolutely leveled the small breakaway republic, resorting to mass artillery fire to destroy stubbornly entrenched defenders. This is because the Russian military is fundamentally weak and incapable of the type of urban combat militaries like the US showed a high degree of proficiency in during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Poor force structure, bad or non-existent training, and terrible doctrine all add up to create a military that's incapable of winning the door-to-door -door urban fighting of a war like in Chechnya, despite outnumbering the enemy by a truly staggering ratio. Russia's wanton and indiscriminate destruction is more than just making up for deficiencies in basic combat competency, it's also part of Russia's war-winning strategy. 
civilians are fair target for Russian guns because dead civilians demoralize the still living ones. While the West makes an honest effort to limit civilian casualties, Russia is all too familiar with the terrorizing and demoralizing effect that mass slaughter of non-combatants causes in a resisting population. This is why Russia targeted hospitals in both Chechnya and Syria, and why it specifically chose to attack a theater in Ukraine sheltering families despite the word children being written in Russian outside of it. In the attack, it's estimated Russia could have killed as many as 600, many of them children. This isn't just a case of a rogue pilot, however, as the mass murder of Buka showed. Torture and mass killings are simply the way Russia fights, and Russian-aligned groups like Wagner are no different. In March of this year, the world got to hear the testimony of a Wagner fighter who recounted how he shot children as young as six under orders to exterminate all Ukrainian civilians they came across. When asked about it, he'd said he'd do it again if told to. Given that Russia is going to be a potential adversary for a World War III scenario, that makes it really bad news for any of its neighbors, who can expect the same exact treatment. Russia would be criminally stupid to try to launch a war against NATO anytime soon, but criminal levels of stupidity have never really been an impediment to Russian decision-making. However, a more realistic scenario is one where a humiliated Russia is forced to retreat from Ukraine and lick its wounds. Much like Hitler's Germany during the pre-war years, Russia could bide its time and rebuild its military, and do it much faster than Germany did. Remember, to date, NATO has forbidden Ukraine from attacking Russia directly, which means that Russian manufacturing and logistics networks have been left completely intact. It would be easy to scoff and point out the terrible performance of the Russian military today, disregarding their potential to threaten tomorrow. After all, the West has proven it has better equipment and better doctrine, and severe sanctions have effectively crippled Russia's ability to build modern arms. That would be a dangerous dismissal of the threat Russia could still pose to the West. The one lesson both sides has learned from this conflict is the absolutely voracious rate modern combat equipment is used during a war between two industrial powers. Yes, the West has far better and more capable equipment, but in dangerously low supply and dwindling by the day. The UK has between 700 and 1,000 Storm Shadow missiles, and while it's been tight-lipped about how many it sent to Ukraine, it is estimated that it sent about 10% of its stock at the minimum. The Storm Shadow itself is also in the midst of being replaced by a more modern and more expensive variant. Even while the UK defense budget is barely holding pace with inflation despite recent increases, the story is even more terrifying when considering tanks, the one weapon that both sides in the Ukraine war can't get enough of. Britain has about 157 Challenger 2s, as confirmed by a defense paper which showed it had cannibalized a good portion of its fleet for replacement parts. Like the Storm Shadow missiles, the Challenger is being upgraded, but the UK expects that due to the added cost, its total Challenger fleet will remain unchanged, and might even shrink. Yes, the West's weapons are far more capable, but when even a mid-range anti-tank missile can render an expensive Western tank inoperable, numbers suddenly matter a great deal. So while Russia might not be fielding T-14s anytime soon, it doesn't really need to because even T-72s through sheer mass alone would be a force to be reckoned with for NATO militaries. While NATO currently is motivated to significantly increase its readiness, the story may not be the same a year or two after Ukraine has been fully liberated and Russia is beat back to its own borders. Europeans have historically been eager to cash in on peace dividends and extremely reluctant to invest in their own self-defense. This places NATO's most vulnerable members straight in the firing line, and we're talking about you, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. The Baltic countries have historically always been extremely vulnerable to Russian aggression, and prior to the Ukraine war, many American military insiders feared that Putin would soon launch a fait accompli attack into one of the Baltic states. By seizing and holding a few small villages, Putin's invasion would trigger an Article 5 response. But would NATO really declare potential nuclear war over a few Latvian villages? Until very recently, odds were in the favor of the answer being no, likely fracturing the alliance as confidence in its Article 5 falters. Russia has no such illusions today, which means in our hypothetical World War III 10 years from today, Russia would launch massive numbers of older tanks and armored vehicles to face off against a few thousand strong NATO rapid response force. It's never truly been a realistic proposition that NATO would successfully defend the Baltics, especially as they would have to strike through Kaliningrad to get there. But the addition of Finland to the alliance means that it is feasible that NATO could actually muster enough firepower to respond to an incursion into the Baltics before they were overwhelmed. The old plan to simply liberate the Baltics might be out the window now, but it relies on one key thing, NATO stationing a significant amount of troops inside Finland itself. 
This is extremely unlikely, given that upon the nation joining the alliance, the US stated that there were and would be no plans to significantly bolster NATO presence inside of Finland. This was a move to appease Russia, and it's unlikely NATO's stance on the matter will change even if there were signs of significant rearmament inside Russia. For all its strengths, NATO has one critical fault, it's a rational actor trying to deter a wholly irrational threat. Russia is not crazy, but it does act irrationally, and that is on purpose. Putin knows that he has leverage over NATO as long as he acts irrationally, forcing the international alliance to act, quote, responsibly. Responsible responses, however, have very little deterrent value, as evidenced by the complete lack of preparation for a Russian invasion of Ukraine, even despite the US sounding the alarm bell. Therefore, it is extremely plausible that a war 10 years from today would find NATO with its pants down again, putting the Baltics and Finland squarely in the crosshairs of massive amounts of Russian armor and artillery. If Ukraine's anything to go by, these nations would experience catastrophic levels of destruction. Even armed with lower quality weapons, Russia could still deliver a frightening amount of firepower to unprepared NATO defenses. Everyone likes to think back to the US's truly one-sided victory over Iraq in both Desert Storm and the second invasion, but what everyone forgets is that America had months to prepare for the action. A Russian invasion could come with little warning at all, and without enough troops to counter the Russian hordes, it doesn't matter how precise or efficient Western weapons are. Fighting would cause a refugee crisis in the Baltics, and probably even Finland. This would further complicate NATO's response, as Russia is very good at weaponizing refugees. It did so in Syria, flooding Europe with refugees on purpose, and channeling them toward rebel-held areas to sow confusion and chaos. With human life so cheap, Russia would give hordes of refugees one single choice – flee away from the oncoming Russians who murder civilians on purpose. Meanwhile, outnumbered NATO forces would struggle to coordinate an evacuation effort on top of their military response, only making things worse for defenders on the ground. Inevitably, the cavalry would arrive and Russia stands no true chance against a combined NATO force, but the destruction it could cause in the opening stages of the conflict would be truly immense. And that is without the use of nuclear weapons, which would have such a global effect that discussing them in this video is largely pointless. Switching gears, the Pacific is actually the most likely place for World War III to start. While Russia is a significant threat, it's extremely unlikely that after losing the war in Ukraine, it'll be able to remain politically cohesive or even motivated enough to retaliate against NATO by biding its time. China, on the other hand, is prepared for war today. When we think of war in the Pacific, there's two obvious flashpoints, the Korean DMZ and Taiwan. Of the two, Taiwan is far more likely to spark the next global conflict than a North Korean invasion of the South. While North Korea loves to bluster, the truth is, they are no fools to the reality before them. Not only are they facing the might of the US military, but South Korea itself is heavily militarized and an extremely capable military. They may not match North Korea's numbers, but their technological advantage is significant enough to offset it. Taiwan is the most likely flashpoint for war simply because China has warned us of this fact. For China, reunification with Taiwan is a matter of not just pride, but survival of the Chinese Communist Party, whose legitimacy might be dependent on bringing the breakaway province into the fold. President Xi Jinping has made it clear that Taiwan will reunite with the mainland, even if he has to use force to coerce it. And the Chinese military has long been preparing to do just that. With Taiwan defended by the United States, which recently broke its ambiguity over a defense of the island nation, China knows that it'll be facing off against the world's most powerful military power. A strategy of denying the US access to the South Pacific, however, is China's war-winning play, and it could end up working. Either way, Taiwan's going to get absolutely creamed. China may be a more ethical actor than Russia when it comes to waging war, but we really don't know. The last war the nation fought was against Vietnam in 1979, and this was only a brief affair. We do know that the nation appears to have invested much more heavily into precision weapons than Russia, and there is always the fact that, technically, the Taiwanese are also Chinese, which one would hope would limit genocidal urges from Chinese hardliners. Then again, the Russians often talked of the Ukrainians being their brothers, and that didn't stop them from shooting children in the street. Geography, though, is often cruel, and while it's Taiwan's greatest asset, it's also going to guarantee that civilian casualties are going to be monstrous. Taiwan is a mountainous island, and its cities are extremely densely packed. This makes it an absolute nightmare for a Chinese invader who will inevitably be forced to rely on large-scale ground attacks to achieve effect against entrenched defenders. And once the fighting starts, there's not going to be anywhere for the Taiwanese population to flee to. 
The same strength that makes Taiwan so difficult to conquer works against it when it comes to moving civilians to safety. Even the mighty US Navy will likely take weeks, if not months, to safely operate near Taiwan's shores, forcing Taiwanese civilians to weather the fighting without rescue for half a year or more. It's possible China could agree to open humanitarian corridors, allowing Taiwanese civilians to flee to South Korea, Japan, or even the US. It is, after all, in its best interest. Limiting civilian casualties will help China's public image internationally after it's labeled an aggressive invader, and it also makes it easier for its troops to operate. However, Russia could have taken advantage of the same benefits, and it still chose to open fire on civilian evacuations, using the promise of humanitarian corridors to funnel civilians into a kill zone. Facing staggering losses in an invasion of Taiwan, there is simply no telling what a frustrated Chinese military might be capable of, especially when there is no track record to investigate. But Taiwan isn't the only place that's going to suffer over a war in the Pacific. The Philippines and Japan are both strong US allies and places from where an allied response to an invasion of Taiwan would be staged. This puts them firmly in the crosshairs of everything from long-range Chinese missile attacks to special forces saboteur groups. The former is the greatest threat, with China holding some 1,500 long-range missiles which it could use to strike at airfields and military facilities across these countries. In fact, the US and its allies are betting on it. Inevitably, these strikes will cause significant collateral damage, and as the war progresses, China could make a gamble for victory. China's main concern in the Pacific is the United States. While the Japanese and South Korean militaries are formidable, on their own they're no match for the Chinese armed forces. And both South Korea and Japan lack the ability to truly threaten China anywhere other than right off their own shores. However, working in conjunction with the US, both nations suddenly become a significant threat, but the biggest threat comes from the US assets stationed in their territory. If the war goes poorly, China could gamble that if it starts attacking Filipino, Japanese, and South Korean civilians, they'll pull their support for the US, taking away America's biggest asset in the region, friendly ports and airfields to operate from. This might incentivize China to deliberately target civilian populations, causing as much collateral damage as possible while making it clear China will continue this terror campaign until US forces are no longer present. Borrowing a page from Russia's playbook, China could turn to war crimes as a war-winning strategy. How many dead civilians would it take for the Philippines to declare itself neutral and forbid the US from operating off its territory? South Korea in particular could suffer significantly in the case of war because China has one massive ace up its sleeve in any confrontation with the US, North Korea. Currently about 50,000 US troops are stationed in South Korea to act as a deterrent versus the North. While the Republic of Korea is a very capable military power, the US is treaty bound to defend it, and there's reservations about just how successful the ROK military would be on its own against the North. Prioritizing its air and naval forces in recent years means that the Army has received significant budget and personnel cuts, and no number of aircraft or ships are going to hold the line against a million strong North Korean force, especially when South Korea only has 500,000 active duty members, half of the North. China could exploit a conflict in the Korean Peninsula to consume American and Japanese resources, and it would be its greatest interest to do just that. For the South, this would be devastating. Thousands of North Korean artillery pieces are all within range of Seoul and its suburbs, making one of the most populated cities in the world a giant target. The destruction would be truly immense, with some estimates placing the initial barrage at hundreds of shells a minute, waning over time due to intense South Korean counterbattery fire. But the North is likely to use numerous tricks to deliberately target the South Korean population and its infrastructure. The Kim regime has made it clear civilians would be valid targets in the case of a war, and a war on the peninsula would doubtlessly be preceded by numerous chemical, biological, and possibly even nuclear acts of terrorism in the South. If you've followed our channel, you've seen the numerous ways we've dramatized these attacks being carried out in our fictional Korean War scenarios, and these dramatizations are based on real projected threats that the US military expects from the North. Acts of nuclear terrorism would be a more guaranteed way for the North to utilize its small nuclear arsenal. With US, South Korean, and Japanese ballistic missile defenses fully prepared to intercept a North Korean launch, it would be much more efficient to smuggle nuclear weapons into the South and detonate them directly at their targets. These targets would likely be the South's five most important harbors, Busan, Incheon, Donghai, Masan, and Gunsan. Shutting these down and irradiating them would cripple America's attempts to quickly send in reinforcements, forcing it to create makeshift port facilities elsewhere. It would also shut down South Korean trade, inflicting catastrophic damage on its economy and its people who rely on foreign food imports. 
Food and petroleum in South Korea are their biggest weaknesses, with the nation relying on imports of both. South Korea is one of the most food insecure nations on earth, with one of the lowest food self-sufficiency rates amongst developed nations. In 2020, South Korea's grain self-sufficiency rate was only at 19.3%. Self-sufficiency rates for the most important food items were so low that the government initiated a special plan in 2021 to tackle the nation's food security crisis. Shutting down South Korea's major ports would effectively starve the Korean population of food and the oil they need to drive their economy, creating significant misery and even famine. With port facilities irradiated, it could take weeks for global food relief to arrive, by which time tens of thousands might have already died from starvation alone. And to achieve all this, all the North would have to do is smuggle several nuclear devices aboard fishing vessels and simply pull them into port. Next, though, would be the biological and chemical attacks that the North is likely to carry out against the South civilians. This would include active shelling during the fighting itself, but also preemptive strikes before hostilities are actually declared. North Korean special forces and spies could easily smuggle various agents into the South and disperse them amongst South Korea's most busy transit hubs. Widespread use of rail travel makes the population extremely susceptible to a biological attack, and various pinpoint attacks at the right stations could take a biological agent into the heart of all of the ROK's largest cities. From there, refugees fleeing the fighting would carry the sickness with them further south, prompting a second crisis. Did you or your parents grow up with a Nazi war criminal living on your street? A dithering old man who was once a ruthless mass murderer in Germany or Poland? After all, some of you out there lived among those war criminals, more of you than you might think. You'll agree with us in about 25 minutes. At the end of April 1945, the smell of Adolf Hitler's smoldering flesh filled the nostrils of the few people who witnessed his ad hoc cremation in the Reich Chancellery Garden. Berlin was in flames. The Red Army was marching in, leaving piles of dead German soldiers and civilians in its wake. The Grand Prize Many of the highest-ranking Nazis, the chief executioners, sadistic scientists, and the demented doctors were scurrying from Germany like rats from a house fire, some of them with assistance from the very people they'd been fighting against for six years. On April 30th, Hitler said his goodbyes to the 20 or so people in the Führer bunker in Berlin. He had already informed a select group of men of the plan, burn me until there's nothing left of me. Don't let those Soviets take my body as a trophy. Turn me into ashes, Hitler demanded. Don't leave anything. Still, when Hitler gave that order, he knew there was still a possibility of escape. His private pilot, Hans Bauer, whom Hitler had a very close bond with, had pleaded for his boss to get the hell out of the bunker and fly to freedom. Bauer had been saying this for weeks. Even when the Red Army shells made Hitler jump every so often, Bauer was still sure he could fly his Führer to safety. In the weeks and days leading up to the end, Bauer's Führer squadron had been ready to leave Germany from at least six airfields in and around Berlin. There were many options as to where to go, the Baltic coast maybe, or further afield, Greenland, Manchuria, Argentina, Japan, Arab sheiks would even help hide Hitler. Hitler wasn't impressed, so Bauer told him again right at the end, he had a Fieseler Phi 156 starch light plane waiting. He could take off from the Tiergarten near Brandenburg Gate and head straight to Bavaria and from there to safety on the other side of the world. Hitler again refused. He was not going to spend his life on the run, not like the others. He thanked Bauer for his concern and his duty to the fatherland and handed him one of his prized possessions, a portrait of the Prussian King Frederick the Great. And so on that day, sometime in the late afternoon, Bauer was there when Hitler's dead body was wrapped in a blood-stained rug and taken into the garden. Tears filled Bauer's eyes. Just days before, he'd watched his Führer feed nuts to squirrels in that garden. Hitler had been the best man at his wedding, and now he was being doused in gasoline, treated no better than the garbage. On May 1st, Hitler's propaganda chief, the ever-loyal Joseph Goebbels, also became a smoldering mass of flesh and bone in that garden. His wife Magda burned next to him. The Soviets would find at least some of their remains. Turned out that the cremation job was a shoddy one. The Soviets, under the ruthless leader Joseph Man of Steel Stalin, did not want dead bodies. This was no good. He wanted to capture those top Nazis. Like the USA, the Soviets wanted the scientists. They wanted the spies, the great swaths of German intelligence, the doctors who had medical data no other country had. There were many precious and valuable items among that Berlin rubble, but the real treasure were the Nazis themselves. Bauer did not get that far. The road he planned to use as an airstrip had been bombed and was covered in potholes. Hitler was right not to go. The street was crawling with soldiers from the Soviet Third Shock Army. They found Bauer and shot him in both legs. Not too far away, the Nazi chancellery head, Martin Bormann, one of Hitler's closest who'd fled at the same time as Bauer was killed by Soviet artillery. 
It would be years until Borman's death was confirmed. For decades, there were rumors about his whereabouts in the South Americas, Denmark, and Australia. It was said he was a Soviet spy, that maybe he and Hitler had teamed up again. The CIA and the FBI never stopped looking for those two guys, which wasn't public knowledge. Of course, it wasn't until 1998 that Borman, who was one of the main architects of the Holocaust, was conclusively identified using forensic DNA techniques. Every high-ranking Nazi became part of this treasure hunt. The last thing the Americans wanted was for the Soviets to get there first. After one of Bauer's legs was amputated by Soviet doctors in June 1945, he was interrogated time and again. Where is the gold? Where is all the stolen art? Where are your brothers in arms? Where are the scientists? No way would the Soviets kill this man who had been there at the end of Hitler's life and surely knew where the other Nazis had fled. As newspapers the world over ran headlines about Hitler's death and the peace that was surely on the way, Stalin wasn't buying it. Not for a second did he believe Hitler was dead. The Germans didn't surrender immediately after Hitler perished, but the war was a hopeless cause. Germany at least hoped for some favorable conditions, but they were not going to come. Karl Donitz, the Grand Admiral of the German Navy, replaced Hitler as the head of state and was the one to make the final decision to give up. The Allies would accept nothing but complete, unconditional surrender, and that happened on May 7, when Alfred Jodl, the chief staff of the German army, signed it into effect at the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force at Rams in northeastern France. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Millions of people had died, soldiers had returned home with missing limbs, the Soviets, who'd suffered far worse than anyone else, were barely in the mood for the kind of celebration seen elsewhere. 27 million dead, economic chaos, it was terrible for the Soviets, although their propaganda machine played down just how bad the war had been. Stalin didn't even know how close the Americans were to executing the first nuclear bomb test under the Manhattan Project. His dream of world domination diminished the moment his aide whispered in his ear on July 16th that the Americans had completed the test. He was attending the Potsdam Conference at the time with the British and American leaders. It suddenly became much more important to find those Germans in hiding. The public didn't know it, but a new secret war featuring spies was taking place between the US, UK, and the Soviets. Take them alive, not dead, was what all three were saying. As you'll see, they did just that, but they didn't feel the need to tell anyone about it. It was capitalism versus communism, and it would be a long fight. Hitler was dead, even if Stalin didn't believe it. Goebbels was surely dead, but what about the other main players? What about Hermann Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe? Not long before the end came for Germany, he'd been sentenced to death by Hitler for the alleged crime of attempting to seize control of the state. Bormann had orders to execute him if Berlin fell, which of course was always going to happen. It was better for Göring to surrender to the Americans than give himself up to the Soviets, and that's what he did on May 6th when the 36th Infantry Division of the US Army got hold of him. Goring's lavish tastes for gold, jewels, and art came out in his trial, as did his starring role in the Holocaust. But after being handed the death penalty by hanging, not by firing squad as he'd asked, his life came to an abrupt end in his prison cell. If you'd had to list the top five Nazis, including Hitler of course, you might put Bormann in fourth, Goebbels in third, Goring in second, and the top man next to the boss was the head of the SS and Gestapo, the Holocaust's main man, Heinrich Himmler. Himmler had also become the object of Hitler's wrath after he'd attempted to engage in peace talks with the enemy. This infuriated Hitler, who'd always seen Himmler as possibly the most loyal of his inner circle after Goebbels. Hitler called Himmler's call for peace treachery, the worst case of disloyalty in his entire life, and ordered his capture and execution. On May 21st, long after Hitler had been turned to ash, Himmler was apprehended by the British while trying to escape. He was then sent to the 31st civilian interrogation camp outside the city of Lüneburg. Despite the civilian clothes and the absence of his mustache, the British discovered they had someone important on their hands, and no sooner than Himmler admitted that, he was dead. A doctor had asked him to open wide, and the next second, following a slight crunching sound, he was on the floor. Hitler's inner circle was suddenly looking like a quiet place. The man later called the chief architect of the Holocaust, second to Himmler, Reinhard Heydrich, had already died in 1942 at the hands of Czech resistance fighters. This left another of Hitler's closest, the Reich Minister of Armaments and War Production, Albert Speer, who once had ideas he might become Hitler's successor. He was arrested by the British after Germany's surrender. It was heard during the Nuremberg trials that Speer had been a very important component of the Nazi war machine, a literal architect in the industry of mass murder. But it was never certain what he knew about the Nazis' extermination plans, so he only got a 20-year prison sentence. This also left the Nazi Minister of Foreign Affairs Joachim von Ribbentrop, who was arrested in May 1945. After the trials in Nuremberg, he too was sentenced to death. 
Next up for a death sentence was Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, Chief of the Armed Forces High Command. Hitler's inner circle was now almost emptied. But in the who's who of Nazis, Erich Rader's name also came up. He'd been the Grand Admiral of the Kriegsmarine before Donitz took over the position. He might have kept his job as Hitler's main guy in the Navy had it not been for the embarrassment at the Battle of the Barents Sea when Britain's Royal Navy delivered a beating to the Germans late at night in the Arctic off the coast of Norway. Radar lost his job, but that didn't mean he was going to get off scot-free at the trials. Nonetheless, he and Donitz later breathed a sigh of relief in the courtroom when instead of a death sentence they were just handed prison sentences. Rader wasn't expecting that since he'd been charged with all the biggies, war crimes, conspiracy to commit crimes against peace, crimes against humanity, planning, initiating crimes against the laws of war, and waging wars of aggression. They threw the book at Donitz too, but some of the charges didn't stick, and he got away with a 10-year prison sentence. Both men were able to argue they weren't involved in the Holocaust quite convincingly. Those Nazis accused of being a major part of the final solution were not so fortunate to go on to serve prison sentences and in later life write books and then take up gardening. Hans Frank, the governor general of occupied Poland, was found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity and no way was he going to get off with a prison term. The so-called butcher of Poland exhibited no shame during the trial when he said, I was happy when Adolf Hitler, in a most wonderful rise to power, unparalleled in the history of mankind, succeeded by the end of 1938. Frank was asked, did you ever participate in the annihilation of Jews? He replied, I say yes, and the reason why I say yes is because, having lived through the five months of this trial, and particularly after having heard the testimony of the witness Haas, my conscience does not allow me to throw the responsibility solely on these minor people. Like many Nazis at the trial, Frank didn't want to look like an evil beast, so he passed the hot potato upwards as if everything had been Hitler and Himmler's fault. Hitler must have been rolling in his grave at this point. Six million Jews dead, Soviet prisoners, other POWs, Roma people, gay people, all dead, and no one wanted to take the blame. They looked like burping children denying they just stole a can of soda. The evidence was overwhelming. Another main man in the Holocaust was Ernst Kaltenbrunner, a rabid anti-Semite that used to hang on Hitler's every word when the so-called Jewish problem was brought up. In the opening statements, he was asked if he was aware he was being charged with being one of the people connected to Gestapo terror and the atrocities of the concentration camps. He said he was and accepted that the hatred of the world is directed against me. While his name might not always pop up in conversations when people nowadays talk about Nazis, he was what the people said he was, the monster of the Holocaust. Well, one of them anyway. Still, like the others, he passed the hot potato, stating in the middle of the trial, I never saw a gas chamber, either in operation or at any other time. I did not know they existed. Like many at the trials, he tried to minimize his part in the mass murders, saying he just followed orders. He was one of ten men, some of whom we've mentioned already, that was hanged on October 16, 1946, beginning at 1.11 a.m. Precisely at 1.52 a.m., it was Kaltenbrunner's turn. His last words were, I've done my duty by the laws of my people, and I am sorry my people were led to this time by men who were not soldiers and that crimes were committed of which I had no knowledge. It seems he died throwing that hot potato. 43-year-old Sergeant John C. Woods from San Antonio in the U.S. was the executioner. Despite all this denial, he took great pride in his job. He told Time Magazine, I hanged those 10 Nazis, and I am proud of it. I wasn't nervous. A fellow can't afford to have nerves in this business. Some people who were there said some of the men's heads hit the trap door on the way down and that the rope wasn't long enough so they were strangled to death rather than dying from their necks being broken from the fall. The U.S. Army denied this, but to be frank, not too many people expressed dismay at a possibly half-botched hanging. Rumors circulated that the Army had done this on purpose. These ten men were perhaps the cream of the crop, but the massacre of millions doesn't happen without thousands of people being involved. The U.S. alone arrested around 100,000 Germans accused of war crimes. There was the doctor's trial in 1946, in which 23 men were accused of conducting or taking part in the terrifying Nazi medical experiments we'll discuss soon. Seven men were acquitted and seven were sentenced to death. The others spent around 10 years in prison. Over 1,300 witnesses came forward to talk about the horrors inflicted in those camps. Over 30,000 documents were brought into evidence, and the proceedings generated around 132,000 pages of transcripts. One of the men featured in those transcripts a lot was Adolf Eichmann, another architect of the Holocaust. 
This man helped to bring millions of Jews into those camps where they would live in horrific conditions and almost always be exterminated. Eichmann was one of the men that designed the plans for the final solution. He often gave the orders to many of those who would later pass the blame on to anyone but themselves. One of them was Rudolf Haas. The testimony of Haas shocked everyone, and it suddenly made Eichmann one of the most wanted men on the planet. Haas served as the Auschwitz Commandant and was one of the people responsible for introducing the pesticide Zyklon B as the weapon to kill millions of people in the gas chambers. He didn't deny it. He also said something that put Mr. Eichmann in deep water. Haas was asked, Witness, did the state police, as an authority of the Reich, have anything to do with the destruction of the Jews in Auschwitz? He replied, Yes, insofar as I received all my orders as to the carrying out of that action from the Oberstrumfahrer, senior assault unit leader Eichmann. This name popped up time and time again, and to everyone's alarm, he wasn't one of the men about to testify in any trial. He'd done a runner, and as you'll see, he had some help. Hulse came right out with it, explaining in a written statement that he later confirmed in court, We executed about 400,000 Hungarian Jews alone in Auschwitz in the summer of 1944. He admitted to murdering 20,000 Russian POWs as well as torturing British POWs. He said at Auschwitz they executed 2.5 million people, while half a million more died from starvation. Some of the more important words ever written after World War II were in Haas's signed testimony. You need to hear this from the horse's mouth because it is so astonishing. I used Cyclone B, which was a crystallized Prussic acid that we dropped into the death chamber from a small opening. It took from 3 to 15 minutes to kill the people in the death chamber, depending on the climactic conditions. We knew when the people were dead because their screaming stopped. We usually waited about one half hour before we opened the doors and removed the bodies. After the bodies were removed, our special commandos took off the rings and extracted the gold from the teeth of the corpses. Haas explained how mothers would hide their children in the camp, how he and his men tried to keep the extermination secret from the rest of the prisoners, but the foul and nauseating stench gave it away. In relation to the mass executions, he was asked again, this entire action came to you directly from Himmler through Eichmann, who had been personally delegated. He replied, yes. So the line of command went Hitler, Himmler, Eichmann. As you now know, Himmler was dead by this point as was Hitler, so now Eichmann was the man that everyone wanted that the Jewish people were screaming out for. But Eichmann was nowhere to be found. After the war, he was arrested with other SS officers by US troops and later sent to a work camp. He'd given the US authorities the name Otto Eichmann. By the time Haas was spilling the beans, Eichmann had escaped the camp and was hiding out in Germany under the name Otto Heininger. For those escaped Nazis to survive on the run, they needed a lot of friends. One of them was the Austrian bishop Aloy Hunda, a man who years later would refuse to admit he'd done anything wrong, famously saying, we do not believe in the eye for an eye of the Jew. It was Hundel who made it possible for Eichmann and many other war criminals to hide out in monasteries and Nazi safe houses until they had sufficient paperwork to get a passport and head to Argentina or another far-flung nation. These escape routes were called rat lines. Many of them led to countries in South America, but other chosen destinations were Mexico, Switzerland, and as you'll hear about in detail, the USA. There are various reasons why the Nazis chose South American countries. One is they could find other Germans there. Many of the countries were sympathetic to the Nazi cause. Cruel dictators would take them. There was also the fact that those countries didn't have extradition treaties. And once enough Nazis were in a certain country, they could form networks. A Nazi journalist interviewed Eichmann in 1956. These recordings were not made public until 2022. They tell you a lot about Eichmann, who quite nonchalantly admitted, I don't care about the Jews deported to Auschwitz, whether they lived or died. It was the Führer's order. Jews who were fit to work would work and those who weren't would be sent to the final solution. As he said those sobering words, Jewish Nazi hunters were sure Eichmann was somewhere in Argentina. Eichmann had actually settled in well, working various jobs and at one point becoming the department head at a Mercedes-Benz plant in Buenos Aires under the name Clement. Little did the Nazi hunters know that the CIA already knew that. The CIA even had its own Nazis in South America on its payroll. Many years later, the agency declassified 27,000 documents about former Nazis and their lives on the run. One of the documents reads that Eichmann is reported to have lived in Argentina under the alias Clemens. He was actually living under the name of Ricardo Clement. Why no one told the Nazi hunters is complicated. It's believed that the West Germans and the British also knew much that those Nazi hunters wanted to know. This was the Cold War, and perhaps those countries like the US had a reason for not sharing all their intelligence. You'll understand this more clearly soon. For now, we'll just say some men were supposed to stay hidden. 
In May 1960, a group of Israeli Mossad agents sent to capture Eichmann staked out his house in San Fernando, a suburb of Buenos Aires. They watched him travel to work and back by bus. They were sure they had the right man. At one point, one of the agents went up to Eichmann and talked to him in Spanish. Eichmann got scared and guessed what was happening. But before he could run, two other agents were wrestling him to the ground. One of the worst runaway monsters of World War II had been captured. This wasn't extradition in any sense of the law, it was kidnapping, but hey, what were they to do without any extradition treaties in place? The agents drugged Eichmann and smuggled him back to Israel on a plane, breaking God knows how many laws on the way. This was incredibly controversial at the time. For an architect of the Nazi genocide, Israel basically said something like, extraordinary circumstances require extraordinary measures. Eichmann was soon standing in a courtroom described by one of the 500 journalists as a thin, balding man of 55 who looked more like a bank clerk than a butcher. It was a naive thing to say. Evil doesn't snarl and have horns. It winks and wears a tie. Like the rest, Eichmann denied being the monster he'd been made out to be. He told the court he didn't kill anyone and that he was only dealing with train timetables and technical aspects of evacuation transports. Nope, that didn't impress anyone. He was executed in 1962. When those Mossad agents were in Argentina, they had to make a sacrifice. That's because they might have also been able to capture the man that was known as the Angel of Death, the Nazi doctor that experimented on prisoners in the worst possible way, Joseph Mengele. This is the man that would walk up to Jews after they entered the camp and picked out the specimens he wanted, often the children who would later call him uncle after he handed them candies. Little did they know they were going to be his human guinea pigs. This is how one of those kids later described being picked by Mengele. Dr. Mengele pulled me out of a queue as we were on the way from the sea logger camp to the gas chamber. I was the only one picked that day personally by Mengele and his assistant. They took me to his laboratory where I met other children. They were screaming from pain. I was injected with drugs and chemicals. On the behalf of the German pharmaceutical companies and the war effort in general, Mengele would purposefully infect people with diseases. He gave some gangrene after rubbing dirt and glass and wounds he'd made. He operated on people without anesthesia. Sometimes when he was done, he ordered them out the back of the lab where they were shot. It's not certain how many people were victims of these terrible experiments, but it was likely in the region of 27,000. It's been reported that over 4,300 of them died, and many more were rendered disabled or left with terrible scars. Lots of them later testified about the horrors they'd faced in the camp. His infinitely unethical work, of course, was useful to the Nazis. In a sane world, you can't experiment on humans, but in the world of war, the Nazi war, that suddenly became possible. Some were left outside to freeze to the point of death and then were dangerously heated up. Women had their muscles and nerves removed. Many had entire limbs hacked off. Some were given deadly blood infections. Dr. Zdenka Nedvedova Niedla, a Czech doctor who worked alongside Mengele, later testified high amputations were performed. For example, even whole arms with shoulder blades or legs were amputated. These operations were performed mostly on insane women who were immediately killed after the operation by a quick injection. It wasn't an easy decision for those Mossad agents to know that they were giving up Mengele in order to catch Eichmann. They'd heard the nightmarish stories, but in that contaminated sea of hidden Nazis, Eichmann was the bigger fish. One of the Mossad agents explained it simply, When I have a bird in my hand, I don't start looking for a bird in the bush. I'll take the bird in my hand, put it in a cage, and then deal with the one in the bush. But by the time the Red Army liberated Auschwitz on the 27th of January 1945, Mengele was long gone. When the Americans got him in June, he'd already given all his important documents to a nurse. The US had no idea who they had on their hands, so they released him under the name Fritz Ullmann, which he later changed to Fritz Holman. He stayed in Germany for a while working on farms, but when those testimonies revealed his sadistic experiments, he managed to persuade enough people he was worthy candidate for a first-class rat line ticket. SS members helped him get to Italy, where they got a passport from the International Committee of the Red Cross. In 1949, he sailed on a ship to Buenos Aires and later worked as a carpenter under the name of Helmut Greger. He was being careful for a good reason. A sure death sentence awaited him in Europe. But his confidence grew over the years. He made trips back to Europe to see his family, even going on a skiing holiday. Back in Argentina, he started a pharmaceutical company. He gave young women illegal abortions. He never really changed. Speaking about Brazil, he once wrote in his diary, Brazil is a nice country to live in despite the mixing of races, but there are many people who, like me, believe and are sympathetic to the Nazi movement and racial ideology. He remained a fan of eugenics, writing in another entry, weaker humans should not be permitted to reproduce. This is the only way for humankind to exist and sustain itself. 
During the trial of Eichmann in 1961, Mengele's name was mentioned numerous times. Later, in 1963, during the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials, a witness named Vera Alexander shocked everyone in attendance when she said, There was a set of twins, gypsies, whom he took away one day from the block where I was. That was the Sieg Unterlager, the gypsy camp. Some days later, he returned with them with veins in their arms and their backs sewn together. The judge couldn't believe his ears and asked her again, He sewed them together like Siamese twins? She replied, Yes, he did. Alas, Mr. Mengele was never brought to justice. On February 7, 1979, while Mengele was at a coastal resort in Brazil, he had a stroke in a swimming pool and drowned. He was seen as one of the ones that got away. But little did Americans know that fiends like him were living among them at this time. None of this would have been possible if it wasn't for those rat lines. Franz Stangl is more proof. He was one of the worst, the commander of the Sobibor and Treblinka extermination camps. It said on his hands was the blood of possibly a million Jews. This made him an even bigger fish than Mengele. In 1948, he went to see that man of the cloth, Bishop Aloy Hundel, when Hundel said to him, You must be Franz Stangl. I've been expecting you. He went first to Syria with the documents Hundel gave him, and later he headed to Brazil. With his family in tow, he worked in Sao Paulo at a Volkswagen car plant. But for once, justice was served, and Stangl was extradited. He was back in West Germany in 1967, and he was sentenced to life in prison in 1970. Just six months into that sentence, he died from heart failure. He called the Jews he killed mere numbers, cargo, as he said one time. About mass murder, he stated, That was my profession. I enjoyed it. It fulfilled me. And yes, I was ambitious about it. I won't deny that. One of his last interviews, he told a journalist, In reality, I share the guilt. Nineteen hours later, he was dead. Stangl, like many of the rats in the rat lines, crossed the Alps into Italy. They often hid out at the Capuchin Monastery near Bressanone, and sometimes the Franciscan Monastery near Bolzano. This was called the Monastery Route. From there, Rome was usually the next destination and then to far-off places. In Rome, with a member of the Catholic Church having confirmed their identity, the International Committee of the Red Cross supplied them with a passport. Somewhere in the region of 120,000 papers were handed out leading up to 1951. This might sound strange, but it was due to humanitarian concerns. The so-called protective passports were for anyone at risk of persecution, including Jews during the Holocaust. Still, the organization was roundly criticized for giving those Nazis papers. This was no time for neutrality, was the usual refrain. Sometimes, those involved in the rat lines weren't neutral in the slightest, such as the U.S. intelligence agencies that helped the so-called Butcher of Lyon escape. He was Klaus Barbie, a man whose face stayed in his victims' memories for the rest of their lives. The eyes, they used to say, they could never forget his evil eyes. Like a James Bond villain, he interrogated people suspected of being part of the French resistance with a cat in his arms. Survivors testified that he'd put the cat down and walk over to his toolbox, telling them, You will speak to me. Trust me, you will talk. They all do in the end. One of them later testified, Barbie took pleasure, a pleasure that was astounding and torturing. Another said, He had the eyes of a monster. He was savage. My God, he was savage. It was unimaginable. He butchered them in ways we can't even truly describe, and then sent them to their deaths at the camps. Barbie was the head of the Gestapo in Leon, whose headquarters were at the famed Hotel Terminus. This is where the torture happened, often for days on end with that damn cat of his always nearby. Not many people could hold out. Some did, though, such as a woman named Lise Lucerre, whom Barbie thought was connected to a resistance fighter named Dider. On his last attempt to torture her, after already smashing her up and freezing her in baths of ice cubes, he said in a calm voice, I admire you, but in the end everybody talks. What you have done is magnificent, my dear. Nobody has held out as long as you. It's nearly over now. I'm very upset, but let's finish. Go on a little effort. Who is Dider? She said nothing, just looked at him from her swollen eyes with a hatred she never thought she could muster. He then said, liquidate her. I don't want to see her anymore. Stories like these were common. It was discovered after the war that Barbie sent possibly 4,000 of those people to extermination camps, including dozens of orphans. This was a man with plenty of information about spies. He had a lot of intelligence in his mind and in his little black books. So after the war, he was a man of great value, a top asset. The British got there first. Their agents beat him and interrogated him, asking him everything he knew, including the names of all the secret communists in Europe. God only knows the U.S. wanted those names more than anyone. In fact, the U.S. took Barbie away from the Brits. A paper written on the matter reads, CIC rationalized that if unemployed, Barbie would renew his overtures to the British who would find out that the CIC had not turned him in. 
the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps, an early iteration of the CIA, knew the French wanted Barbie the Butcher to pay for his crimes, but he was just too good to give up. So the CIC put Barbie on their payroll. They said if he spied for them as an anti-communist, he'd live very comfortably and get hundreds of dollars for his work. Well, thought Barbie, that sounds better than hanging from a rope. They also promised him they'd make his name disappear, since word was already getting around about this Butcher of Leon. It wasn't an easy decision for the CIC. They knew the French wanted justice, it was just a matter of thinking about what was better in the greater scheme of things, and the agency chose to keep Barbie. Now, things get really crazy. A now declassified file states in 1951, the CIC sponsored his escape to South America via a rat line operating through Italy. The question is, who did they pay? In actions that many years later the U.S. Justice Department would have to issue apologies over, the CIC enlisted a fascist war criminal who was one of the main instruments of ratline escapes. He was the Croatian priest named Dr. Kunoslav Draganovic, a nasty piece of work said to be behind the murder of hundreds of thousands of Orthodox Serbs and Jews. Here is a part of a secret CIC memo that was decades later unearthed. The 430th CIC detachment has been operating with what they term a ratline evacuation system to Central and South America without serious repercussions during the past three years. At the cost of approximately $1,000 for each adult, 430th CIC is transferring evacuees to Italy where they are provided with legal documentation obtained through devious means there. South American dictators ran a tight ship in terms of capturing and killing their enemies, and Barbie was the king of interrogations. They tortured their critics and made others go missing. Since they were anti-communist, things got the backing of the U.S. under Operation Condor. The U.S. paid for and arranged coups of democratically elected leaders, so relatively speaking, having a Nazi on the payroll wasn't really such a big deal. There's even more circumstantial evidence that it was Barbie and the CIA working in a collaboration that led to Guevara's capture by Bolivian soldiers. We now know that Barbie was also on the payroll of West Germany's Federal Intelligence Service. He was Agent 43118. Like the US, West Germany would rather not have this come out, but it did. Barbie worked with other organizations that killed indiscriminately and ruled by fear, the drug traffickers. For a while, he helped Bolivia's biggest drug lord Roberto Suarez Gomez, aka the King of Cocaine. He later got pally with Pablo Escobar and his Medellin cartel. Escobar gave him money for his anti-communist work, which was kind of weird given the US was after Escobar yet at the same time working with Barbie. It wasn't too long though before his identity was revealed and he was on his way back to Europe to face the music. The spying agencies of the Americans, the Brits, and the West Germans were all somewhat hot under the collar because they'd known all along he was alive and well, working as torturer-in-chief in South America while trafficking drugs. When he arrived at the airport in 1983, a 44-year-old woman who he had tortured as a kid was there and tried to shoot him. She failed and got herself arrested. He was hated that much, so his appearance was mightily embarrassing for the Americans. The Justice Department had to make that apology. Its long investigation led to a paper being written, with sections headed with things like the Army's interest in reactivating Barbie in 1965 to 67, drug trafficking, weapons trade, and Barbie's entries into the United States. While Nazi hunters were struggling to find him and the French were clueless about his whereabouts, the CIA was writing memos that said he could be re-recruited in the late 60s if he could provide unique information of significant importance under secure operational conditions. Barbie went to trial. His victims hissed and screamed at him in the courtroom. Some broke down, describing in harrowing detail what had happened to them back in Leon. Journalists were rendered speechless by what they heard, how this now old man had been the very embodiment of sadism. Barbie's lawyer tried to argue that what Barbie had done was no different from what the Americans did in My Lai in Vietnam, what the French did in Algeria. It didn't work. He was found guilty of crimes against humanity and died four years later in prison. The question now was, who else had the CIA and FBI known about all these years? Declassified documents tell us the FBI investigated the possibility of Hitler escaping through a rat line to South America. Some of the 700 FBI documents declassified in 2014 said just that, or at least wrote about the possibility of it happening. One of them states, Hitler's reported to be hiding out in the foothills of Southern Andes. The file says a meeting took place in Hollywood. A man in that meeting said he was in a group of four people who met Hitler and his party when they landed from a submarine in Argentina. More subs arrived carrying around 50 people including doctors, all part of Hitler's escape party. All kinds of things were coming out, but that didn't mean they were true. The CIA under Operation Bloodstone had tried after the war to hire leading former Nazis in hiding so as to recruit them into the Cold War against the Soviet Union. 
Both J. Edgar Hoover at the FBI and Alan Dulles at the CIA were in on this. The New York Times said in a report that about a thousand Nazi war criminals were hired, and some ended up being given papers to move to the US. One case involved a man accused of machine gunning down 60,000 Jews in Lithuania. He was hired by the CIA as a spy and paid $1,700 a year, as well as two cartons of cigarettes each month. That was in 1952. In 1956, he was given the green light to emigrate to the US. Years later, when the FBI wanted to prosecute him, the CIA stepped in and said they couldn't do that because it would expose them. In 1980, the FBI told the Justice Department to please step aside when the latter said, we know at least 16 Nazi war criminals are living in the US and working for you. They were FBI informants, giving information to the agency on who in the US had sympathies for the commies. 16 had been hired, but in 1980 only 6 were still on the payroll. The FBI sent a memo to its agents reminding them the most important thing was protecting the confidentiality of such sources of information to the fullest extent possible. One of those undercover agents was SS officer Otto von Bolschwing. He'd worked under Eichmann and once authored a research paper on how to best terrorize Jewish people. Despite being a war criminal, he was hooked up with the CIC after the war, and later when he became the CIA, Bolschwing was one of the agency's best European spies. The CIA thanked him in 1954 when it moved him and his family to New York, what the agency said was a reward for his loyal post-war service. Another note admitted that if the Israelis find out and he's exposed as one of Eichmann's main men, it'll be embarrassing to the US. The CIA managed to keep the information about his close relationship with Eichmann under wraps for at least a while. Now, they weren't all great spies. The Times wrote, But many Nazi spies proved inept or worse, declassified security reviews show. Some were deemed habitual liars, confidence men, or embezzlers, and a few even turned out to be Soviet double agents. Who knows, maybe that quiet man next door your grandmother used to talk about was a Nazi war criminal helped through a US-sponsored rat line after the war. It's thought that under Operation Paperclip, the US took in another 1,600 German scientists, some of whom were members or even leaders of the Nazi party. These weren't hired as spies like the other men, but to do what they'd always done, science. Some became a big part of the Cold War space race. And don't think for a second that the Soviets didn't also employ former Nazi scientists. They put about 2,200 of them on the payroll. According to The Guardian, some Nazis also lived in the UK, and MI6 hired a few. The paper wrote in 2006, Most remained in the UK, however, and were granted civilian status. Many married, started families, and by the 1990s those who survived were British subjects. Gunther Ebeling was the commander of an annihilation squad of the SS in Warsaw, and right after the war he ended up working for both the British and American spy agencies. His alias for both agencies was Slim. A research paper featuring Slim and other Nazi war criminals hired by the Brits and American states? At this time, the British knew Slim was a war criminal. Perhaps this is why they advised one of their own intelligence officers, Mr. Coleman, to drop his personal friendship with him, which had formed during Operation Nursery. Nevertheless, the British ID had been using Slim in coordination with their American colleagues in an anti-Nazi operation codenamed Jersey Cow, which would later develop into the better-known Operation Selection Board. Operation Selection Board consisted of going after 70 ex-Nazis who were part of a right-wing, virulently anti-communist movement. These rabid and dangerous war criminal anti-communists had actually believed that they would get help from the British and Americans since they were so against Stalin. It was later written, Fantastic as this idea may seem, it made sense to these people, and they believed that the British and American authorities would accept it. They then decided to make the supreme effort. At the risk of certain imprisonment, if their plan failed, they sent five of their leaders to make contact with the authorities, reveal their identities as fugitives, and make their proposition. The paper also states that Klaus Barbie was responsible for for the procurement of supplies for the organization and the establishment of an intelligence network throughout the British and American zones. For a while, the agencies played along and told the Nazis they were behind them, that they'd help them set up a new right-wing government so long as they went after the communists. But the agencies hired Slim to help them arrest these Nazi war criminals, as well as the remaining Hitler youth in Operation Nursery. In one swoop, the Americans and Brits arrested 50 of these Nazis. A book about the matter states, This was the last large organized group of Nazis to be formed in the western zone of Germany. It was completely broken up, its activities were publicized, and its story now serves as a reminder to the German people of the futility of nationalistic actions outside the scope of existing democratic processes now in operation in Germany. 
A different paper written about Mr. Slim states, evidence suggests the CIC believed he was crucial to the successful completion of Operation Nursery and the breaking up of other Nazi underground organizations. But Slim's story was a common one. The Americans soon started worrying that it would get out that they and the Brits had a war criminal on their secret books. More concerning was the fact that Slim now knew way too much about American and British intelligence. What if he became a double agent? He soon became a security risk. It was said that the agencies loved the information and not the informant. The spies were highly expendable. Three British intelligence officers later tried to arrest Slim. As the saying goes, they were bringing him in. The report says Slim's rendezvous on January 18th was a trap. It says the six foot six huge man went through the Brits like a bowling ball. The report adds they'd been ordered to take him alive and did not in consequence use their pistols except to try to overawe him. One officer shot Slim in the foot and he apparently went berserk, so they tried to knock him out with chloroform. The report states finally after a severe struggle, one of them hit Slim over the head with a loaded stick and knocked him unconscious. They shoved him in a car, pending advice from the Americans, but before they could get him to the Americans, he died in the back. We imagine his last words were something like, you double-crossing, lying pieces of shh. If this story proves anything, it's that the end of the war was certainly a murky business. As the war in Ukraine enters its second year, the conflict remains an uncertain place for both parties. In Russia, Vladimir Putin continues to create propaganda for his domestic audience, boasting that victory is only a short time away. And all the sacrifices are worth it. He threatens NATO, encroaches on Moldova, and vows to respond to provocations with overwhelming force. All the while, Russia remains under devastating economic sanctions, sees its military supplies dwindling, and finds it harder and harder to get new recruits for the war, with its citizens dodging the draft and its private armies increasingly vocal about the state of the war. In Ukraine, emotions are higher. Despite the rough state of the country, the army is highly motivated. President Volodymyr Zelensky has kept the country's faith alive, and the rest of the world has rallied to the country's defense, but Russia still occupies a large portion of eastern Ukraine. The AFU continues to push back, even retaking territory, but progress has been slow and is heavily dependent on Western support. NATO and the United States in particular have kept Ukraine well stocked with top-of-the-line military weapons, and there's no guarantee that it'll last forever, especially with elections and many key allies coming up. Which leads many people to wonder, how will this war end? That's what historian Hein Gomans, a specialist in war and territorial disputes, sat down to discuss on CNN. The University of Rochester professor discussed the possible end points of the war, how likely they were, and how hard it would be to get any end to the conflict. Long story short, don't expect any victory parades anytime soon. Gomans had been analyzing wars for decades, and one conclusion he came to is that many wars don't quite end. The most famous war in history, World War II, was one of the only ones that ended with a decisive blows finishing off one of the two sides, followed by an unconditional surrender. The same went for the U.S. Civil War, but that was an atypical situation given that one of the two sides wasn't a fully formed country. In most cases, both sides will do anything they can to avoid a full loss, and it's more likely to shift tactics, make a tactical retreat, or just keep the war going on in a lower boil indefinitely. But not every side has a choice. Let's look at what it would take for one of the two sides in Ukraine versus Russia to actually win, starting with the outcome that most people thought was the most likely at the start of the war, a Russian victory. This was entirely possible in the opening days of the war, as Russia sought to encircle and conquer the capital of Kyiv, capture Zelensky or drive him into exile, and take control of the Ukrainian government within weeks, before NATO could form a concrete response. It almost happened. A massive advance of Russian troops from Belarus saw Kyiv nearly captured, but Ukraine pulled off a risky move by blowing a dam to flood Russian pontoon bridges, denying the Russians one of their access points. The war settled into a game of attrition, one that Ukraine has been winning thanks to NATO backing, but Putin hasn't given up. Russia has pulled off several searches since the early days of the war, sending large numbers of troops into Ukraine to mixed effect. While they've taken some cities like the mining towns of Solodar, most are bombed out areas in eastern Ukraine that are in the area Russia already controls. Russia also simply does not have the resources, either militarily or in terms of manpower, to overrun Ukraine anymore. That means that for Russia to pull off a total victory in the war like Putin is promising, some major things need to change on the ground. But all of these options might have some serious problems. Since the start of the war, Putin has been threatening to use nukes if NATO doesn't back off and let him have Ukraine. These threats are designed to scare the more dovish governments in the alliance to disengaging. But it doesn't seem to be working for several reasons. For one thing, no one thinks Putin or more likely his generals are foolish enough to attack NATO directly, so any nuclear attacks would likely be tactical and aimed at Ukraine. This would only harden the resolve of Ukraine's allies. 
The other elephant in the room is that no one knows exactly how many of Russia's nukes actually work. They're mostly Cold War nukes that haven't exactly been maintained well since, so Russia's so-called nuclear deterrent may be a paper tiger. But Russia has some other cards to play, although they might be long shots. Russia's biggest problem in the war has been a lack of allies. Most of the world has either lined up behind Ukraine or largely stayed out of the conflict entirely. While some left of center leaders like Brazil's President Lula have issued statements blaming both sides for the conflict, few are actually supportive of Russia's attack. Those few allies include Russian puppet state Belarus and a few outlaw nations like Iran and North Korea that view the war as a proxy conflict between the US and the opposition. Those two countries have been providing Russia with most of its weapons, as it's been the only way for the nation to get equipment while avoiding sanctions in recent months. But it's far from enough to make a difference. Which is why one ally might be the key. China's played a unique role in Russia's war so far, with Xi Jinping wasting no time draping his arm around Vladimir Putin and declaring their great powers in sync, bolstering their power in opposing the US. Since then, China's been a critical ally of Russia while under sanctions. It is one of Russia's largest trading partners and has been key to providing it with supplies. Analysts believe that China wants Russia to win the war to kick off an age of conquest where China's eventual attack on Taiwan will be less strongly opposed by the international community. So many people are wondering, why isn't China acting like they're all in? Xi Jinping talks a big game about supporting Russia, but he's been hesitant in one major area. It has not supplied Russia with lethal aid, aka weapons, and this is an area where Russia is in dire need. There might be a couple of reasons for this, with the most obvious being that China fears secondary sanctions from the West. Unlike Russia, China has massive ties to the United States in just about every sector, especially technology, and if it's hit with sanctions because of its involvement in the war in Ukraine, it could both devastate the country's economy and cut it off from valuable resources. But there might be one even bigger factor. Right now, Russia looks like a loser, and China isn't in the business of doing business with losers. China was probably ready to supply Russia with what it needed in the early days of the war, but as soon as an attempt to conquer Kiev failed and NATO rallied, China backed off. That means ironically, the more Russia needs weapons, the less likely they are to get them. China is probably waiting for evidence that Russia can win the war before they get any more involved in the conflict, because the consequences of backing a failed war could be bigger than the benefits of backing a successful one. Which means that Russia has some heavy lifting to do if it wants to dream about a grand victory parade in Moscow. For one thing, it'll need allies, with China at the top of that list. In order to win, Russia would need to destabilize the Kyiv government, and that means it'll need to get a lot closer to the capital than it is now. Russia doesn't have the weapons for a massive offensive right now, and only China can likely provide them, so it might be able to coax China into taking the risk if it can show them a concrete plan, and that plan would likely start with two Eastern European countries. The first would be Belarus, where dictator Alexander Lukashenko is deep in debt to Putin. While Lukashenko's military is weak and wouldn't be of much help even if they helped in Ukraine, Putin would likely settle for access to the border to launch an offensive toward Kyiv from the north. But Ukraine has fended that off before, so another base is needed. Moldova is a small country that doesn't even border Russia, instead being sandwiched between Ukraine and Romania, but it might be the next flashpoint in Russia's expansionism. That's because Russia has sponsored a Russian separatist movement in the country's east, in a region called Transnistria. This slit of land borders Ukraine south, and while Russia is using it to destabilize Moldova's pro-Western government, it might be more interested in the battalion of armed Russian troops stationed there, ostensibly to protect the pro-Russian population. That army could be used to launch a sneak attack on Ukraine, bringing Russian forces close to Kyiv from two directions. But would it be enough? The truth is, it's possible but unlikely. Putin would need absolutely everything to go right. First, he would have to get a near-blank check from China for weapons. Then, the dual attack from Belarus and Moldova would have to be incredibly successful and effective to take Ukraine and its NATO weaponry by surprise. But the goal would be to invade Kyiv, capture Zelensky or drive him into exile, and install a puppet regime in Kyiv to surrender. Putin would then use the latest in a string of unhinged threats against NATO to scare them off of further intervention, now that the collaborator government in Ukraine wanted them out. It would be ugly, unlikely, and just about the only path for a definitive win for Putin in Ukraine that wouldn't be likely to trigger a much larger conflict. And it's highly unlikely that Russia could pull it off. But what about the alternative? When the war began, there was a sense of fatalism in all quarters. As most analysts said, there was no way Ukraine could fight back. The focus was on evacuating civilians and convincing Zelensky to fight on in exile. Then after the first few weeks, people saw the tide turn and asked the question, could Ukraine actually win? 
The answer seems to be yes, but it's not going to be easy. Russia now controls less territory than it did in the weeks after invading, is still battling over bombed out cities in the east, and is facing a terrible casualty rate that is bleeding its military and supplies to the bone without a reliable supplier like Ukraine has. And that has made Ukraine increasingly bold as they talk about reclaiming every last inch of territory Russia has taken from them. But that last mile may likely be the hardest. Ukraine has a pretty close to blank check from the West at the moment, with the United States and the rest of NATO not only supporting their cause, but seeing this as a great opportunity to neutralize Russia's military for the next few decades. While some prominent names, including a certain ex-reality TV host, have groused about the amount being spent on weapons being sent to Ukraine, the country has bipartisan support in most Western nations and is getting everything from advanced anti-missile systems to state-of-the-art tanks with a few major exceptions. The weapons Ukraine has been getting are heavily geared toward ground warfare and defensive warfare, and the one area where the West has been hesitant to grant Zelensky's requests is in long-range warfare. No fighter planes, no long-range missiles, because as supportive as the West is of Kyiv, they don't want Zelensky to have the ability to escalate the war and hit inside of Russia directly. Not that it stopped Putin. A clearly staged drone attack on the Kremlin led to Putin blaming both Ukraine and the US and vowing revenge. But right now, the West seems more interested in helping Ukraine fight off Putin than in helping it strike a decisive blow. And this might be as much about self-preservation as anything else. Putin likes his nuclear threats and makes them every few minutes. But one of the concerns is that Russia does not have a no-first-strike policy. That means that Russia could respond to a conventional attack with a nuclear one, and the Kremlin has not been shy about reminding the West about this policy. While analysts doubt both the health of Russia's nuclear arsenal and Putin's willingness to use it, they're not taking any chances. But Zelensky doesn't want to conquer Russia, he just wants to reclaim the territory taken by it, and that includes the Crimean Peninsula seized back in 2014. In recent months, Ukraine has become increasingly bold, striking arms depots across the border and targeting supply bridges in Crimea. And this might be a no-going-back point. Putin was able to conquer Crimea with relatively little opposition, save global condemnation, because the Kyiv government was at the time pro-Russian. Since then, he has declared Crimea formerly a part of Russia and claims any attempt to recover it would be attacking him. So, the West has been hesitant to back Ukrainian efforts to reclaim it, even as they still acknowledge it is part of Ukraine. But Crimea is key to accessing the Black Sea and controlling the shipping routes in the area, which means that taking it back might be as close as it gets to striking a winning blow in the war. So, what's Ukraine's strategy likely going to be going forward? Kyiv is likely to pursue a continued war of attrition, taking back cities where it can, forcing Russia to grind for every spare inch of territory at the cost of troops and supplies they don't have, and striking at key supply routes. This type of war will have a heavy cost for Ukraine as well, but as long as they maintain support in the West, they can keep it up much longer than Russia can. From there, they hope to mount a final offensive to drive the Russians out of Crimea, expanding their borders back to what they were post-independence. Ukraine likely has no interest in defeating Russia, just in getting the Russians out of their territory, and with Western backing, they might just be able to do it. But there is one big hitch in the plan. This war ends when Putin says it ends, to a large degree, and rather than retreating if Ukraine pushes Russia out of conquered areas, he's more likely to want to escalate, hitting Ukraine with a barrage of missiles designed to maximize civilian casualties. This may not have had any chance of success, but it can prolong the war indefinitely. So the only way this war might actually end with the Ukrainian victory is with Putin's death or removal. Likely from natural causes, illness, or a Russian retirement plan that ends with a trip out a fifth floor window courtesy of his generals. From there, a new Russian leader might simply decide that Putin's folly isn't worth any more blood and treasure. But many wars don't end on a battlefield. So is it time to give peace a chance? One word has been on people's minds for the last few months as the war enters a new stage, negotiations. Could they bring an end to the war? A lot of people seem to think so, and there has been no small amount of controversy over it. First, a coalition of around 30 progressive members of Congress released an open letter calling for the Biden administration to pursue a negotiated end to the war, and then quickly rescinded that letter after being criticized for insufficient support for a US ally. Amid arguing over whose fault it was that the letter was released, they were joined by an unlikely ally, arch-conservative Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who indicated that he would likely take a more even-handed approach to resolve the war if he became president. And it's not just U.S. voices in the mix. Several left-of-center leaders in South America and elsewhere have laid blame on both sides and called for negotiations, but no voice was more prominent than China, which tried to cast itself as an even-handed broker and offered to host peace talks. 
With China seen as firmly in Russia's corner in every way except providing weapons, this was met with mass skepticism, especially after a leaked plan showed China's peace plan would involve a partition of Ukraine that left Russia with much more of the country than it had now, although these documents were never authenticated. But the problem is there might be nothing to negotiate over. Negotiations usually begin with the two sides on opposite ends of the table, with the goal of moving them closer and closer together. But some issues are simply intractable. Currently, Russia stated that any part of Ukraine that has a significant Russian-speaking population actually belongs to them, and that Ukraine's Jewish president is a Nazi, that Ukraine should never have been independent in the first place, and that Ukraine is actually the one attacking them, not the other way around. And every few weeks it seems like they come up with a new grievance to add to that pile. Meanwhile, Ukraine's platform at the negotiating table comes down to two words, Ruskis out. Sometimes issues that seem intractable turn out to be workable. This was the case with Israel and its many enemies in the Arab world. Countries like Egypt and Jordan, which started out refusing to even recognize Israel's existence, eventually signed peace deals and now cooperate extensively with Israel on key security issues. On the other hand, negotiations with the Palestinian Authority have never reached the finish point due to some key issues, like whether millions of Palestinians who are related to the ones who became refugees in 1948 will be allowed to return to Israel proper. So even if Russia and Ukraine came to the negotiating table, there's no guarantee of success. Putin has made it very clear he is not willing to negotiate. But a potential future leader like Defense Secretary Sergei Shoigu might see this as a potential way out of a war he didn't start and knows Russia can't win. While certainly Ukraine wouldn't negotiate its own surrender, they might be influenced to make certain concessions, like ceding Crimea, which has been under Russian control for nine years now. And Russia's top demands might not be from Ukraine, they might demand the removal of all sanctions once the deal is signed. This could be a messy way to end the war, but would require a rational Russian leader and a conciliatory Ukraine, both of which seem rather unlikely. Which means that the most likely way for the war in Ukraine to end is for it not to end. Much like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, many wars don't end in a neat way. The most globally famous example of this is probably the Korean Peninsula, where the Western-aligned South Korea and insular communist North Korea have been locked in a frozen state of conflict for over seven decades with a carefully guarded DMZ between them and occasional bloody skirmishes. And this could be Russia and Ukraine's future, with neither side able to strike a final blow against the other. And it all comes down to whether Russia says enough. Does Russia still have ambitions of conquering Kyiv? Odds are yes, but it's looking increasingly impossible. Ukraine, meanwhile, is equally determined to reclaim every inch of its land, but that might get harder the further they push into places like the Donbass, which Russia has claimed to annex. And with his army weakening by the day along with his public support, and no way to replenish either, odds are Putin is nervously looking for a way out of this self-inflicted quagmire. Which means that he might be looking for the exit, the only question is where he places that exit. It's possible that at some point Putin would simply declare victory, boost forces in the area he currently controls, and cease attacks within the rest of Ukraine. But at that same time, he would likely make some very dramatic threats about what would happen if his new border was breached. If some concessions were made, such as Russia repatriating the many Ukrainian children kidnapped back into Ukraine, the Western world might lean on Kyiv to accept this imperfect finish to the war and move on with its 80% of original territory. But Kyiv would likely see this as a prelude to another attack by Russia, which is why they would likely want to join NATO as a guarantee of future protection. This would essentially lock in the current occupied areas as zones of conflict, with both sides claiming victory. Russia taking its conquered territory and Ukraine defending its sovereignty. Would this end the conflict? Yes, but also no. The areas conquered by Russia would be a perpetual conflict zone going forward, with a large Ukrainian population under Russian control. Flare-ups would be common, with likely incursions by both sides whenever shooting began. The war as it was would be over, but the battle would continue, and likely would for a very long time until there was a change in control in one or both countries. The war would go on from a hot conflict to a constant simmer as both Russia and Ukraine jockeyed for an advantage while trying to avoid full war that they couldn't afford. It would be a messy, unsatisfying end to a conflict for just about everyone involved, which might just make it the most likely option. We have confirmed that a number of these unidentified objects are indeed solid. So said the leader of the Pentagon's newest investigation into UFOs, which you probably know as UAPs today. The long culture of ridicule is officially over, UFOs are real, they are here, and nobody has a clue who's building them. But while UFOs were part of American culture for nearly a century now, the world would be shocked at the disturbing similarities between events happening in the US and a world away 
behind the impenetrable Iron Curtain. The secrecy is over, and what has come from declassified sources both within the former Soviet government and the CIA itself is nothing short of terrifying. Soviet sightings of UFOs run as long as sightings in America, but most Soviet citizens had no clue what was going on in their own backyards. Thanks to a strict culture of secrecy and censorship, it wasn't until Glasnost started to open Soviet society up that the lid on the Soviet UFO secret finally came unscrewed. Some news outlets purposefully dramatized relatively ordinary events as they exercised newly found freedoms and pushed just to see how far they could take things. However, there were plenty of very real UFO-related events happening, and some were high-profile enough to catch the attention of CIA spies behind the Iron Curtain. On January 29, 1986, at 7.55 p.m., a quote, amazing event occurred on Hill 611 near the village of Dalnegorsk in Primorsky Kray. This small mining town is of no note, but that night it would become the most important place in the entire Soviet Union. That evening, multiple villagers observed a reddish sphere flying into the town from the southeast. The object flew while making no noise and appeared to be a nearly perfect sphere of rust red. It got close enough for people to observe that the outer skin of this strange craft was without blemish and had no obvious control surfaces nor means of propulsion. For a while, the object hovered up and down over the village, moving at a relatively slow pace. As it ascended, it would glow brighter before dimming as it descended. Suddenly, the object appeared to be in distress. All witnesses interviewed later by Soviet authorities recalled just how the object jerked or jumped suddenly, then fell like a rock straight down onto Hill 611. Witnesses heard a dull thump as it impacted and then began to burn intensely for an hour. Valery Voshilny, head of the Far Eastern Committee for Anomalous Phenomena, arrived at the site two days after the crash. He noticed that despite everything being covered in deep snow, the site of the crash was completely devoid of it, allowing him to observe splintered silica rocks which could only have occurred from extreme temperatures. The rocks were also smoky looking as if they'd been exposed to intense heat. However, Vulzhilny also found physical evidence of the craft. All over the site, embedded in the rocks themselves, he discovered silvery pieces of metal. Some were fragments, but a large amount had formed into droplets, almost as if they'd been sprayed over the area. This detail would become significant after the fall of the Iron Curtain, when Western UFOologists would compare notes with their Eastern counterparts. American witnesses had very often reported seeing flying orbs, which seemed to spray metal while showing signs of some kind of distress. At the edge of the crash site was a tree stump that had been severely burned and emitted a strange chemical smell. The physical remains were examined at the Omsk branch of the Academy of Sciences, who made a shocking discovery. Some of the fragments had formed into what appeared to be small nets, and when these were put under examination, it was discovered that they were made up of torn and very thin threads 17 micrometers in width. Each thread consisted of even thinner fibers tied up in plates, and intertwined with the fibers were thin, solid gold wires. The technology to replicate this type of delicate nano construction wouldn't appear on the Earth for decades, at least not in human hands anyway. The fragments, which had formed into iron balls, were also put under a battery of tests. Each ball consisted of iron with various levels of aluminum, manganese, nickel, chromium, tungsten, and cobalt. This seemed to rule out a natural creation and the object just being a very peculiar meteorite. Rather, it mostly confirmed that the object was built from heterogeneous alloys. When the balls were melted in a vacuum chamber, they reacted in various ways. On one base, they would melt and spread out as expected, but on another, they formed into smaller balls with convex glass-like structures. But melting the remains revealed yet another mystery. Gold, silver, and nickel would disappear from the balls and be replaced with molybdenum, despite not being present in the sanitized test chamber before testing commenced. The metallic remains would confuse Soviet scientists as they only produced more questions than answers. About the only thing they were able to identify was ashes discovered on the site belonging to a biological being. Perhaps the ashes belonged to an unfortunate animal caught under the crash, or perhaps they belonged to the operator of the mysterious UFO. Sadly, the intense heat made any attempt at identification impossible. Unable to tease out details from the remains, the investigation turned to the object itself before it crashed. The trajectory as reported by eyewitnesses happens to coincide with the flight path taken by rockets launched by China's Xishang Cosmodrome. However, investigators weren't able to verify if any launches had taken place in January from the complex, and the Chinese were not forthcoming with any answers. 
likely looking to keep their space program as secret as possible. However, the investigation revealed something very startling. Soviet citizens had not been the first to spot this mysterious object. The Chinese had already observed it over their own territory. Just days prior to the crash, witnesses close to the Shishang Cosmodrome reported a similar red sphere on January 25th. According to witnesses, the object appeared to simply hover, almost as if observing the Cosmodrome directly. After half an hour, it disappeared. The Chinese sighting wasn't the only clue that this object had traveled great distances, though. There was physical evidence, too. Examination of the soil at the crash site revealed small pieces of light gray-colored soil, but only in the area where the object was presumed to have made direct contact before exploding and mostly disintegrating. Put under spectroscopic analysis, the light gray soil was matched with soil from another area in Russia thousands of miles away. The soil matched tufts from the area of Yaroslavl, northeast of Moscow, containing characteristic elements found there and not in the Dalnogorsk area. Whatever had crashed there, it was obvious somebody came looking for it, though. Eight days after the crash on Hill 611 at 8.30 p.m. on February 8, 1986, eyewitnesses once more reported strange objects in the sky. This time, two yellowish spheres flew into the town from the north. The spheres seemed to be looking for something and made their way directly to the crash site. Once there, they circled the crash site four times, then turned to the north and flew back the way they came. Was it a search and rescue effort by whatever had sent the original sphere there, or simply something wanting to make sure no identifiable remains had been left behind? To this day, nobody knows, but reports of flying spheres exactly mirror similar reports from all the way across the ocean in the United States. And the following year, whoever had visited the sleeping mining town returned in force. November 28, 1987, 11.24 p.m. Reports of flying spheres flood a local military base. Terrified villagers report seeing as many as 32 flying objects, which spread out over 12 different nearby villages. Alarmed Soviet military personnel quickly make their way to the nearest villages and observe the strange flying lights for themselves. Before the night was over, hundreds of civilians and military personnel would bear witness to one of the largest mass UFO sightings in history. The objects appeared specifically interested in Dalnogorsk, and 13 of them broke away and flew directly to the mining village. Once there, three of them hovered stationary over the village, while five seemed to illuminate the nearby mountain and crash site. They appeared to move with no discernible propulsion and made no noise, hovering at varying altitudes between 150 and 800 meters. As the lights flew over homes, people reported disturbances of their electrical equipment. Ministry of Internal Affairs officers would later testify that they observed multiple objects at 11.30 p.m. One object flew toward them from the direction of the Gorley settlement, leaving a, quote, fiery flame behind it. At the head of the flame was an opaque sphere, and within that sphere was another smaller red sphere. At a local quarry, eyewitnesses observed a large cylindrical object the size of a five-story building flying directly toward them. The object was around 200 or 300 meters, with the front lit up like burning metal. Terrified that the object was going to crash into them, many of them fled for shelter. The quarry manager observed the object moving at an altitude of about 300 meters. Large and cigar-shaped, the description would also precisely fit that given by American and Western European witnesses of very similar objects. The object appeared to fly without the aid of wings and no discernible propulsion, making no noise as it flew over the quarry. Nearby, a kindergarten teacher observed a dark, metallic-looking, elongated object she estimated at 10 to 12 meters long. The object appeared to be in front of a bright, blinding sphere of light that hovered noiselessly at the height of a nine-story building. The object hovered over a school and shot a half-meter-wide violet bluish ray down at the ground in front of the school. The teacher remarked that the objects caught in the ray did not create shadows as would be expected if they were being illuminated from above. The object then departed the school and moved to a nearby mountain. According to her, the object appeared to be searching for something, emitting a reddish projector-like light onto the mountain. Finally, the object simply departed by flying over the mountain and out of sight. The crash and subsequent UFO invasion of Dalnogorsk would remain secret for years, but once it made its way into the West, the similarities between this event and multiple similar events in the US would convince researchers that Americans and Soviets were both observing the same mysterious phenomenon. Cigar-shaped objects and mysterious balls of light are a commonly reported type of UFO in the US for decades, and multiple eyewitnesses have reported what they thought were malfunctioning air or spacecraft of some kind which bobbed up and down, as reported by the Dalnogorsk witnesses, 
while emitting a shower of what appeared to be molten metal. Curiously, some of the craft described by the Dalnegorsk witnesses bear a strong resemblance to the infamous U.S. Navy Tic Tac video, filmed by fighter pilots intercepting an unidentified aircraft over the Pacific Ocean. But this isn't the only parallels between Soviet and American UFO sightings, because while America had Roswell, the Soviets also had their own close encounter with alien beings, and their encounter had more and better witnesses than Roswell. It is not a joke nor a hoax nor a sign of mental instability nor an attempt to drum up local tourism by drawing the curious, so said the Soviet state press agency TASS discussing a UFO close encounter in 1989. According to the official report, two boys and a girl from a local school were playing in a park on the evening of September 27th. At approximately 6.30, the children observed something pink shining in the sky, followed by a ball of deep red colors they estimated at 9 meters in diameter. A small crowd gathered as the ball seemed to land, and a hatch opened in the lower part of the ball. From within the ball, three aliens with three eyes each exited, standing nearly three meters tall. The aliens seemed to have a robot companion with them, which they activated with a touch. As the crowd watched in awe, the aliens seemed to communicate with each other, ignoring the onlookers, until a young boy screamed in terror. Suddenly, one of the aliens locked his three eyes on the child and caused him to become temporarily paralyzed. The three aliens then re-entered their vehicle, but quickly re-emerged, with one carrying what the crowd thought was a gun of some kind. The alien aimed the tube at a 16-year-old boy who suddenly vanished, only to reappear after the aliens re-entered their craft to depart. The story was met with both ridicule and a serious investigation, as is typical of UFO reports. To this day, accounts vary. A Soviet evening news correspondent dispatched to the town with a film crew failed to find any eyewitnesses to the aliens except for the children. However, they did speak with the local police chief, who confirmed one important detail of the account. He too had seen a large, silently flying craft shortly before the alleged landing took place. Soil analysis discovered high concentrations of radioactive isotopes in the landing area, but this proved inconclusive as after the Chernobyl disaster it was not uncommon to discover small pockets of highly concentrated radioactive isotopes. However, what's curious is that if it was a hoax, the children just happened to pick a landing spot with said high concentrations of isotopes, which would require analysis in a lab to even identify. Even more curious, when the children were separated into different rooms by investigators, they all drew nearly the exact same craft from memory. The craft was also said to leave behind a mysterious X-shaped sign in the sky as it took off, exactly mirroring UFO encounters reported in the United States by the defunct American magazine Saga in 1976. Given the strict censorship of the Soviet Union in the 70s, it is nigh an impossibility the children or police chief would have had access to said magazine. But why were there no other eyewitnesses to the alien beings themselves? One only need to look at the culture of ridicule surrounding UFOs to understand why a bunch of adults in the repressive communist Soviet Union would not want to speak up about such an extraordinarily weird event. As highlighted in the United States' own recent UAP investigation, a culture of ridicule has, quote, hampered our efforts to collect good data, as pilots are self-censoring for the fear of ridicule and it affecting their future careers. The U.S. Air Force and Navy took that recommendation so seriously that they immediately instituted new guidelines for reporting UFOs, ending the infamous century-long culture of ridicule that silenced witnesses even amongst America's most elite military units. Soviet pilots, however, were long reporting UFOs and on occasion even being killed by them. While on a routine flight over the city of Borisov, two Soviet fighters spotted a large flying disc near the city. The disc seemed to have five beams of light emanating from it. Two were directed upwards into the sky, and three were pointed down at the ground. Ground control instructed the patrol to fly in for a closer look, an act that would doom one of the pilots. On approach, the disc suddenly flew up to match the speed and level with the lead Soviet fighter. Suddenly, it aimed one of its beams directly at the plane, filling the cockpit with blinding light. The co-pilot was at the controls, and the flight logs recorded him reporting a bright ray of light entering the cockpit and projecting a spot about 20 centimeters in diameter. This ray of light swept across the cockpit and directly through the pilot's body, with both pilot and co-pilot reporting extreme heat. The plane broke off and returned to base immediately. Shortly afterwards, the co-pilot's health immediately deteriorated with frequent fainting spells that forced him into retirement. The aircraft commander, however, died within a few months of the incident, with the cause of death listed as cancer. 
This wouldn't be the only report of a UFO shooting beams of light, though. A declassified CIA report notes an encounter with hundreds of eyewitnesses, including a Major V. Loganov outside the city of Omsk. In his own official report, the Major states that he and other eyewitnesses spotted a strange object in the sky which radar could not pick up. The object passed overhead at an altitude of several kilometers, revealing a shining sphere one and a half times as large as the current full moon. The object was casting four very bright beams of light, sometimes parallel to the ground and sometimes at an angle. The UFO hovered over a civilian airport for five minutes and even descended a bit. Suddenly, the beams of light disappeared and a whirling plume trail appeared around the shining sphere. With an extraordinary burst of speed, the object took off to the east. Pilots from a nearby second airport reported seeing the object but being unable to pick it up on their radars. Immediately relaying the sighting off the chain of command, within five minutes other military personnel at Alte Cray reported having the same object under visual observation. Given the time and distance, the object appeared to have traveled 600 kilometers at a speed of about 7,000 kilometers an hour. UFO sightings were so frequent in the Soviet Union that the declassified CIA report also notes a meeting of 100 Soviet scientists from various disciplines, all meeting together to discuss the dramatic uptick in UFO sightings in the 1970s and the 1980s. It's now known that some UFO reports inside the Soviet Union were highly secretive U.S. air and spacecraft. Other sightings were misattributed to everything from secret rocket launches to failed rockets or simply spent rocket stages. However, just like multiple American UFO investigations would reveal, that still left a significant number, about 5% of sightings that simply could not be explained. And most disturbing of all were reports from Soviet nuclear facilities of unidentified craft that perfectly mirror similar reports from the United States in the same time period. In one high-profile encounter, a UFO nearly started World War III. Colonel Boris Solikov spoke with Western UFO investigators after the fall of the Soviet Union, reporting that on the night of October 4, 1982, there was a breach of airspace over a nuclear weapons site in Usovoyan, Ukraine. Solikov, who was working at the Kremlin at the time, described receiving alarmed reports from the facility whose operators had informed him their launch panels all had suddenly activated on their own, something which should have been impossible. For four hours, the entire facility watched a hovering UFO as it loitered directly overhead. While it hovered, the control panels, which could launch the nuclear weapons stored there, suddenly came to life, something which could have only happened with the input of the proper launch codes. The incident sparked a 10-year investigation by the Soviets into the UFO phenomenon, which they kept under wraps until the end of the Cold War. This event closely mirrors a similar incident at a U.S. nuclear facility in Minot Air Force Base, when security personnel observed a UFO which hovered over the silos holding America's nuclear-tipped Minutemen missiles. According to witnesses, the missiles briefly became active and went into launch state, despite having received no such authorization or command from their control centers. Perhaps unsurprisingly, UFO reports around Soviet nuclear facilities remain very difficult to verify, but the Soviet Union had a plethora of otherworldly sightings which only grew in number as the Cold War dragged on. At 4.05 a.m. on September 20, 1977, a group of dock workers in Petrozovoitsk witnessed a blinding light on the horizon from the direction of Lake Onega. The light approached the slumbering city before shifting into the shape of a glimmering jellyfish, whom according to eyewitnesses began to hover over the city and shoot thin beams of light down into the city. The dock workers were terrified, concerned that their nation was under attack, this being the height of the Cold War paranoia over a nuclear conflict between the Soviet Union and the U.S. was running high. After 12 minutes of shooting beams of light down into the city, the UFO transformed once more into a bright semicircle and shot back off in the direction it came. Suddenly, it veered upwards and punched through the clouds, leaving a burning red hole where it passed that quickly dissipated. Later that morning, more witnesses would come forward, and the list would grow from the initial dock workers to police officers, sailors, and an ambulance crew and a reporter for the state news agency. Under pressure to prevent an all-out alarm, the reporter would post a story three days later calling the phenomenon strange and natural. The object left no physical evidence behind save for a photograph allegedly taken of the object by one of the witnesses. However, given the veil of secrecy in the Soviet Union at the time, the photograph has been impossible to verify. However, neighboring local governments became so alarmed by the incident that they demanded an answer from the Kremlin leadership. 
When they were unable to provide a satisfactory response, the event was taken to the Academy of Sciences, where the Soviet Union's most prolific scientific minds worked. They couldn't come up with an explanation for the sighting, but after doing some research concluded that the UFO phenomenon was very real and required more dedicated investigation. The Academy's secret investigation started a year later and ran all the way until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Unofficially known as The Network, this government-backed investigation ran for 13 years and had one goal – scientifically understand the UFO phenomenon. The network enjoyed the support of 20 different organizations staffed by specialists in physics, chemistry, optics, and spectroscopy. The initial investigation was kept top secret for two reasons – either it would verify the existence of extraterrestrial life, or the findings could have some form of defense value. The network also had to coordinate its investigation with the defense ministry a task which created some conflict. Where scientists working for the network found a mystery needing scientific investigation, the defense ministry simply saw a threat or potential enemy, thus the two sides had vastly differing approaches to their UFO investigations. Even so, the two sides worked together to gather UFO data. The network gathered reports from scientific institutes and Soviet citizens, while the defense ministry gathered them from within the Soviet military perhaps spurred on by repeated violations of their air and space by very advanced American aircraft, first the U-2 and then the Blackbird spy aircraft, Soviet soldiers were under strict orders to report all mysterious phenomenon, especially if it interfered with their equipment. This was stark in contrast to the US, where a culture of ridicule had sprung up in both the military and civilian sectors, despite multiple ongoing secret investigations by the Department of Defense. The network would go on to investigate 3,000 UFO reports, debunking all but 300 of them which they had no explanation for. The results would mirror both the US Air Force's Project Blue Book effort and the latest investigation into UAPs by the Department of Defense, but this debunking work was critical for the understanding of what was a real UFO and what wasn't, even when the Soviet Union's secrecy made such work difficult. The Petrozavodsk event, for instance, would be solved by an American engineer working for NASA who put together the pieces missed by the Soviets. Using NASA's satellite tracking center, he discovered that the Soviets had launched an object from their top-secret cosmodrome in nearby Plisetsk at 3.58 am just minutes before the sighting. However, that doesn't explain the motion witnessed and attested to by many observers. Rockets can only go up, even if they do so at a very diagonal angle. They certainly can't hover and they can't lose or gain altitude at will. Could the UFO then been a response to the top secret launch minutes before, or was it a case of bad eyewitnesses being very mistaken about what they saw? We may never know the truth, but what we can be sure of is that something was recreating the same exact UFO phenomenon over the Soviet Union that was taking place over American skies. Sirens wail across the landscape, red lights flash in military bases around the country. Someone has launched a barrage of nuclear missiles at the United States. They sail over New York City, blast past San Francisco, and rocket away from DC. These major cities all seemed like they should have been key targets, but instead the missiles are headed to several unsuspecting states in the middle of the country, places where people thought they'd be safe. The United States' nuclear sponge is attracting the enemy nukes as planned. Unfortunately, anyone living in these states is about to be annihilated in a holocaust of nuclear explosions. There are five US states that still house a large number of nuclear missile silos in a concentrated area. These states are what's known as a nuclear sponge. The question is, do you live in one of the five? If nuclear war breaks out, you may not be as safe as you think. First, what is a nuclear sponge? During the Cold War, the US was very concerned about major cities and metropolitan areas being targeted by Soviet nukes. In order to draw attention away from these areas, the Department of Defense came up with an interesting idea. They hypothesized that if a large number of ICBM nukes were placed in the middle of the country, then the Soviet Union would have to target them first if they were to attack, because if they didn't, the US would be able to retaliate with nukes of their own. These missile sites were placed in rural areas so that the number of casualties would remain low. Forcing the Soviet Union to attack those rural areas would draw fire away from places like New York City, Washington DC, or any other densely populated part of the country. The remote nuclear sites were known as a nuclear sponge since they would absorb the missile fire from the enemy. The missile silos that originally made up the United States' nuclear sponge were deep underground and spaced far enough apart that the Soviet Union would need to commit a large percentage of its nuclear arsenal to destroy them. These nuclear launch sites were put in the plain states 
so they could be launched northward, travel over the Arctic, and hit the Soviet Union on the other side of the planet. So, just to recap, a nuclear sponge is the section of the US where large numbers of ICBM nuclear missiles are housed, in the hope that if an enemy ever did launch a nuclear attack, they would commit a large number of their missiles to destroy the nuclear sponge. This would hopefully spare major urban areas from total destruction at the expense of the people living within or anywhere near the nuclear sponge. Right off the bat, you probably see some problems with the plan. And even when it was conceived during the Cold War, many people voiced their opposition to having nuclear silos in the middle of the country. Yet the Department of Defense built the nuclear silos anyway, and now with a renewed nuclear threat from Putin and the Russian government, there's been a large amount of money dedicated to updating the United States' nuclear sponge. Unfortunately, as we're about to explain, this is a huge waste of money, incredibly dangerous, and provides no real safety to anyone in the US. First and foremost, the US's main strategy for surviving a nuclear attack should be to never let it happen in the first place. Diplomacy and de-escalation should take precedence over everything else, and to be honest, updating the nuclear sponge should be at the very bottom of the list. In fact, it should be so far down the list it isn't even considered an option, because in the current era, a nuclear sponge isn't effective, as we'll explain in a bit. But first, let's examine why the US is even considering upgrading its nuclear sponge the history behind the original idea, and what states are part of the plan to draw fire away from major cities. All you can do is hope you don't live in one of these states if a nuclear war becomes a reality. The main reason we're talking about the nuclear sponge in the middle of the US is that as Russia continues to suffer defeat after defeat in Ukraine, Putin has stated he's considering putting nuclear options on the table. The weapons he's talking about are likely tactical nukes, which can vary in size from a few kilotons up to 50 kilotons. These low-yield nukes would still cause massive destruction and irradiate the surrounding area. But they're nowhere near as devastating as strategic nukes, which have yields of a thousand kilotons or more. The problem is, if Putin starts launching nukes in Ukraine regardless of size, NATO will need to respond in some way. And let's be honest, Putin is not the most stable individual, so if he feels threatened by NATO, he could launch the entire Russian nuclear arsenal at Western countries. He's probably thinking at this point if he can't win, no one can. This has put the US and NATO on high alert. As a result, the United States is dumping huge amounts of money into its military. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been put into the United States' nuclear weapons program in recent years. Some of this money has gone toward upgrading the nuclear sponge in the middle of the country, which makes zero sense, as you're about to find out. At the end of the 1950s, when the Cold War was in full swing and the Red Scare had just destroyed the lives of countless innocent Americans, the development of the original nuclear sponge began. After some consideration, the US government decided that the best location to install their ICBM missile silos that would be far enough away from major cities were in the plains of Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, Montana, South Dakota, and North Dakota. It was here that the first Minuteman nuclear missile silos were constructed in the early 1960s. After the Cold War ended, the silos in South Dakota were retired, which left the five other states as the current nuclear sponge of the US. Since their conception, the nuclear sites around these states have housed Atlas, Titan, Minuteman, and Peacekeeper rockets. However, the most favorable option was the Minuteman missiles due to their solid fuel and ability to be launched from a safe distance. The reason these states were chosen to house the silos was because their landscape allowed for relatively easy development while also having the space to build launch control facilities that could launch missiles from several silos at any given time. By the 1990s, there were around 1,000 Minuteman silos and approximately 100 launch control facilities spread around Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, Montana, and North Dakota. However, there were several other reasons why these states made such a great nuclear sponge. The distance between them and Russia was short enough to hit Moscow, which is approximately 5,100 miles, while traveling over the North Pole. Also, the distance from the coast would give these sites enough time to launch, even if the enemy fired nukes from submarines along the coast. But the biggest motivator for building the missile silos in these five states was that they were sparsely populated, and if they were targeted, they would keep enemy missiles from hitting major cities. For all these reasons, if you live in Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, Montana, or North Dakota, you're in the nuclear sponge of the United States. During the Cold War, when both the Soviet Union and the United States could only launch nukes at one another using ICBMs, the nuclear sponge sort of made sense. There was still the problem of putting the populations in these states in danger of being killed by enemy nukes, but the nuclear sponge would likely attract much of the Soviets' total nuclear arsenal if they did decide to attack the US. Today, this argument does not hold any weight. 
The main reason why the nuclear sponge is so useless now is that if Russia were to attack, they have enough nukes to hit every nuclear silo and every major city many times over. It's estimated that Russia has somewhere around 5,977 nuclear warheads at its disposal. The nuclear sponge obviously doesn't require 5,977 missiles to be destroyed. Therefore, if Russia really wanted to attack the US, they could fire several nukes at each of the five states where the ICBMs are located and still send several thousand other missiles to hit all major cities in the US. Today, Russia and the US can launch nukes from submarines, which means that having a lot of stationary silos doesn't serve any advantage, and there's no reason to waste hundreds of nukes to destroy them. The missile silos in the nuclear sponge of the US are highly visible and would definitely be easy targets. However, strategically it doesn't make any sense for Vladimir Putin or anyone else to waste their nukes on them in the current age of warfare. This brings us to another huge problem for the nuclear sponge. The original intention was for these states to draw nuclear fire away from major cities. But what about the people living in Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, Montana, and North Dakota? It's messed up that the US government willingly admits they built the nuclear sponge to sacrifice one part of the country to save another. But that's exactly what they did. Instead of sacrificing anyone, we might suggest that world powers work toward getting rid of nukes altogether, rather than deciding who is worth and not worth saving. Just having a nuclear sponge at all is terrible, and since the original argument as to why the US needs one are no longer valid, there should be no reason for the US to spend money updating it. However, billions of dollars are still being allocated to the silos in the middle of the country, and the reason why is appalling. Before we get into why money is continuously being funneled into an obsolete US nuclear sponge, let's imagine a terrifying scenario. What would actually happen if the military thought that there were nukes headed toward the silos in the middle of the country? A group of highly trained NORAD analysts at Joint Base Elmdorf Richardson in Alaska sit at their stations. They're constantly monitoring thousands of data points to ensure the United States is safe from nuclear strikes. It's the middle of the night, but the sun is still up. During the summer months, there are almost 24 hours of daylight. It seemed to be just another normal night when suddenly, a red light started flashing on one of the consoles. The technician sitting near the station pushes their rolling chair over to the computer to get a better look at the flashing light. Their eyes open wide as they read the label. I've got a nuclear launch indicator light going off over here, they yell. Everyone turns to look at them. Then a light at another station begins to blink, then another, and another, and another. Get the Secretary of Defense on the phone, a commander yells. Everyone scrambles to figure out exactly where the nukes are being fired from and where they're headed. The President of the United States is startled out of his slumber by a dozen Secret Service agents bursting into his bedroom. Sir, we need to get you to the bunker immediately, the lead agent says. There's no time for the President to get dressed. He throws on a robe and is escorted deep underground, where the Secretary of Defense waits for him along with several other high-ranking generals. What's going on? The President asks. We just received word from NORAD, the Secretary of Defense responds. They're tracking several nuclear missiles headed toward our Minuteman silos in the Midwest. There's very little time for discussion. The generals lay their options out on the table, but the President must make a final decision. It's been about 10 minutes since the warning lights started flashing in NORAD, and whatever the path the President's going to choose, he has to choose it now. The President's predicament is made worse by the fact that there is no way to know if the sensors at NORAD are malfunctioning or if there are actually dozens of nukes rocketing toward the middle of the country. Therefore, the President has to use his best judgment and the data available to make a choice that could change the world forever. On the one hand, he could just wait and let the events unfolding play out. If the nukes really were launched, the middle of the country would be decimated and thousands of US missiles would be obliterated. However, the United States would still have thousands of nuclear weapons still active aboard submarines and in storage sites around the country. The fear is that if the sensors are malfunctioning and the reading coming into NORAD is wrong, the President could inadvertently start a nuclear war if he launches the US's arsenal. This would be a fatal mistake that could destroy the world. The President has to think hard before coming to a decision, but he's out of time. Hold your fire, he whispers to the generals sitting around the table. We built the nuclear sponge for this very reason. We'll know soon enough if nuclear missiles really were fired at the US. I'm not about to start World War III over a malfunctioning computer. The President and his generals wait for what seems like an eternity. They receive confirmation that the skies are clear. The warning lights were triggered by a series of unfortunate events that mimicked a nuclear attack. Russia was testing several new rockets that it had just developed. A series of solar flares scrambled radiation readings aboard surveillance satellites, and a meteor shower was responsible for the atmospheric disturbances detected. If the President had been too hasty and fired the United States' nukes prematurely, he would have caused all-out war and the irradiation of our entire planet. 
This is a fictitious scenario that is based on very real events. There have been at least three false alarms in the past that could have led to nuclear war. All three of the events came about due to malfunctioning equipment. Around 40 years ago, the heads of the Department of Defense received a very ominous phone call in the middle of the night. The analysts working at a nuclear defense office acquired data that indicated 200 ICBMs were launched from the Soviet Union and headed straight for the United States. Everyone scrambled to identify if the readings were accurate. The world was on the brink of war when it was determined that the signals were the result of a computer glitch. Everyone stood down and the planet was saved. An even more terrifying event occurred in the Soviet Union. On September 26, 1983, the Soviet Union's early warning radar system showed the United States had launched five ICBM nukes at them. An officer in the Soviet Air Defense Force named Stanislav Petrov suspected this was a false alarm and double-checked the readings. Rather than immediately calling Yuri Andropov, the current dictator at the Soviet Union, and causing nuclear war to break out, Petrov waited for corroborating evidence. When none came, it was clear that the supposed missiles launched from the US were just the result of a satellite malfunction. It's these types of scenarios that should make us nervous when there are unstable dictators or presidents in control of nations that have nuclear weapons. All it would take is one malfunctioning computer or one mistaken reading to plunge the world into a nuclear war. And in a nuclear war, there are no winners. More recently, a bigger problem had been brought up around having a large number of nuclear missile silos in a relatively concentrated area of the US. As the nuclear sponge is upgraded and more sophisticated launch systems are put in place, there have been concerns that vulnerabilities might allow hackers to access part of the nuclear weapons programming. This would obviously lead to a devastating series of events. If hackers ever gained access to the missiles in the nuclear sponge, they could hold them for ransom. The US would likely have to pay huge sums of money to regain control of its nukes and then would have to figure out how the hackers got into the system to keep it from happening again. In a worst case scenario, hackers or terrorists that gained access into a nuclear device by infiltrating its software could detonate the nuke right in its silo. This would cause a massive amount of destruction and would irradiate the surrounding area. Even more horrifying would be if the hackers managed to launch the nukes. Perhaps they'd target populated US cities, which were the one thing that the nuclear sponge was meant to protect. Connecting land-based nuclear missiles to computer systems that hackers might infiltrate is the stuff of nightmares. The nuclear sponge is obsolete, dangerous, and puts the lives of certain American citizens ahead of others. The nuclear silos in the middle of the country should be retired and demolished. And since all these facts are rather obvious, you might be wondering why the United States still has a nuclear sponge. Or even a more pressing question is why are huge amounts of money being funneled into an outdated Cold War era set of silos that no longer serve any strategic significance? Like the answer to so many baffling questions that come out of politics and the government's choices, it all has to do with money. It's been reported that the United States plans to spend around $264 billion on its next generation ICBM program. This money would be used to upgrade the silos and missiles in the nuclear sponge of the country. This is not being done to enhance the defense capabilities of the US or even make the nuclear sponge more attractive to enemy missiles. Instead, the tremendous amount of money being spent on upgrades is the result of greedy politicians and corporations. Companies like Northrop Grumman get paid vast amounts of money to develop missile tech for the US military. This means that if the funding for programs such as the nuclear sponge ran dry, it would severely hurt the company's profits. Therefore, defense contractors tend to do a lot of shady things to ensure that the government keeps spending money on missile tech. To be fair, Northrop Grumman isn't the only private business contracted by the US government, and it's not the only company benefiting greatly from money being spent on unnecessary military technology. However, in 2018, Northrop Grumman contributed $5.6 million to specific campaigns to ensure candidates who supported their cause were elected. Northrop Grumman spends more money lobbying than any other defense contractor, and only slightly less than tech companies like Amazon and Facebook. These huge corporations pay unfathomable amounts of money to influence the laws being made and the way the US government spends its funds. This, of course, is technically illegal, yet it still happens all the time. The craziest part is that whenever Congress tries to pass a bill to reduce the number of missiles in the nuclear sponge states, they're often met with resistance from representatives of those very states. You would think that politicians and constituents would no longer want nuclear weapons within their borders, especially if it's going to put them in danger of being blown up. However, this doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, politicians from North Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana are known as the Missile Caucus because they constantly try to shoot down any bills that would remove nukes from their states. Why do politicians and people living in the nuclear sponge of the United States want to keep the nukes there? The answer, once again, is money. 
The building, maintenance, and upgrading of nuclear silos and weapons creates an enormous amount of jobs and brings in a ton of money to the states. Many citizens living within the nuclear sponge work for the US government or one of the defense contractors that maintain the missiles and their silos. Therefore, if the government ever decided to remove the silos and get rid of the nuclear sponge, in Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, Montana, and North Dakota, tens of thousands of people could become unemployed. Obviously, many of those states don't want this, which is why they vote to keep nuclear weapons within their borders. Until the US government is willing to admit the nuclear sponge idea from the Cold War is no longer valid and can break their ties with defense contractors who rely on the nukes as a source of income, it's highly unlikely that the silos in the middle of the country will be retired anytime soon. It can't be stated enough that the nuclear sponge no longer has any strategic significance. Yes, if nuclear war broke out, the US could launch its missiles from these silos, but at that point who cares? If it ever came to nuclear war, the world would come to an end. The amount of nuclear weapons that are still active between the US and Russia is appalling. It's clear that land-based missile silos serve no purpose and are outdated because you can literally find them on Google Maps. The real threat in terms of nuclear wars are submarines and stealth bombers that can deliver their payload anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. The nuclear sponge hasn't been a valid strategy for a very long time. And no matter how many upgrades go into the silos in the middle of the US, it'll likely never become a good strategy in the future. Even though some jobs are created by building and maintaining nuclear silos, many more jobs could be created if the silos were decommissioned and the land was used for other purposes, such as harnessing renewable energy. Also, if the US government decided to remove the silos, it would not only save tons of money, but it would also reduce the threat of these states being nuked in the future, which should be a win for everyone living there. Perhaps the best argument for getting rid of the nuclear sponge in the United States is that the money being used to fund it could go to other programs. Imagine how much of a difference it would make if the $100 billion spent on upgrading nuclear missiles and their silos went toward improving healthcare and education instead. Even if the US removed its nuclear sponge, it still has plenty of nukes to wage war and destroy the world if it really wants to. Therefore, the US might as well retire the Cold War era nuclear sponge and invest the money into programs that might actually make a difference. World War III is over. The planet will never be the same. The southern United States now belongs to Mexico. Europe is the newest administrative province of Russia. Japan, Taiwan, and Australia are all governed by Beijing. Regardless of how World War III starts, it will rewrite the borders of the map, and not always in the ways you might think. We're going to examine a few hypothetical scenarios for World War III and how each would result in the shifting borders across the world. There are some key factors that must be clarified before we get started. One, we can't possibly cover every scenario in this video, but we'll examine some very intriguing outcomes based on statistical data of the most likely scenarios. Two, we'll assume nuclear weapons are used in moderation and the war doesn't escalate into a full-blown apocalyptic event. And three, we're basing our extrapolations for the future on the information we have now and how certain nations and regimes have acted in the past. The only way that a third world war could erupt in the present day is if Russia and China combined forces and went to war against NATO. The reason for this is that neither Russia nor China is strong enough to defeat the United States and its allies alone. The reality is even if they work together, China and Russia would likely still struggle to win an all-out war with the West. That being said, there are several scenarios where a Sino-Russian alliance could come out on top due to the massive natural resources at their disposal, the enormous size of both militaries, and China's economic stranglehold on many parts of the world. We know that the United States has the most powerful military in the world by far. We also know that NATO on average has better weapons and tactics than both Russia and China. However, let's examine what would happen in several different scenarios and how they could possibly result in the shifting of borders in ways we might not expect. The two sides in World War III will be NATO and the Western nations on one side, including their strategic partners and alliances around the world. This would mean that Australia, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and parts of Latin America would also likely join on this side of the battle. The opposition would be led by China and Russia, which would also include many nations with authoritarian rulers and close ties to Moscow and Beijing. That means North Korea, Belarus, Syria, Iran, and a number of former Soviet bloc states that ally themselves with Russia and China. There's also the possibility that many Latin American and African countries will also throw their lot in with China in particular, the reason for which we'll discuss later on in this video. NATO is made up of 31 countries, most of which are in Europe, except for the United States and Canada. Similar to NATO, but by no means as powerful, is the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is an alliance between Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, and Tajikistan. 
The CSTO has a comparable stipulation as Article 5 of the NATO agreement, numbered Article 4, which basically states an attack against one member would be seen as an attack against all members of the alliance. So if any of the six nations in CSTO is invaded or forced into an all-out war, all other nations will declare war on the aggressor. Now let's look at some World War III scenarios and see how allegiances shift and borders would change as a result. The first few might be shocking, as there will be some backstabbing between the supposed allies, but as we continue with our analysis a much more hopeful picture of the world will start to emerge. Unless you're rooting for the authoritarians to win, then you will be sorely disappointed. Scenario 1. Russia's Worst Nightmare The war in Ukraine has been raging for more than a year. Putin feels the impending doom on the horizon. He takes drastic actions by launching a tactical nuke at a Ukrainian base. The low-yield nuke detonates, vaporizing the base, soldiers, and vehicles in the vicinity. But since the nuclear device is only 25 kilotons, the blast radius is around 0.4 miles or 0.64 kilometers. The damage is not widespread, but it's the very nature of the weapon that elicits a response from NATO. They declare war on Russia and launch aircraft, conventional missiles, and soldiers at key targets across the border. NATO refrains from using nukes as they don't want to escalate things further, but Putin must be dealt with. In response to NATO's invasion, Article 4 of the Collective Security Treaty Organization is initiated. Russia has just over a million soldiers between their active members, including those in reserve. However, since the war began, Russia has suffered close to 200,000 casualties, so things are already looking bad for Putin. He calls on his closest allies and other authoritarian rulers to aid Russia in their fight against NATO. As once Russia is defeated, the West will spread its influence even further into the Middle East and Asia. But this is a hard sell. The fighting is contained in Eastern Europe and Russia. Many leaders don't want to paint a target on their backs, so they stay out of the conflict. Other than the CSTO countries, Iran decides to fight along Russia, as its government's deep distrust for the West fuels its decision to escalate the conflict. Syria also joins Russia due to the fact that President Bashar al-Assad is afraid that if Putin loses, he'll lose his main source of weapons to control his own country. But even with aid from these nations, there is one country whose absence cannot be ignored – China. When Russia launched a nuke, even though it was a tactical one, Beijing turned its back on Putin. China has made it very clear what its stance is around using nuclear weapons. Beijing firmly believes that nukes should only ever be used in the defense of one's country and never as an offensive weapon. Therefore, the nuclear bomb that Putin dropped on Ukraine sealed his fate. China refuses to come to Russia's aid. Now, instead of receiving an influx of weapons and men, China has cut off most support to Moscow. They still buy natural resources from Russia but refuse to send military aid. In this scenario, NATO forces quickly storm through western Russia and capture Moscow. After a year of fighting in Ukraine and the worsening conditions in the country due to heavy sanctions, the general Russian population doesn't put up much of a fight to keep Putin in power. For many, their leader has failed. The superior tanks, aircraft, and technology of NATO forces allow them to deal with any defense Russia mounts. Vladimir Putin is found dead in the Kremlin with a bullet in his head from what appears to be an assassination carried out by someone in his own government. NATO would also attack any country that allied itself with Russia during the conflict. After the war, they'd have their governments dismantled and reorganized. So, if World War III ended up being Russia fighting against NATO without the help of China, there's no chance they could win a conventional war. Even with allies in this area too, many other countries would remain neutral if China did not back Russia. This includes North Korea, who more than likely would aid Russia but only if China gave them permission. Given the scenario we just outlined, if Beijing refuses to support Russia, it will likely find North Korea will do the same. After the war is over, Russia would be broken up and new governments would be put into place. There's even a possibility that China would invade Russia from the east if Beijing thought there was a chance Putin would launch more nukes and put the world at risk of being obliterated in a nuclear holocaust. In this case, China might lay claim to some of the eastern and northern lands of Russia as there are huge amounts of natural resources such as fossil fuels and ore in some of these regions. Let's imagine, after Russia is defeated and forced to surrender, that the country is deemed too large to control by one government and that the stability of the region might be better maintained by splitting Russia up into eight different countries based on the borders of its federal districts. Now, instead of one giant country, there are eight smaller ones to manage. Maps of Asia would need to be rewritten with these new borders, and each territory would be given its own name. It's plausible in this scenario that the Far Eastern and Siberian districts would come under the influence of China. 
Beijing would set up puppet governments in those new countries that served their interests by giving them exclusive trade deals and the rights to acquire the natural resources in the region. These nations would also serve as a buffer between China and the now pro-West nations of Western Russia. The new nations to emerge from Russia's western districts would be led by democratically elected governments. These would obviously be overseen by NATO and would have close ties to Europe and the United States. The borders of Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan would also likely remain the same, but with new governments. The Kaliningrad Oblast, which is currently a part of Russia, would likely be incorporated into Lithuania's borders rather than becoming its own country. There's also the chance that in the chaos, other players in the Middle East might take advantage of the weakened state of anyone who aided Russia. Perhaps Israel would launch an invasion of Syria to eliminate one of the threats surrounding it, secure more resources, and effectively expand its territory almost tenfold. China might take control of Kazakhstan and the Kyrgyzstan governments and install regimes that would ally themselves with Beijing. If Russia launched nukes and started World War III without the aid of China, the only boundaries that are likely to change are those of Russia. It would be divided up into several smaller countries that the West and China could more easily control. The Middle East might see some turmoil and some shifts in power, but the borders would likely remain the same. Now let's look at a second scenario, one that'll lead you to a global conflict where every country will need to choose a side. In this second scenario, you'll be shocked at how different the world map looks when it's all over. Scenario 2. China allies itself with Russia and uses its power and influence to pull others into the conflict. World War III is about to break out. The rulers of Russia and China are trying to preserve their very way of life. The West has been encroaching closer and closer, spreading its ideologies and influence. Beijing has had enough and conducts a secret meeting with the leadership of Moscow. It's decided that if their authoritarian way of doing things is to continue, they need to deal with the United States and its allies. In order to do this, China pulls some strings. Both Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping reach out to other authoritarian rulers around the world and warn that if they don't support Russia and China in the coming conflict, the West will come for them next. This allows Russia and China to convince many of the single-party governments and authoritarian rulers across the planet to join their side in World War III even if they have ties to the West. Many governments in East Asia, Central Africa, and the Middle East ally themselves with China and Russia to ensure they can maintain their power after the war. China also uses its economic might to bend nations to do their will who don't initially join their side or cause. Much of Latin America is deeply indebted to China, and although the United States still has a major presence in the Americas, Mexico, Venezuela, and Brazil are forced to support China or suffer economic collapse. Beijing leverages its Belt and Road Initiative to bring other Latin American countries to its side as well. When all said and done, the desire for authoritarian rulers to stay in power and government's willingness to do whatever it takes to keep their economies from collapsing, China gathers a lot of support. Resources, weapons, and soldiers pour into the conflict from around the world. Fighting breaks out in the Americas and in Europe. NATO and its allies can't hold off the flood of support for China and Russia. Western powers fall. We know this is an extremely unlikely scenario at this moment in time, but as hyper-nationalism continues to rear its ugly head around the world and China continues to spread its power and influence by leveraging its economic might, this scenario might not be out of the realm of possibility in the future. Let's look at how this conflict would result in a rewriting of the world map. After the war ended, China would claim all of East Asia as its domain. Beijing may allow certain governments that supported them to remain in power, but Japan, the Philippines, and Indonesia would all be reorganized into Chinese territories, or at the very least, have puppet governments put in place that answer to Beijing. Australia could be one of the last holdouts for democracy in the region, but eventually both the continent and New Zealand would be forced to answer to China. South Korea and North Korea would be reunited, with Kim Jong-un as the supreme leader of everyone within his new borders. Obviously, this was not willingly accepted by South Koreans, but China would crush any resistance and make sure that Korea remained unified as a single nation that would be indirectly under their control. Mongolia would likely be able to maintain its borders by siding with China and Russia during the war, as it would literally have no choice because of its location. However, any government in Mongolia would be commanded by Beijing. The Middle East would likely keep similar borders as it has today, as long as the governments in this part of the world continuously supply China and Russia with fossil fuels and resources during World War III, the governments in the Middle East would be allowed to continue ruling their respective territories, although Israel would likely be wiped off the face of the map, and its territory would be split between Syria, Egypt, and Palestine. The borders of Central Asia would be a little more complicated to predict in this scenario. Pakistan would likely join Russia and China in the war and would therefore maintain its territory afterward, but what about India? There's been conflicts in the past and even recently along the Himalayan border between India and Chinese-controlled Tibet. 
China also sees India as a rival in the region and a threat to its power, so it is probable that China and Russia might allow India to remain neutral during World War III, but then attack them later on. And even though India has ties to the US and Europe, it is unlikely that the Indian government would support them in a world war if staying out of the conflict altogether was an option. Perhaps when the dust settles, India will be broken up into three new regions. The northern section will become part of China, the west part of Pakistan and the south could remain its own nation but with a government controlled by Beijing. Bangladesh then might be consolidated into one of the regions or gifted to Myanmar for their support during World War III. Europe would be completely decimated by World War III. There's pretty much no country on the continent that would get out of the conflict unscathed. If Russia, China and their allies won the conflict, Finland, Sweden and Norway would all likely be incorporated into Russian borders. They would no longer have any sovereignty, and Moscow would rule them with an iron fist. The same would go for Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Obviously, Putin would finally get his wish of incorporating Ukraine into Russian borders. It's possible that Belarus would remain a sovereign nation, as it would heavily ally itself with Russia from the beginning. But in reality, Alexander Lukashenko does whatever Putin says anyway. Any nation that was a former part of the Soviet Union would likely become a part of the Russian Empire once again. But what about the rest of Europe? Germany might be able to maintain its borders as long as it gives in to every single one of Russia's demands. A puppet government could be put in place, but a deal might be made since Germany currently relies heavily on Russian fossil fuels. About 35% of Germany's fossil fuels come from Russia, which results in Berlin spending billions of euros on Russian energy supplies each year. There may be a way for the German government to convince Russia to let them stay in power in exchange for continued purchasing of their gas and oil. Of course, this government would pretty much be owned by Putin, but the country itself may not be dissolved. The rest of continental Europe might not be so lucky. It could be consolidated and turned into the European Communist Federation, where each country is no longer a sovereign entity but a state with a single nation ruled by one of Putin's closest and most trusted allies. Perhaps the new capital of this country would be in Switzerland as it would be located near the center of the new communist state. Switzerland might even try to stay neutral in the initial conflict, but as soon as Russian troops and allies conquer Europe, even Switzerland would not be spared. The United Kingdom would be too dangerous for Russia to leave as its own entity. So either loyalists to Russia and China would need to be put in power or the UK would be incorporated into the newly formed European Communist Federation. The borders of the Americas would also shift after World War III if Russia and China won. Canada would likely maintain its borders, and the government there might not even be tampered with. Both Russia and China would need to keep Canada in check, but after its 70,000 active troops, four submarines and 63 fighter jets were destroyed during the war, Moscow and Beijing have little to worry about when it comes to Canada. The United States, on the other hand, would be completely dismantled. Russia would take back Alaska and incorporate it into its eastern territory. When World War III broke out, Mexico could have been swayed to join China due to its growing economic ties to Beijing. Mexico would never do anything to anger its neighbor to the north without assurance that they'd be protected, but as US forces were sent abroad to fight in the Pacific and Europe, its military at home weakened. In this scenario, Mexico could bide its time until the United States was forced to surrender while continuously sending supplies and resources to China. When the fighting stopped, Mexico would agree to maintain positive diplomatic ties with Beijing in return for the land taken from them by the United States during the Intervención Estadounidense in México, or Mexican War. This means that parts of at least nine states would now belong to Mexico. China might then set up an overseas territory in the northwestern section of the United States controlled by Beijing, while the east coast was divided into smaller territories that Russia could manage. Although this would be one of the more difficult regions for Moscow and Beijing to keep under control, so perhaps the northeastern and central US would be able to remain a sovereign nation but with harsh restrictions placed on the size of the military, similar to how Allied forces treated Japan after World War II. The southeastern coast of the US would be given to Cuba, which would almost certainly back Russia and China in World War III. The administrative center for this new Cuban nation would be located in Havana, but communist forces from around the world would need to be deployed to Florida and the surrounding states to ensure no uprisings emerged. Cuba would also likely expand its borders with the aid of Russia to incorporate much of the Caribbean, including Puerto Rico and Haiti. Then there's the matter of countries that formally recognize Taiwan as a sovereign nation. If China comes out a victor in World War III, Taiwan will be reincorporated into its borders. Any nation that had formal diplomatic relations with the Taiwanese government would be punished for their insolence. Belize and Guatemala would most likely be integrated into Mexico, or perhaps the authoritarian rule of Daniel Ortega and Nicaragua would be extended to the rest of Central America, including countries that were previously too close to the United States, such as Costa Rica. 
In South America, the borders wouldn't shift as much as many of the countries there were already under the economic control of China to begin with. These countries most likely stayed out of the war. But places like Brazil, which exports huge quantities of soy to China, and Chile, which sends copper and iron ore across the Pacific, might gain special support in the region. Paraguay, on the other hand, would likely be gifted to one of the other countries as it formally recognizes Taiwan. It's possible that Brazil would take control of Paraguay and bring it into its own borders, which already contains around 50% of the land in South America, one-third of Latin America's total population, and 60% of South America's economic output. The borders of Africa would probably remain similar to what they were before the start of World War III. However, some leaders might try to take advantage of the turmoil in the world and invade neighboring territories for their resources. Others might take the opportunity to launch larger battles over disputed land. However, there would likely be no major border shifts as a direct result of the fighting between NATO and its allies against China, Russia, and its allies. Although it's possible that Africa could see an explosion of manufacturing and trade after World War III ends as Russia and China look for more places to procure resources and cheap labor to help rebuild their battle-worn countries and to maintain control of their new empires. So, resource-rich nations like Nigeria, which hold around 25% of the continent's petroleum, and South Africa, which mines $125 billion in mineral resources each year, could gain even more power and influence in the region. These nations will likely form even closer ties to the victors of World War III, which would lead to their dominance in the region. We cannot be exactly sure what the aftermath of World War III will look like. If Russia and China and their allies win, Western democracies will likely be dismantled and authoritarian regimes put in place across the world. Seems that this would set the world up for future conflicts as authoritarian leaders aren't really known for getting along with each other. However, we likely won't have to worry about this scenario because it's much less likely than the next one we're about to discuss. Scenario 3. NATO and its allies go to war and win As things stand right now, the United States has the most powerful military in the world. Therefore, by extension, NATO has the most powerful military in the world. Even if China and Russia could manage to convince several other countries to join them in their fight against the West, it's still unlikely they'd be able to win. The combined might of NATO nations would overwhelm both the Russian and Chinese militaries. For one thing, Russia can't even defeat the Ukrainian military, which is much smaller and has revealed numerous inadequacies in Russia's military, equipment, and leadership. China would be a more formidable foe, but like Russia, a lot of its vessels and armament are outdated. What we will say is that China is rapidly modernizing its military and spending massive amounts of money on creating state-of-the-art weapons. So in the future, China could be a huge threat to the West, but it's not quite there yet. Let's now look at how the borders of the world would be redrawn in this scenario. Like the first World War III scenario, Russia would likely be divided up into different parts after the war ended. The country is 6.602 million square miles, or 10.624 million square kilometers which is absolutely massive when compared to any other country. Canada, the second largest nation in terms of landmass, is only 3.855 million square miles or 6.204 million square kilometers, making it only a little more than half the size of Russia. Again, the country itself could be broken up into its eight federal districts and a new government could be established in each one. However, since China would also be on the losing side of the war, Western nations would be solely responsible for helping to establish functioning governments that are elected by the people. The last thing anyone would want after World War III is a unified Russia building up its strength again and starting another global conflict in the future. The danger here is that a divided Russia controlled by the West might cause flashbacks for much of the world during which the European colonization was at its height. There is the possibility that the Russian borders would not change, but instead a new government would be set up in Moscow to help transition the entire country into a more democratic form of government. But like so many armies have found out before, conquering Russia and its people is a somewhat impossible feat. Even with a new democratic government in Moscow, there would still be groups of rebels that would continue to fight against the new government and their Western ideals for decades to come. Even after NATO won World War III, the Russian frontier could become a lawless place. There might be generals or other Russian leaders who could rally large numbers of people together to fight back against the westernization of their former homeland. This could lead to fluid borders that are set up by different factions vying for control of the country. Therefore, NATO and its allies may only focus on rebuilding and reorganizing the government in western Russia. Perhaps a line will be drawn somewhere just to the east of Moscow. To the west of this border, a new European-style series of countries and states will form that are organized similarly to the democratic republics of Europe. To the east of the border will be a wild frontier, where warlords fight one another to claim dominance and power. 
In this chaotic post-World War III part of the world, there would be too much disorder and fighting for any one group to gain control, thus leaving eastern Russia in a state of constant flux, meaning this part of the country will never be able to grow powerful enough to threaten the world again. Then there is the matter of China. China is a large country at around 3.7 million square miles or 6 million square kilometers, but it's the nation's population size that'll serve as the real problem when trying to organize this part of the world into a new set of countries with stable governments. China has just over 1.4 billion people within its borders. That is practically all 1.4 billion Chinese citizens that have been brainwashed to see Western ideologies as being evil. In order to create a functional government or a series of governments to lead China after World War III, the territory might need to be broken up into several parts. There will also need to be a transitionary government, where democratic elections can be held and the brainwashing of the Chinese people by President Xi Jinping and his regime can be broken. Splitting China up into several smaller nations and being sensitive to the ethnic identities of people in those regions might help rebuild East Asia after World War III. For starters, Tibet would regain its independence and be able to govern itself. Taiwan would become a truly sovereign nation without needing to fear being invaded by China. Then there would be different sections that could be separated, even though a mix of different ethnicities are present. The border of Mongolia could be shifted to include northern China, where there's already a large Mongolian population. Western China could become its own nation or be incorporated into the newly reformed Kazakhstan, where a new government based on democratic elections will be established following the war. Central and Eastern China could make up the new borders for a truly democratic Republic of China, and the government in Beijing could oversee this region. Obviously, the authoritarian rule of the Chinese Communist Party would need to be removed. Perhaps a Chinese democracy could be established with multiple parties representing the needs and wants of people instead of the desires of the dictator. North Korea would be reunited with South Korea and the Kim Dynasty would come to an end. The government in Seoul would welcome representatives from the North and the Korean people would once again be unified but under a democracy rather than a harsh authoritarian ruler. There would be huge amounts of humanitarian aid sent to Korea to help with the transition of North Koreans into a society where they actually have a say in the laws being made and don't need to live in fear for their lives every day. However, this would be true for many parts of the world. If World War III ends with NATO and its allies dismantling the authoritarian regimes in Russia, China, and any country that joined them in their fight, other dictatorships could collapse soon after. Once news traveled around the world that oppressive regimes had lost and democratic ideologies were being implemented in newly formed countries where Russia and China once were, popular uprisings could begin across the planet. Countries in the Middle East could see revolutions to overthrow outdated and oppressive ideas and give every ethnicity and gender more rights. Countries in Central Africa would go through revolutions where people take back their power. Latin American countries that once embraced the ideals of the Soviet Union and authoritarianism could find their populations demanding more freedom and fair elections. The borders in these parts of the world probably won't change much, but the governments and systems might become much more centered around democracy. Ukraine would finally be free from Russian invasion forces, and the Crimean Peninsula would be returned to its borders. Belarus would either be forced to install a new government or be incorporated into the newly formed Western Russia, which would have its capital in St. Petersburg. A lot of what comes out of World War III is the dismantling of countries on the losing side that were too big or had too much power. If Russia and China won the war, the United States and Europe would be broken apart and either incorporated into other territories or given new authoritarian governments to oversee their populations. If NATO and the Western nations won the war, Russia and China would be broken apart into smaller territories, and new democratic governments would be installed to govern the populations within their borders. For the most part, Africa, South America, and the South Pacific probably wouldn't see their borders shift much unless local conflicts escalated as a result of the chaos caused by World War III. It's impossible to tell exactly what the world would look like after a global conflict, but there would definitely be changes to the world map. That being said, if nuclear war erupted as a result of World War III, then much of the Northern Hemisphere would be obliterated by nuclear war. The landscape would become irradiated and pocked with craters. All borders would cease to exist as there would be a mass exodus of anyone who is still alive to more rural areas. At that point, nationality wouldn't matter. Soon after the bombs exploded and missiles stopped falling, the smoke, soot, and debris kicked up by the nuclear explosions would begin blocking the sun. It would spread to the southern hemisphere, making the entire planet all but inhospitable. So, if World War III results in nuclear war, we can just forget about any borders or governments as the human species as a whole would struggle to survive. Putin is terrified for his life. This is the claim by a former FSB officer who's now defected to the West and brought startling intelligence with him that could shape the course of the Ukraine war. 
Since the war in Ukraine started, Russia has experienced a mass exodus of people from its country, most notably young, military-aged men. An estimated 1 million Russians, or around 0.6% of the total population, have fled the country since the start of Putin's disastrous invasion of Ukraine. This mass exodus has been disastrous for Russia's future, as many of the people who fled were entrepreneurs and those with technical skills. Russia's IT industry alone has experienced a catastrophic worker shortage, crippling the nation's future economy. However, lesser known to the public is a similar exodus from Russia's military. Since the war began, thousands of Russians have willingly surrendered, to the point that now the Russian military is threatening anyone who surrenders without cause with execution. While this is to be expected of rank-and-file soldiers, many of which are conscripts who didn't choose to fight in the first place, what's more surprising is the number of high-ranking Russian defectors. A three-star Russian general defected months into the war. His identity continues to remain a secret as he remains under the protection of NATO security services. Russia's Federal Security Bureau, its equivalent to the American CIA and the successor to the KGB, has been rife with defections. According to one defector, the environment inside Russia's top spy agency in the wake of Putin's disastrous invasion has been one of, quote, every man for himself. This is hardly a surprise, given what we've learned early in the war, when Putin punished the FSB for its massive intelligence failure inside of Ukraine. Putin kept his invasion plan a secret from almost all of his government, save a select few officials. He did not include his security services in the plan, and instead tasked them with finding out what sort of reception the Russian army could expect from Ukrainians if there was to be an invasion, and how many would be willing to collaborate. According to unconfirmed reports, the FSB officers tasked with the assignment took the millions of rubles allocated to the mission and pocketed most of it for themselves then simply fabricated glowing reports about Ukrainians greeting the Russians with open arms. Based on this incredibly faulty information, Putin planned his invasion, and it's very likely this was the direct cause for the catastrophic assault on Kyiv. One can hardly blame FSB agents for pocketing the money allocated to their operation and simply inventing field reports. After all, talk of an invasion of Ukraine after the successful annexation of Crimea in 2014 was not uncommon. And as for the stealing of the money, well, Russia's entire political, military, and intelligence system is built on corruption. What the FSB couldn't imagine was that Putin was serious, and while reports of the FSB's failure remain unconfirmed and likely will for years after the war, what is known is that senior FSB officers were put in prison shortly after the invasion, others were placed under house arrest. The unraveling credibility of the FSB and Putin's growing anger as the invasion turned into a massive disaster led to a dog-eat-dog -dog attitude within the spy agency, with agents more concerned with their personal survival, either professional or sometimes literally, than with accomplishing the mission at hand. Inevitably, this prompted many FSB officers to defect to the West, and to ensure they would receive a warm reception, they made sure to come with gifts. Vladimir Osechkin is an exiled human rights activist living in the West. While in Russia, he worked as an investigative journalist and anti-corruption activist, making him an enemy of the state. Forced to flee, Osechkin now works to help others defect to the West, but on one condition. They must bring with them something to aid in taking down the Russian state. For military and intelligence officers, this means secret or at least sensitive intelligence. In 2011, Osechkin founded Gulagu.net to target corruption and torture inside of Russia. His agency has launched multiple investigations into various Russian institutions and government ministries, including taking on the nefarious Russian prison system. The Gulagu project has been exceeding expectations, not just exposing secrets, but in bringing those secrets to light in the eyes of the people who matter the most, other Russians. One group of FSB officers was so disgusted at Gulagu's discoveries that all the men turned whistleblowers. After the invasion of Ukraine, though, Russians seeking the aid of Osechkin's organization to flee to the West exploded in number. Most were ordinary Russians, from professional soldiers who no longer wanted to fight in a senseless war to conscripts forced to do so. However, some of the Russians seeking aid were far more important and valuable to Western intelligence agencies. Among them, the previously mentioned three-star general and even a government minister, both of which remain hidden away by NATO security services for their own protection and the threat to their lives is very serious, as Russia is notorious for aggressively pursuing defectors and critics of the regime. Alexander Litvinenko, a former officer in the KGB and later its successor, the FSB, defected to the UK and brought with him bombshell allegations that Russia was targeting Russian critics abroad, as he was ordered to kill a Russian businessman and former Duma legislator Boris Berezovsky. 
Berezovsky fled Russia after the election of Vladimir Putin and has been highly critical of the new Russian president ever since. In retaliation for his defection, Litvinenko was poisoned with polonium-210 in a cafe in London. The brash attack, which left radioactive contamination across the city as the assassins carried the polonium around, led to a diplomatic crisis between Russia and Great Britain. But Russia would not be deterred and in 2018 carried out another brazen assassination attempt inside Britain. This time, the assassination targeted Sergei Skripal and his daughter, a former Russian military intelligence officer and secret British double agent. Arrested in 2004 by Russia's FSB, he was sentenced to 13 years in prison but would be released in a spy swap in 2010. This time, the tool of choice was a nerve agent sprayed via dispenser, which would also poison a police officer who found the two unconscious. Luckily for all, they would survive, albeit with lasting damage to their health. Sadly, the disguised perfume bottle used in the poisoning would be found in the trash can later by a man who gave it to his partner. When she sprayed it on her wrist, she fell ill within minutes and died shortly after. Vladimir Oseshkin would receive the same treatment from Russia, with at least two different attempts on his life. In one of the attempts, Oseshkin spotted the telltale red laser of a weapon sight dancing across his dining room as he brought dinner plates to his seated children and wife. Ducking for cover, the Russian assassin instead fired on responding French police officers who maintained a constant watch on Oseshkin. Since the war started and Oseshkin's become more vocal against the Putin regime, the attempts have continued, though tip-offs have helped him avoid death more than once. On a recent incident, a tip-off via text message simply read, Vladimir, be careful, there's already been an offer for an advance payment to eliminate you. In exchange for his help, Oseshkin received intelligence from the various arms of the Russian government, which he promptly passed along to NATO intelligence services. Recently, Oseshkin helped former senior FSB lieutenant Imran Navruzbakov to defect, and in exchange received details on ongoing FSB intelligence operations inside of Europe. One of these operations was the identification of foreign fighters seeking to enter Ukraine to aid in the war, terrorists as Russia called them. The ultimate goal is unknown, but it is possible Russia could have been looking to kill would-be volunteers before arriving in Ukraine in order to deter the flow of foreigners seeking to join the fight against Russia. One of the big revelations from Osechkin's growing list of defectors is the extent to which the FSB is involved in the politics of the Russian military. The agency has itself rooted deep in the Russian military, even to the point of directly influencing individual units. This has great political value for the regime built on blackmail and corruption, but it's destructive for troop morale as well as unit cohesion. And a growing list of intelligence on the Russian military itself paints a very disturbing picture for Russia's armed forces. Since the start of the war, it's become clear the Russian military is not a single unified structure. Western militaries are single entities who unite their recruits under one banner and one doctrine. The United States, for example, has 50 states, but when a volunteer enters basic training and joins an active military unit, they do so as part of a collective unified under one banner. This is not the case in Russia. Rather than unifying their military, Russia largely leaves it up to each individual republic to recruit, train, and often even equip their contribution to the larger Russian military. This has led to catastrophic problems with unit cohesion, morale, and standardization of both equipment and tactics. But disunity in the Russian armed forces is not a flaw, it's a feature. Inside of Ukraine, there is not one Russian military fighting for control of the country, but multiple different entities generally fighting for the same goal. Of most prominent note is the regular army itself, which consists of professional volunteers and professional voluntolds, or conscripts, who make up the bulk of Russia's military power. However, private military companies make up a significant amount of Russia's on-the-ground forces, and like any private for-profit enterprise, they are heavily discouraged from working cooperatively with each other or with the Russian military. Chief amongst the PMCs inside Ukraine is the Wagner Mercenary Group and Patriot. One is owned by Yevgeny Prigozhin and the other by Sergei Shoigu. And although they both own mercenary groups, the two are worlds apart from each other. Wagner is a brute force army that recruits from prisons, while Patriot is made up of Russia's most elite former soldiers, typically special operations and the like. While a Wagner recruit would be lucky to make a few hundred bucks a month, Patriot pays as much as $15,000 a month for two-month contracts, making it high risk but very high reward for its members. Naturally, the two groups hate each other even to the point of sabotage, the extent of which revealed by Wagner and Russian government defectors is shocking. There are strong reasons to suspect that Wagner purposefully leaks the location of political opponents to Ukrainian forces, who in turn target them for precision strikes. 
the internal war between the two factions which has spilled out into the public sphere, with Prigozhin continuously attacking the Ministry of Defense, has likely done more to sabotage the Russian war effort than Ukraine could have hoped to with its own intelligence operations, and the rivalry has deadly battlefield consequences beyond sabotage. During the battle for Volodar, which has become the largest tank battle of the war, none of the three groups involved, Wagner, the Russian army, or Patriot shared information with each other. This led to all three groups falling for the same Ukrainian ambushes time and time again. But Wagner defectors have also brought with them some horrifying stories about the group's violence against both civilians and itself, as well as the way it operates. One defector fled Russia with the help of a human rights organization by crossing the Russian-Norway border. He was recruited from a prison where he was serving a three-year sentence, and having grown up on the streets, saw Wagner as his only real option in life. He details stories about lack of training and leadership. According to him, his unit did not receive training or instruction on how to carry out military operations on an objective. Instead, his unit was told to capture an objective and then left to figure out how to do it on its own. This has been evident in the constant human wave attacks launched against Ukraine's defenses in Bakhmut, where the Ukrainian army has inflicted horrible losses on Wagner. The defector also detailed how Wagner keeps its troops in line. Wagner is no longer allowed to recruit from prisons, a move brought on by the fact that the Russian defense ministry is now doing it itself. In February, a news story broke of the capture of Russian convicts who claimed it was the Russian Ministry of Defense who had taken over recruitment. One such recruit, Viktor Savalnev, had been in jail for armed robbery and assault when he was sent to fight in Ukraine. He sent a message to his wife after surviving a fatal attempt to take an objective saying, I am being taken to be shot. I lost a lot of people there. Remember this, do not send more people here, it is enough, they want to kill us all. His wife would never hear from him again and days later was presented with his body. However, while prison recruitment was ongoing, Wagner had a distinct way of keeping them in line. Upon arriving in Ukraine, new recruits would be called into formation and then forced to watch as a would-be defector or someone who had refused to obey orders was executed in front of them. This was meant to instill fear and bring the consequences home. Once in Ukraine, you do as you're told or you will be killed, and the methods of execution were famously gruesome as Wagner has a reputation of using sledgehammers for the task. When involved in Syria, a video of Wagnerites crushing a Syrian man's legs, hands, and feet using a sledgehammer, as all the Russians laughed, went viral. The Syrian was eventually executed with a blow to the head. Now, Russian Wagner recruits are facing the same consequences for retreating or disobeying a direct order. But that's only for those who managed to survive the use of blocking forces by both Wagner and the Russian military a tactic pulled straight out of the World War II Soviet playbook. Russia is so desperate to avoid losing more ground on the battlefield that it's taken to the use of blocking forces, units set directly to the rear of an assault, with orders to kill anyone who retreats from the assault wave. This is again not surprising, given that Russian defectors have also brought news of how conscripts and even professional soldiers have been getting creative about not following orders. A common practice amongst units is simply fake contact with Ukrainian forces firing their weapons at nothing while calling in a contact report over the radio. Others, however, have taken to more creative approaches, such as sabotaging their own equipment and even vehicles or simply dumping fuel. The practice was very popular at the height of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Brutal punishments for sabotage have been introduced, but some soldiers still risk the punishment over heading to almost certain death. But it's been the flow of well-placed or high-ranking Russian defectors that's been an intelligence goldmine for the West. Often these individuals might not be aware of the value of the intelligence they bring or have nothing specific to bring with them, but even the smallest details can open up a window into the shadow workings of the Kremlin. One former FSB doctor defected to the West and brought with her medical records and taped conversations with senior officials. Her medical records documented how a Russian military intelligence officer had been diagnosed with malaria, allowing her Western handler to identify an ongoing secret operation in Africa. Her taped conversations detailed how Chechen officials are largely being given judicial impunity inside of Russia itself, something which would surely anger most Russians to hear. However, Putin is desperate to keep Chechnya under control given its two disastrous wars against the rebellious province in the last 30 years. Other taped conversations secretly recorded on her cell phone revealed government officials secretly discussing ongoing collapse of the Russian armed forces, giving a direct insight into just how long Russia may or may not be able to continue fighting in Ukraine. However, one recent defector has given the West a unique view directly into the life of Vladimir Putin himself, painting a portrait of a deeply disturbed dictator with a very loose grasp on what's really going on in his own military. 
Gleb Karakulov was an FSO communications officer who worked directly alongside Putin on foreign trips for years. His job was to set up secure communications for the traveling president in order to keep him in contact with his own government and military. However, after seeing how the war in Ukraine started to play out, and perhaps sensing big troubles ahead for Russia, Karakulov decided it was time to flee. Karakulov stated that after the invasion of Ukraine, he changed his plans. Originally, he planned to serve in his time with the FSO, the Russian equivalent of the American Secret Service, and then retire. However, his conscience got the better of him as reports of Russian atrocities poured in, and in his own words, he could no longer serve a war criminal. Shortly after the start of the war, Karakulov said he took three months of sick leave as he came to grips with the ongoing war. That was when he started making plans to flee Russia, but his passport had expired and it would take time to renew it. Meanwhile, he was forced to continue his job as a communications specialist. While working, he sat in on discussions amongst other senior officers discussing the war and savoring the atrocities being committed. Karakulov said he was disgusted, but while he could terminate his contract, when the mobilization began, he realized he could just end up being mobilized and sent to the front, so he decided to remain in the FSO. Then he discovered that he'd been assigned a trip to Astana in Kazakhstan, and he knew it'd be his only chance to make an escape. On October 6, the head of a visit by Putin, Karakulov and his team were sent to Kazakhstan to prepare the location for his arrival. Karakulov's wife and daughter remained behind in Moscow for three days and then joined him in Kazakhstan. In order to avoid raising suspicion, he stayed at a different hotel, and the two only contacted each other once before making their getaway. Karakulov kept postponing the escape attempt as complicating factors kept popping up, but then on the morning of October 14th, he was told he would need to hand in his external passport as the team was due to return home the next day. Time was up. Karakulov couldn't wait any longer. When the day of their escape came, he sent his wife to his hotel to grab his suitcase as it would be suspicious for him to be seen departing his hotel with a suitcase. Claiming he was going souvenir shopping, Karakulov excused him from his team and at 3 p.m. he and his wife fled to the airport. However, their flight was delayed and Karakulov's phone was blowing up with text messages from his team asking where he was. He delayed suspicion by claiming he was feeling sick, but as the minutes dragged on, it was becoming more and more obvious that Karakulov was defecting. Finally, they were able to board a flight for Istanbul, and upon landing, Karakulov turned on his phone to see text messages from very angry agents. But at last, he was safe and free to tell the world what he knew about Putin. According to Karakulov, Putin has placed his yes-men well and his bosses in the FSO, quote, worshipped Putin. Nobody dares criticize him, and he's referred to as the boss by all senior officers. However, Putin's yes-men are also his only source of information. According to Karakulov, Putin doesn't travel with a mobile phone or use the internet at all. The Russian dictator lives in a complete information vacuum, relying only on his intelligence reports and, perhaps unsurprisingly, Russian propaganda for his information. In another report, Karakulov said that Putin demands that Russian television be made available no matter where he goes. This lines up perfectly with what the West has theorized about the Russian dictator. Shortly after the invasion of Ukraine, it became clear just how bad the Russian military was at its job. Poor tactics, even worse doctrine, and equipment in horrible states of disrepair. Multi-million dollar aircraft were falling out of the sky due to a lack of maintenance, and the Russian military was wholly incapable of integrated operations between various branches, even down to the unit level. Only an absolute madman would have sent such a force to invade Ukraine, or one who lived in an information vacuum where the only reports were those shaped by his closest yes-men. And like in any dictatorship, nobody wants to tell the boss something bad. So the Russian military's deficiencies were never made known to Putin. However, Russia's in such a deeply corrupt state that it's almost certain even Putin's closest confidants were themselves unaware of just how bad things were. Trickle-down economics might be a Reagan myth, but trickle-down corruption is very real. And when you create an entire culture of corruption at the very top, it's bound to roll downhill to the individual unit level. Thus, the only people who truly know what terrible shape the Russian armed forces were in were those on the lowest rung of the totem pole, and they weren't about to tell their bosses the truth. Such a culture almost always leads to the downfall of nations and destroys militaries from the inside out. Putin's information vacuum dooms any chance at reform and spells disaster for Russia's continued war in Ukraine. However, Krakulov also gives us insight into Putin's mental state. According to the former security services officer, Putin lives in a state of paranoia, fearful for his life. For years, he's kept mostly to his private residences, which the Russian public jokingly calls his bunkers. However, there might be more truth to this than you think, as a paranoid Putin apparently demanded secure communications be wired into an actual bunker during a trip to Kazakhstan. 
It's long been theorized that Putin is afraid of getting COVID, and that's why he makes everyone stand so far away from him during official meetings. However, Krakalov paints a picture of a man who's been terrified of assassins for years, and given the state of Russian politics, this is hardly surprising. Unfortunately for the world, though, Krakulov also says that Putin appears to be in excellent health despite his age, so there doesn't seem to be any hope of him croaking anytime soon. In 13 years, Krakulov says only two trips were cancelled due to him being ill. The topic of Putin's personal life is a mysterious one, including his direct family. It's known that he has children, but Krakulov says that not much is known about them aside from the fact that his daughters have security personnel assigned to them. He was unable to offer any insight into how often Putin sees his children, if ever at all. However, rumors of Putin's owning lavish homes are true, as confirmed by one of Karakulov's colleagues who regularly goes to a lavish palatial mansion owned by Putin in order to test communications. He also confirmed that Putin owned the Scheherazade yacht, news of which broke after the invasion of Ukraine. Karakulov has also revealed that a paranoid Putin started to prefer traveling in special trains disguised as regular trains sometime in 2014. This was so he could avoid traveling by plane as they could easily be tracked. It's much more difficult to find out the origin of a train, especially when it's been camouflaged to secretly hold the leader of Russia. In order to confuse foreign intelligence and prevent attempts on his life, Putin also frequently faked leaving for travel via plane. His security services would stage an elaborate show of getting the president to his plane, only to have it take off with no one aboard. A fan of boats, though, Putin has also secure communications installed into several vessels, each lavishly decorated though Karakulov believes that only some of them are on the official government balance sheet, helping confirm rumors of Putin's vast wealth, nearly all of which was stolen from the Russian people. Karakulov remains under the protection of NATO intelligence with his exact location a closely guarded secret. While his insights into Putin are greatly illuminating, Karakulov's value to NATO is also his detailed knowledge of Russian secure communications equipment and practices, making him one more in a growing list of very high-value defectors. In 2017, 24-year-old Ku Jong-hwa accomplished something many of the 26 million people in North Korea have only dreamed of. She sneaked across the border into China, taking her son with her. Her happiness was short-lived. She was soon in handcuffs, weeping, envisioning barbaric torture and her untimely death. The question is, what would make a mother so desperate to compel her to risk obscene punishment and execution of her and her son, who by the way was suffering from severe frostbite? This will now explain and tell you what happened to Ku Zhonghua and her son later. To an outsider looking in, you could sometimes be forgiven for thinking that life in North Korea isn't all that bad. Children go to school, folks go ice skating on the weekend, they cheer at soccer matches and make snowmen in the winter. But when you peel back some layers of this mysterious rotten onion of a country, your eyes will tear with incomprehension and grief. North Korea is a country with many faces. For the outside visitors that experience it, they see a carefully orchestrated version of the country, not the grim reality. They hear nothing about how people working in Pyongyang's cushy government jobs barely get by on their $4 a month wage, or factory workers getting solitary dollars per month. Some get 50 cents. They certainly don't see the hungry masses out in the provinces, who are at risk of starvation and freezing to death during North Korea's incredibly bleak winters people who work on the land of which only 20% is arable. These people are told daily they live in the best country in the world. First and foremost in the daily life of a North Korean is a large dose of propaganda. The enemy is always a threat, they are told, intent on wrecking the great life that they have. Japan, the United States of America, and the Republic of Korea all want them dead. This is a constant message in all media. The so-called eternal leaders of Korea are everywhere people look. Every day is a reminder that they should be grateful they have such a literally supreme guy in charge, a man from a family almost touched by gods. The people of North Korea start being fed propaganda from a very young age. All children should go to kindergarten and then to a primary school called People's School, where they stay from 6 years to the age of 9. They study in a secondary school until they're 16 and then possibly go to a university. Some do, but most just join the military. All education is state-funded. If you can say something positive about North Korean education standards, it's that according to UNESCO, the country has a 98-100% to 100 literacy rate. You kind of need that, though, when propaganda is being shoved down your throat all your life. Some lucky students might go on to study at the prestigious Kim Il-sung University, but only if they've excelled during their previous studies. Others go to one of the thousands of vocation schools, and many of those who excel in science or mathematics often end up at the University of National Defense, 
where one day they might find themselves becoming a leader in hypersonic missile technology. In 2021, a new part of the university was opened, a special department of hypersonic missiles. This is what many students aspire to do. You might be wondering how this is all possible when North Korea conscripts its young into military service. It is true, at 17, men must begin 10 years military service. Women may also serve, but only until they are 23. In both cases, there is a selection process, and the most academically gifted kids can ignore the military entirely, as can the kids of the elites who are born into high status. Something very important in North Korea is Songbun. This is a status system in which certain acts gain people social credit. Good Songbun means more choices are available to people. On the other hand, if someone's related to a defector, their score will likely be low and their options dire. North Korea states that all students must acquire the concept of revolution and endless loyalty toward the party and the supreme leader. All education is based on the revolutionary ideal. Every day that a kid goes to elementary school, he's learning the idolization of the supreme leader. When he gets home, the TV shows him how he can be a good revolutionary. Regularly, the TV explains how to accrue better social credit. Not long ago, a woman was roundly chastised by the Korean media for saving her kid in a house fire and not saving the pictures of the leaders on her kitchen wall. North Korea media applauded the neighbor who ran into the house to save the pictures. That's how you get some good songbun. The state security department uses various surveillance systems to keep an eye on people. The secret police is everywhere. People never know if their neighbors will snitch on them. This not knowing who to trust creates an atmosphere of intense fear, which as you'll see today, has wide-ranging negative effects on mental health. It was recently reported that over 200 executions happened throughout the country, with teenagers expected to watch in many instances. Some teens were executed just for having a USB stick containing K-pop and South Korean soap operas. In one case, the kid was wheeled out into a stadium and shot nine times as his school buddies watched from the seats. They were expected to clap, even though some kids were close to tears. Another report says someone had a slip of the tongue and criticized the government. Such cases do not reach Amnesty International. They happen behind closed doors. Like in medieval Europe, often the bodies are left to rot where they fall, a reminder to the public of what could happen to them. A defector named Ose Hike explained, they hanged people in crowded places like markets and left the bodies there for hours to instill fear among the people. Another defector in the same report was just seven years old. In painting class in South Korea, he surprised his teacher when he sketched a scene of a firing squad in the countryside killing locals in a field. This was his reality. So when we're talking about learning math in North Korea in school, it can sound normal, but we should not underestimate the distressing climate of fear these kids have to live through. Although to many, this is what their normal day-to-day -day life is like. Things are made worse because being a good snitch might mean the difference between starving to death in the next famine or being sent to the capital to work in relative comfort. In 2019, a cadre on state-sponsored TV announced that new rewards were available for snitching on people for engaging in illegal activities. They were told people who want to get the rewards can file reports, and the government can then eliminate people filled with discontent. The reward was $6. In North Korea, selling things on the black market, such as foreign entertainment or goods, is one of the only ways to make money. According to a North Korean source, most people didn't want the reward money. That would upset the black economy, the source explained. It did not work out well. The state can't even guarantee basic living conditions for the people, and the people can't make their own living without breaking the law, so why would anyone want to report on anyone else? He said these crackdowns happen ever so often when the government feels like it's losing its grip on the populace. In 2015, there was a similar snitch scheme. A source said the security services is cracking down hard on asylum seekers and smugglers, and it has promised incredible rewards to anyone who points to defectors or smugglers. Poor farmers, he said, were tempted. In 2021, someone snitched. It was reported that a villager and a soldier were shot in a field for the crime of disturbing entertainment, what leader Kim Jong-un had recently called a vicious cancer, trying to destroy the North Korean way of life. In one case, a large crowd congregates at the town square, and a young man is dragged out, accused of being found with, wait for it, a movie and 75 songs from South Korea. This is daily life in North Korea. <laughs> A North Korean girl who escaped said she and her classmates were there when a kid was executed again for nothing but distributing entertainment. Like many North Koreans, she suffered from mental problems after seeing such savagery. She said, The prisoner could hardly walk and had to be dragged out. I was so terrified that I could not dare to look at a soldier in uniform for six months afterward. 
It's not that North Koreans don't know anything about the West. They've been buying bootleg DVDs for years now. North Korean TV has innocently featured the Rocky theme tune, and Minnie and Mickey Mouse have appeared now and again. In 2018, prior to peace talks with the US breaking down, even South Korean K-pop stars were invited to Pyongyang. Kim clapped after some of the songs and asked questions about the lyrics, which was surprising to say the least. But that was just him playing the part of the benevolent leader, the good guy who now and again can relax. This comes straight out of a dictator's playbook. Every so often, they're supposed to show that they have mercy. Kim often pardons people from their death sentences, usually to great applause, just as happened in those bloody Roman arenas where the emperor spared a life because he thought it would get the populace on his side. When kids get older, they might go to university, but if they choose a humanities subject, it's still based on the ideology of the party. The word for this ever-present ideology is juche. For instance, some philosophy courses are philosophy of the juche ideology, or juche political economy. It's brainwashing. You can be sure they aren't learning about anarchy, skepticism, and even the wonders of liberal democracy. Capitalism is evil, say the men teaching them as they drive home in their imported luxury cars. Ironically, the North Korean constitution under Articles 64 and 65 guarantees democratic rights and freedoms for all citizens in all spheres of state and social life. That's what they call Orwellian doublespeak. North Korea is totalitarianism. Its mission is to carry out the military first revolution line in order to protect the nerve center of the revolution. Students can't question this. Academic courses are full of lies. Students can read that their supreme leader Kim Jong-il fired off a round of golf and after 11 holes in one, got a 38 under par. This was on a professional course by a man who never swung a golf club. The students know it's impossible, but they can't question it. Some know it's not true that one of their leaders invented the hamburger, but they can't disagree nonetheless. Students who study medicine might question if it's true that North Korean scientists cured HIV and AIDS and Ebola. They just can't say that. North Koreans learn Korean nationalism, which has little or nothing to do with the Marxist communism and ideas about widespread well-being. They hear how their people are racially pure, that mankind itself started in North Korea, where the first humans arose. They're told that their purity is always in battle with the imperialist capitalist foreign powers. The divine, they're told, can only be found in the Kims. Like European kings and queens in the times past, North Koreans are told the Kims rule by divine right. In 1992, American evangelist Billy Graham visited North Korea and spent time with their then-leader Kim Il-sung. North Koreans learned how this Christian man was highly impressed by Kim. These days, they can read in books and newspapers that Graham said, Having observed the supreme leader Kim Il-sung's unique political leadership, I can only think that he is God. The texts then say Graham looked at Kim and announced, Kim is this world's God. Why would a country like this need the Holy Bible? North Koreans aren't religious but the Kims are portrayed as a kind of holy incarnation born to rule. If Billy Graham said so, it must be true. Imagine if the people knew their present leader likes to play World of Tanks online and occasionally watch Western pornography. Some of North Korea's best students become scientists. So you might wonder how they do their job, knowing many things they've been told are a lie. After all, science shouldn't lie. To get better at it, to improve something, you have to work with scientific facts. This is why the best scientists work behind great big guarded walls. One of them, Kim hyung Su, said before he defected, he worked in a lab trying to better understand diseases such as the hardening of the arteries. Everything he did was in secret. What he discovered was only heard by the party bosses. hyun Su once told the press that he had a colleague with a PhD in medicine who told his close buddies what he did. He was subsequently arrested as a political prisoner, as was his entire family. Knowledge is dangerous in North Korea. Talking about the general state of research, he said, Scientists don't believe what the propaganda feeds them, but they cannot discredit it either. You have to think what the party tells you to think. Most people, though, don't work in science. The average Joe works six days a week in a factory or on a farm. Article 22 of the labor law says they should work eight hours a day. They should also get national holidays, off days, and have enough rest time. Like you, they might eat three times a day. Breakfast might consist of rice and soup, possibly with some side dishes. The richer you are, the more you get. People often take a lunchbox to work with them, which again will feature rice and side dishes. Dinner is more rice, soup, and again, side dishes. People near the coast might get seafood. The more money you have, the more meat you can buy. Farmers tend to eat vegetables and herbs that they've collected themselves. A former North Korean soldier explained his rations, saying, I still cannot forget North Korean army food. The standard meal was a bowl of 30% white rice and 70% cornmeal, one bowl of lettuce, 
and soybean paste soup. This was served with salted radish, soybean fried radish, and cabbage kimchi. Soldiers had this every day, but special food was given for their birthdays and national holidays. All defectors say the same thing, you need to make money on the black market to feed yourself well. The government's rice rations are not enough. One really cheap thing is smoking. North Korean cigarettes could be as cheap as 8 cents a pack. The standard price is 17 to 32 cents a pack. Almost half of the males in North Korea smoke, but very few females do, maybe only about 3%. It's also a heavy drinking country, with people preferring hard liquor, often bought at the market under the table. The reason for all the boozing, of course, is stress. As a German doctor and activist once said, there's a lot of alcoholism. It's the only pleasure they have. Fear creates sickness. I saw many victims of alcoholism in the hospital. It's common for people to buy their booze straight from the factory. If they can afford it, they get the Chinese stuff. One of the most popular drinks is Kaolang liquor from China, which can be between 38 and 63 percent alcohol by volume. Very strong. Many North Koreans can't afford that, so people brew their own stuff, even though it's illegal. The government doesn't see this as the same kind of risk as listening to K-pop, so most officials turn a blind eye to people making their own hooch. One guy explained, in my town, one out of every 10 households made alcohol at home. The most widely used ingredients were potatoes and corn. He said beer was seen as a soft drink that kids would regularly drink. There was an age limit of 18 for booze, but he said no one gave a damn about it. Again, this shows how lax North Korean rules can be for some things. You can destroy your liver or smoke until you speak out of a hole in your throat, but for God's sake, whatever you do, don't you dare listen to the latest BTS song. Folks like to drink with their buddies after they've just had to watch mind-numbing state-controlled television programs on TV. They might have to sing revolutionary songs in public and look like they mean it, but that doesn't mean they won't be laughing about that later over a glass of hooch. People do see through all the lies there, some people. It's just very dangerous to speak about it. One defector said this, while the North Korean government wanted people to see their lovers as fellow revolutionary comrades, the truth was that this feeling never truly existed for many of us. We pretended to have that quality only because we were forced to. He learned about the supreme leader in high school, but said he and his friends sometimes ignored all that and had fun. He and his buddies used to drink together, they used to date girls, but since dating was not allowed in school, the couples would sneak off to one of the parents' apartments that they knew was empty. Much of the entertainment made in North Korea was just more propaganda. There used to be a long-running comedy show called It's So Funny, which sounds like the least funny thing you've ever seen in your life. This is some actual dialogue from one of the episodes. This man and woman are talking about how great beans are. Man, if we soldiers see beans, we become happy. He starts laughing out loud. Woman, if we farm in the way General tells us, we will become happy. They both laugh together, slapping each other on the back. That's the whole joke. Presumably, the viewers at home are also in hysterics. That or they were busy trying to choke themselves with their own fists while frantically looking for the booze. When a defector was asked about the show, he said, the show is delivering the same material over and over again. They're still talking about beans. The country hasn't changed at all since I defected about 20 years ago. One thing you definitely don't get are documentaries detailing how many North Koreans in the far-off provinces are living on the brink of starvation or being worked to death in labor camps. This brings us to the matter of crime. If you can be executed for watching a South Korean soap opera, it can be expected that other kinds of crimes will also lead to severe punishments. North Korea has the same criminals as everywhere else on the planet. However, the highly corrupt government tries to portray the country as crime-free, unlike America, where it says society has become decadent, depraved, and divided. North Koreans steal. They kill each other in arguments, they work so damn hard in the countryside that they take methamphetamine when they can get their hands on it. Ordinary crimes like these are called kyowaso. If it's perceived that a person has engaged in anti-socialist activities, they might be exiled. If they have property, it'll be confiscated, as will their worldly goods. Exiles have their ration cards taken away and they lose all their citizen rights. They'll usually end up working on a farm or doing something like building roads. The people who have it worse are the 150,000 to 200,000 serving 5 to 20 years in a labor camp. The UN says about 40% of the prisoners in labor camps die from malnutrition. They're fed very little and often have to do grueling work, such as mining. Some of these prisoners are not being re-educated. The government has classified them as unredeemable. After a hard day's work on a farm or in a mine, starting at 5 a.m. and finishing at night, they're often given a small portion of cabbage or corn. Many prisoners look for insects or vermin, a good source of protein. Some former prisoners have said people have eaten grass mixed with cow poop. There are even reports of cannibalism happening in the camps. A defector who now lives in the U.S. after defecting 
said he was born and brought up in a labor camp. His name is Shin Dung Hyuk. In the camp, he knew nothing, not the existence of the USA or other countries and certainly not that the world was a sphere. All he knew was pain and hunger. When asked if he loved his parents in the camp, he said he had no concept of love. He explained that once a girl stole some corn and was beaten to death for it in front of him. He said he felt nothing. He was a child of the camp. This was normal life for him. He went on to say, if you escape, you would be shot. If you try to escape or plan to escape, you would be shot. Even if you did not report someone who was trying to escape, you would be shot. One time they dragged him and his family to the front when it was announced another execution was imminent. Since he was at the front, he thought it might be him. It wasn't, it was his mother and brother. Was he sad? No. He didn't know what love was. He said at the time he thought that they got what they deserved for breaking the prison rules. The rules were clear to everyone. They were stapled to the walls. Try to escape? Death. Steal? Death. Talk in a group of more than three people? Death. Rebel against a guard? Death. Don't report suspicious activity? Death. Don't admit you're wrong? Death. As for a minor transgression, Shin Dong Hyuk explained that once he annoyed a guard when he was still young and the guard decided just to cut off his finger. He added, I was taken to the clinic and given medical attention but without any anesthesia whatsoever. The guards wanted the men and women to have relationships. The more kids in the camp, the more labor available. But the guards often didn't let people wait to meet someone they liked. Matchmaking would go like this. Guard, you two, you've been matched. From today on, you're married, work hard, and don't waste your time. If you slack, I'll split you up. Shin Dong Yuk said, for most people, resistance is simply unthinkable. He took the risk of his life and escaped. And now he's trying to make sense of that deep heart of darkness where he once lived. In less severe cases, let's say someone shirked at work or maybe they were found to keep a messy kitchen, they might face public ostracism. That'll consist of being ignored by colleagues. Your neighbors will tut when you walk past them. All of this causes severe stress. People feel the weight of their oppression at all times. Not only do many people smoke and drink a lot, but these days they're on drugs. In 2019, news reports said that during the Lunar New Year, one of the main gifts people exchanged was methamphetamine. It had seeped out of the countryside and into the cities. As with everything in North Korea, dealers were able to bribe officials, and so the stuff was being exchanged openly and very liberally. Drug dealing is also a great way to make money in a country where making a buck isn't easy at all. Psychiatrists that have helped defectors once they got to South Korea said, they found many people suffered from a whole host of mental problems. In a research paper, it said many of them were still totally focused on survival amid continuity of intense suffering, even though they were now free. In short, they were traumatized. A separate study found that the cause of their trauma was witnessing government executions enduring starvation, starvation-related deaths of family and friends, witnessing extreme physical assaults. Now there's a catch-22 in North Korea. People feel crazy with all that stress, but if they admit they're even depressed, it can be classified as anti-socialist behavior. If they say that they're happy even though they aren't, they're being good citizens. That's the reason a report stated anxiety disorders and depression seem to receive no specialized psychiatric treatment in North Korea. If patients are worse, perhaps psychotic or just maniacally screaming how bad things are, they're packed off to special number 49 hospitals. They receive zero counseling and psychotherapy and instead are given intravenous insulin that renders them comatose. Life gets much worse when there are droughts or floods or any number of natural disasters. The World Food Program has said that North Korean government used to give 400 grams of food daily per person, but in 2019 because of crop shortages, that went down to 300 grams per person per day. The UN says survival rations should be 600 grams daily per person. A nurse that defected in 2013 talked about the lack of sustenance, saying, Since there isn't anything to eat in North Korea, we eat everything we can get. We eat roots and anything that is chewable. She added, There was a mother who entrusted the nursery with her three kids, but all three starved to death. Out in the countryside, it's doubtful there will ever be power to heat huts and ramshackle houses when the temperatures sometimes go down to negative 13 degrees Celsius. They use wood or coal, but that's not always available. Meanwhile, elites are warm and cozy in their state-sponsored harems, women who've been taught to make a man happy in various ways. These are sometimes referred to as pleasure squads, or in Korean, kipumjo. But they are only for the 2,000 or so top officials who also enjoy luxury goods from the West, such as cigars, perfume, or the Rolls-Royce and Mercedes-Benzes that they often drive around in. These top dogs own mansions and palaces and have bank accounts in countries all over the world. Kim Jong-il himself is said to be worth $5 billion. He's reported to have over 100 luxury cars, a private jet, and a luxury yacht. Now you can understand why he has people executed for contacting the outside world. His propaganda is not a noble lie, it's plain old greed. 
and those at the top use the fear of the so-called imperialists so they can maintain their exquisite status. This is the absolute opposite of social happiness, but all totalitarian governments work under the principle that they are doing everything for the common good. The retirement age in North Korea is 60 for men and 55 for women, upon which they're supposed to receive 30% of their last salary plus 300 grams of food. Many will sell things at the market despite it being illegal, so they can try to get enough money for snacks or possibly drinking at friends' houses. The women, according to one defector, prefer to spend their time practicing such things as embroidery or handicrafts. Still, North Korea's social security system is not stable, so most old folks work. Teachers do private classes, some people mend shoes or umbrellas, others will walk around the streets charging close to nothing to refill people's overworked cigarette lighters. As always, the people with any power, the cadres, can always make extra cash from being paid bribes. A retired policeman might tell a young cop to turn a blind eye to that guy selling DVDs. In North Korea, most of the money that changes hands is black market money. Very few poor people in the capital will ever head to the glittering places such as the Potunggang department store to buy their goods. Western journalists will often say barely anyone in North Korea can go there for things like the Heinz ketchup and the foreign clothes. They say the place was only created to show Western tourists and journalists how North Korea is no longer a place of abject poverty. Ji Sung Lee, who defected a long time ago, said she was never fooled. Sure, she hated the Japanese due to the historical reasons, but didn't hate Americans as she was told to. She remembers when she was young, she was told that during the Korean War, American soldiers tore the limbs off of innocent Korean civilians. Her young mind heard how these soldiers gouged out people's eyes, sliced off their lips, and then hung them from trees as they would decorate a Christmas tree at home. But then she decided to ask the older people in her village about this. She said, they told us a different story. They said American soldiers adored Korean children and showered them with chocolate and gum. Like everyone in North Korea, by law she had to stay in her province. She had to listen as the local government pumped out propaganda about their glorious leader, and TV every day had its two minutes of hate aimed at the evil imperialists. But now she's a woman of the world, and it's no longer a crime for her to wear the wrong facial expression in public or to think the wrong thoughts. She's learned that there's good and bad everywhere, but not all Americans give candy to kids. Some committed war crimes in Korea, that's true, but now she can talk about it freely just as she could say what she wants about North Korea. As for poor Ku jong hwa who we talked about in the intro, she was not so lucky. Amnesty says after she was caught, her son recovered from his frostbite and was sent to live with his grandmother. Her husband, who was in South Korea, said the one good thing is, for some reason, Ku jong hwa didn't end up in a labor camp. The reason we expect is the fact that Amnesty published the case. She might not be imprisoned, but her bad songbun probably hasn't done her any favors. The other eight escapees that were arrested and sent back were not published by names, and their whereabouts are unknown. There's a good chance crowds gathered for their execution. The children covered their eyes, the guns sounded, and the blood leaked from their bodies. Then everyone got back to work as if nothing happened. One week before a US nuclear launch. The United States has been closely monitoring Russian movements in Ukraine. Recently, some unsettling images have been brought to light. Satellite imagery reveals nuclear weapons being moved to airfields just across the border in Russia. Mobile launchers also appear to be on the move. The US military intelligence officers scour the data to make sure what they're seeing is accurate. Several MAZ-7917 transporter erector launchers carry RT-2PM Topol ballistic missiles dangerously close to European borders. It looks as if several of the nuclear missiles are positioned to attack the front lines of the Ukrainian conflict. Others have been moved to the far reaches of Russia's eastern territories. This is unsettling for the United States and its NATO allies, as Vladimir Putin is not known for his level-headedness. As his forces suffer defeat after defeat in Ukraine, he might be willing to take drastic measures. The President of the United States is informed of the deployment of nuclear missiles across Russia. He ponders what might be going through Putin's head, but quickly realizes it's a rabbit hole he doesn't wish to go down. Instead, the President of the United States orders several Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines to deploy closer to Russian shores. If a nuclear response by the United States is needed, these submarines will play a vital role in quickly striking key targets before Russia has time to launch a full-scale nuclear attack. The nation's defense network is put on high alert, as intelligence officers try to gather as much intel as possible to provide the President the opportunity to make the most informed decision. B-2A Spirit stealth bombers take off from Whiteman Air Force Base to fly alert patrols near the Russian mainland. They're loaded with GBU-57AB massive ordnance penetrator bombs in case things go sideways and the US needs to take out Russian high-priority targets hidden deep within protective bunkers. A few B-2s are equipped with B-83 nuclear bombs, 
However, these aircraft will remain grounded until further notice. These nukes have a maximum yield of 1.2 megatons, making them some of the most powerful nukes in the U.S. arsenal. 24 hours before a U.S. nuclear launch Over the past several days, things have escalated. Ukrainian troops have pushed Russian forces all the way back to Crimea. The Chinese Navy has created a blockade around Taiwan. And Kim Jong-un has been spouting nonsense and threats that if the U.S. tries to interfere with their allies' plans, North Korea is mobilizing forces across the DMZ. In a matter of days, global security has gone from relatively stable, except in Ukraine, to terrifyingly uncertain in multiple parts of the world. The President of the United States doesn't sleep anymore. He keeps a close eye on events unfolding across the Atlantic and in the Pacific. Right now, the best thing that the US and its NATO allies can do is prepare. Everyone was already on high alert, but now the President never lets the nuclear football out of his sight. 47 minutes before a US nuclear launch A high-ranking general bursts into the Oval Office. The President sits at his desk, staring at the latest images coming in from around the world. Russia, China, and North Korea all seem to be posturing toward taking drastic actions. The President can see by the look on this general's face that this is not going to be good news. Then an emergency alert reaches the President directly from the Pentagon. Russia has launched a nuclear missile. A network of satellites tracks the thermal signature of the Russian nuke. It's heading west toward Europe. The President knows the target is not the United States, as if Russia were to attack the US, their ballistic missiles would fly over the Arctic. However, until more data comes in, the exact location of where the nuke is headed is unknown. The President picks up the red phone on his desk and gets the Secretary of Defense on the other line. It's agreed that everyone should meet in the Situation Room to plan out what the next steps will be. 35 minutes before a US nuclear launch The Russian missile separates in the atmosphere, and now four warheads all fall toward the city of Kiev. Three of the warheads are decoys, but one contains a nuke that could decimate the entire capital of Ukraine. Every NASAMS and anti-air system in Ukraine fires simultaneously. They try desperately to destroy the warheads before the nuke detonates. Most of these systems were designed to take out aircraft, but desperate times call for desperate measures. The world holds its breath, and the seconds tick by. One of the anti-air missiles gets a lucky hit. There's an explosion high up in the atmosphere. It's not clear how many of the warheads were destroyed or if the real nuclear device was the one that was hit. The people of Kyiv take shelter, preparing for the worst. The President of the United States sits in the Situation Room with his generals, praying that this is all just a nightmare he'll wake from. 34 minutes before a US nuclear launch, the Russian nuclear warhead detonates over the city of Kyiv. In an instant, millions of lives are lost. The capital of Ukraine is reduced to a smoldering crater surrounded by irradiated ruins. 33 minutes before a US nuclear launch. Sir, what are your orders? The Secretary of Defense asks the President. His eyes are still fixed on the screen, showing a mushroom cloud rising over what was once Kyiv. Sir, the Secretary of Defense screams. The President closes his eyes and shakes his head. We cannot let him get away with this, the President whispers. Give me the leaders of NATO on the phone. We need everyone on the same page before what happens next. 15 minutes before a US nuclear launch. The President of the United States ends the call between the leaders of NATO. He looks around the Situation Room at his military advisors. The conversation was brief. Everyone agreed that Russia's actions cannot stand without consequences. There needs to be some form of retaliation by NATO. It's clear that Putin has lost his mind. After the nuclear attack, China almost immediately pulled its ships and other forces back to the mainland in an attempt to de-escalate the conflict in East Asia. Even they can't believe that Vladimir Putin would fire a nuclear missile at Ukraine. China has a strict policy of only using nuclear weapons to defend its own territory. They condemn Russia for escalating the war in Ukraine into a much more dangerous global conflict. The Situation Room is silent. The European countries and NATO have already begun mobilizing their forces. The plan is to hit Putin hard and fast. But the problem is, the mad Russian dictator still has more nuclear weapons, many more. The President of the US has declared that Vladimir Putin must be immediately punished and that NATO needs to send a clear message. The US has taken it upon itself to launch a retaliatory nuclear strike against several key military installations across Russia. These nukes will not target major cities or population areas, but they will cripple Russia's nuclear stores and military infrastructure. I've made my decision, the President says. Bring me the codes. 13 minutes before a US nuclear launch. Everyone turns to look at the man holding the black briefcase in the corner of the Situation Room. For a moment, he doesn't move. He knows the ramifications of delivering the briefcase to the President now that he's made up his mind. But it is his sworn duty. The man takes a step forward and carries the nuclear football to the table. He places it in front of the President of the United States and returns to his post. The President unlatches the clasps of the briefcase. They swing open with a satisfying click. 
The president then opens the case and pulls out the contents, laying them out on a table in front of him. First, the president opens the black book, which contains the retaliatory options available to him. There are all types of scenarios. The president runs his index finger over the table of contents until he lands on the one he's looking for. He flips through the pages and finds the correct one. The room is as quiet as a graveyard. It's as if the air has been sucked out of the chamber. No one moves. The president reads what's written on the page to himself and nods his head. He closes the black book and opens another booklet that contains a list of classified sites and their locations around the globe. It's here that he finds the targets that will be hit when he gives the final order to launch nukes at Russia. The president closes the book and opens a manila folder that contains several pages of authentication codes. He picks up the phone and calls the National Military Command Center at the Pentagon. They've been expecting his call. The voice on the other line speaks an authentication code into the receiver to verify that the person on the other line is, in fact, the President of the United States. The President pauses for a moment as he reads the words on the laminated card known as the Biscuit. These words are known only to the President and confirm his identity. The member of the National Military Command Center listens to the response. It is correct. Next, the President relays the specific code that signifies which type of strike he wants. Now that the president has chosen to launch, there's nothing anyone can do to stop the process. The president of the United States is the only one who can authorize a nuclear launch and is the only one who can cancel it once the process has begun. This makes many people in the Situation Room and around the country nervous, especially if they don't agree with his decision. But there's nothing anyone can do about it now. Five minutes before a U.S. nuclear launch. The codes have been authenticated. The identity of the president has been confirmed. The encrypted instructions on what missiles should be prepared for launch and their targets are sent out to all parties involved. These sealed authentication system codes are received by military personnel around the world. When they come in, safes are opened at each site to retrieve the verification codes to ensure the SAS codes are real. Underground launch control centers that control the Minuteman missile silos in the heart of the country prepare for launch. Air Force generals order B-2 pilots to report to their planes. Deep under the waters of the Pacific Ocean, encrypted communications are sent to the Ohio-class submarines, who ready their nuclear missiles for launch. In each instance, the NMCC orders are authenticated one more time by those who receive them to ensure that the most serious decision that's ever been made is real. The NMCC sends out actual missile launch codes. There is one more failsafe to ensure that every possible opportunity to abort the firing sequence has been given one minute before a U.S. nuclear launch. The crews at the underground missile silos open a box containing two keys. The commander of the facility holds onto one and gives the other to his second in command. Submarine captains hand off a key to their first mate, who walks over to one of the terminals aboard the submarine and prepares for what comes next. The captain pulls his own key out from the chain around his neck. The B-2s that are en route to their targets have been given the authorization to go weapons free. The two pilots in each cockpit are tasked with ensuring their payload hits the correct target. 10 seconds before a U.S. nuclear launch. There's collective anticipation across every branch of the military at this point. All high-ranking officers know what's about to happen. The U.S. is going to war and it's launching nukes to kick off what will likely be a catastrophic series of events. There's still hope that by destroying most of Russia's nuclear capabilities, an all-out nuclear exchange can be avoided, but this can't be confirmed with 100% accuracy. The seconds tick down. 5 seconds before a U.S. nuclear launch. Each launch requires that both keys are turned within milliseconds of each other. This ensures that no single person is responsible for launching the nukes and adds another layer of protection against unintentionally starting a nuclear war. One second before a U.S. nuclear launch. The keys turn in their slots. The launch of the United States' nuclear arsenal is initiated. The nuclear triad is the backbone of America's national security. The triad consists of land, air, and sea nuclear launch capabilities, and the President's decision requires that all three branches fire their missiles at Russia. One second after U.S. nuclear missiles are launched, the engines on 100 Minuteman III missiles roar to life in their underground silos. These ballistic missiles are located in Colorado, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, and Wyoming. The ground shakes as the silo doors open and the Minuteman missiles roar into the sky. These ICBMs will fly over the Arctic to hit their targets on the other side of the world. The soldiers working in the underground launch control centers ask for forgiveness as they listen to the nukes take flight. The commanders at each facility are still on the phone with the President of the United States and the National Military Command Center. They update them on the progress as the missiles rise higher and higher into the atmosphere. Airborne missile combat crews monitor the ICBMs once they enter the upper atmosphere to ensure they're still on target. The Minuteman III rockets have a range of over 6,000 miles. They accelerate toward their top speed of 15,000 miles per hour, which is around Mach 23. 
Each missile weighs just under 80,000 pounds, which is a lot of weight to launch 700 miles above the Earth's surface. The rockets use three solid propellant motors to get the job done. Seven Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines rise close to the surface just off the Kamchatka Peninsula. This is only half of the Ohio-class subs that the U.S. has at its disposal, but for the current mission, it's all that's needed. The way the submarines were designed makes them almost impossible for the enemy to locate until they surface, and at that point it's too late. Each submarine can carry 20 ballistic missiles with independently targeted warheads. This means that each one of the warheads can be assigned a different target. This will make it incredibly hard for Russia to intercept them all or launch effective countermeasures. It's almost inevitable that at least some of the missiles will hit their targets. The Trident II D-5 missiles erupt out of their submarine silos and accelerate into the air. As soon as the missiles have been launched, the silo doors are closed, and the submarine descends back into the depths of the ocean where it'll hide from any enemy ships trying to locate it. The submarines stealthily make their way back to their respective naval bases to be resupplied for their next mission. There's no rush at this point, as the Ohio-class subs typically spend 77 days at sea before returning for routine maintenance. However, if they needed to, the subs could stay underwater for much longer, as they're nuclear-powered and don't need to surface to replenish air. Instead, they use electrolysis to break apart H2O molecules and generate oxygen for the crew. The B-2 bombers are still traveling toward their objectives. Their timing has been precisely planned out, so they drop their bombs as soon as the first nuclear missiles hit their targets. The key to the president's plan is that the nukes strike Russia almost simultaneously, five minutes after U.S. nuclear missiles are launched. NATO forces have launched a series of aerial and ground attacks into Russian territory. Their main objective is to serve as a decoy for what's to come. Bombers and fighter jets hit key Russian radar stations that survey the northern edges of Russian territory and the skies over the Arctic. This is done to prevent early detection of the incoming ballistic missiles arcing over the north pole of the planet. Ground forces speed toward Moscow in an attempt to force Putin's attention on the invasion instead of the strategic nuclear strikes that the U.S. just launched. It's a race against time for NATO forces. They need to cause as much damage and mayhem as possible to distract the mad dictator of Russia from launching his own nukes. Long-range missiles target key communication hubs between Moscow and the rest of the country. The more disruptive NATO forces can be, the better the chances the U.S. nukes have at hitting their targets without being intercepted. 15 minutes after U.S. nuclear missiles are launched, the Trident II D-5 missiles descend toward their targets. Simultaneously, the B-2s drop their nuclear bombs. These stealth aircraft are supplemented by a handful of B-21 Raiders with upgraded tech and longer ranges. The Russians have no idea that these aircraft have entered their airspace. They claimed that their newest forms of radar could detect even stealth bombers, but this, like so much of Russia's military posturing, is just a fabrication. The pilots sight their targets using a combination of infrared sensors, satellite telemetry, and high-tech radar. They've already been given the all-clear to drop their nukes, since they must maintain radio silence while in Russian airspace to keep from being detected. Each B-2 drops 16 2,400-pound B-83 nuclear bombs. They use sophisticated guidance systems to ensure that the nukes hit their targets. In an instant, dozens of nuclear missiles and bombs detonate above key Russian military installations. The distraction by NATO forces seems to have worked. The already weakened Russian military is so understaffed due to the war in Ukraine that they just didn't have the personnel to effectively monitor the NATO attacks and the incoming U.S. nuclear warheads. However, it's now clear what the strategy is. Putin screams at his generals to launch any Russian nukes that remain. At that very moment, a B-61 thermonuclear gravity bomb penetrates the ground near where Vladimir Putin is hunkered down in a bunker. The nuke detonates and instantly wipes out the Russian president and his closest generals. This will cause a breakdown in the chain of command and should deter Russia from launching its own nukes. Luckily, the classified information the President of the United States had included detailed instructions on where the first nuclear warheads needed to strike to deactivate the Russian dead hand contingency. The automated system is supposed to kick in if the Russian leadership is ever killed in a nuclear attack. Dead Hand uses information and sensors to determine if an all-out retaliatory strike should be launched if Russian leadership has been compromised. However, the system was from the Soviet era, and like many of the military systems that carried over from the time period, it was not properly maintained. A few well-placed nuclear strikes have completely disabled the Dead Hand system and have kept Russian protocols from instantly launching every remaining nuke they had at U.S. and NATO targets. 30 minutes after U.S. nuclear missiles are launched, the Minuteman III ICBMs are about to strike their targets. The warheads are descending toward the Earth at top speed. 
The remaining leaders of the Russian military used the A-135 system, which once consisted of 68 nuclear-armed interceptors and phased-array radar stations to track and destroy incoming missiles. But the first strike by the US has already decimated countless bases and assets, rendering their defensive network almost completely inoperable. The Russian unified air defense system is still relaying information. The problem is, the military personnel required to effectively launch nuclear countermeasures have been decimated by the initial attack and by the war in Ukraine. However, two of the six Voronezh early warning radar installations still remain and are connected to the S-400 and S-500 anti-missile systems. The S-400 is designed to intercept aircraft and ballistic missiles with a range of up to 250 miles. The upgraded version of these missiles has an active radar to help them track incoming targets. The Russian military launches several S-400 at the incoming Minuteman 3s. Several hit their targets and detonate. Russia also has next-generation S-500s, but with a shortage of semiconductors and materials due to sanctions from the war in Ukraine, the upgrading of their missile defense systems has yet to be completed. The Minuteman 3 nukes hit their marks. Almost all of the major Russian targets that the President of the US ordered to be destroyed are now either vaporized or consumed by fire. The Russian landscape is covered in radiation. Its military is decimated. Key Russian government and military leaders are no more. The mission was a success, but at what cost? A US nuclear launch is something that the world hopes will never happen again. Now watch What If North Korea Launched a Nuclear Bomb Minute by Minute, or check out This Is How You Actually Survive a Nuclear Attack.